section one of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli charles the first of his romantic excursion into spain for the infanta many curious particulars are scattered amongst foreign writers which display the superstitious prejudices which prevailed on this occasion and perhaps develop the mysterious politics of the courts of spain and rome cardinal gaetano who had long been nuncio in spain observes that the people accustomed to revere the inquisition as the oracle of divinity abhorred the proposal of the marriage of the infanta with an heretical prince but that the king's council and all wise politicians were desirous of its accomplishment gregory the fifteenth held a consultation of cardinals where it was agreed that the just apprehension which the english catholics entertained of being more cruelly persecuted if this marriage failed was a sufficient reason to justify the pope the dispensation was therefore immediately granted and sent to the nuncio of spain with orders to inform the prince of wales in case of rupture that no impediment of the marriage proceeded from the court of rome who on the contrary had expedited the dispensation the prince's excursion to madrid was however universally blamed as being inimical to state interests nani author of a history of venice which according to his digressive manner is the universal history of his times has noticed this affair the people talked and the english murmured more than any other nation to see the only son of the king and heir of his realm's venture on so long a voyage and present himself rather as a hostage than a husband to a foreign court which so widely differed in government and religion to obtain by force of prayer and supplications a woman whom philip and his ministers made a point of honour and conscience to refuse footnote the prince and duke travelled under the assumed names of john and thomas smith king james wrote a poem on this expedition of which the first and last verses are as follow a copy is preserved among the rawlinson manuscripts bodleian library what sudden change hath darked of late the glory of the arcadian state the fleecy flocks refuse to feed the lambs to play the ewes to breed the altars smoke the offerings burn till jack and tom do safe return kind shepherds that have loved them long be not too rash in censuring wrong correct your fears leave off to mourn the heavens shall favour their return commit the care to royal pan of jack his son and tom his man in the footnote who say observes the english council were against it but king james obstinately resolved on it being over persuaded by gondomar the spanish ambassador whose facetious humour and lively repartees greatly delighted him gondomar persuaded him that the presence of the prince would not fail of accomplishing this union and also the restitution of the electorate to his son-in-law the palatine add to this the earl of bristol the english ambassador extraordinary at the court of madrid finding it his interest wrote repeatedly to his majesty that the success was certain if the prince came there for that the infanta would be charmed with his personal appearance and polished manners it was thus that james seduced by these two ambassadors and by his parental affection for both his children permitted the prince of wales to travel into spain this account differs from clarendon wickford says that james in all this was the dupe of gondomar who well knew the impossibility of this marriage which was alike inimical to the interests of politics and the inquisition for a long time he amused his majesty with hopes and even got money for the household expenses of the future queen he acted his part so well that the king of spain 
recompense the knave on his return with a seat in the council of state there is preserved in the british museum a considerable series of letters which passed between james i and the duke of buckingham and charles during their residence in spain i shall glean some further particulars concerning this mysterious affair from two english contemporaries howell and wilson who wrote from their own observations howell had been employed in this projected match and resided during its negotiation at madrid howell describes the first interview of prince charles and the infanta the infanta wore a blue riband about her arm that the prince might distinguish her and as soon as she saw the prince her colour rose very high wilson informs us that two days after this interview the prince was invited to run at the ring where his fair mistress was a spectator and to the glory of his fortune and the great contentment both of himself and the lookers-on he took the ring the very first course howell writing from madrid says the people here do mightily magnify the gallantry of the journey and cry out that he deserved to have the infanta thrown into his arms the first night he came the people appear however some time after to doubt if the english had any religion at all again i have seen the prince have his eyes immovably fixed upon the infanta half an hour together in a thoughtful speculative posture olivares who was no friend to this match coarsely observed that the prince watched her as a cat does a mouse charles indeed acted everything that a lover in one of the old romances could have done footnote in manuscript harleian sixty nine eighty seven is preserved buckingham's letter to james i describing the first interview speaking of the prince he says baby charles is himself so touched at the heart that he confesses all he ever yet saw is nothing to her and swears that if he want her there shall be blows End of footnote. he wants leaped over the walls of her garden and only retired by the entreaties of the old marquis who then guarded her and who falling on his knees solemnly protested that if the prince spoke to her his head would answer for it he watched hours in the street to meet with her and wilson says he gave such liberal presents to the court as well as buckingham to the spanish beauties that the lord treasurer middlesex complained repeatedly of their wasteful prodigality footnote though buckingham and charles were exigent of jewels for presents the king was equally profuse in sending until he had exhausted his store considerably more than one hundred and fifty thousand pounds worth were consigned to spain in a letter from newmarket march seventeenth sixteen twenty three preserved in harley and manuscript sixty nine eighty seven he enumerates a large quantity to be presented to the infanta and he is equally careful that prince charles should be well supplied as for thee my sweet gossip i send thee a fair table diamond for wearing in thy hat the king ingeniously prompts them to present the infanta with a small looking-glass to hang at her girdle and to assure her that by art magic whensoever she shall be pleased to look in it she shall see the fairest lady that either her brother's or your father's dominions can afford End of footnote let us now observe by what mode this match was consented to by the courts of spain and rome wilson informs us that charles agreed that any one should freely propose to him the arguments in favour of the catholic religion without giving any impediment but that he would never directly or indirectly permit any one to speak to the infanta against the same they probably had tampered with charles concerning his religion a letter of gregory the fifteenth to him is preserved in wilson's life but its authenticity has been doubted olivares said to buckingham you gave me some assurance and hope of the prince's turning catholic the duke roundly answered that it was false the spanish minister confounded at the bluntness of our english duke broke from him in a violent rage and lamented that state matters would not suffer him to do himself justice this insult was never forgiven and some time afterwards he attempted to revenge himself on buckingham by endeavouring to persuade james that he was at the head of a conspiracy against him 
we hasten to conclude these anecdotes not to be found in the pages of hume and smollett wilson says that both kingdoms rejoiced preparations were made in england to entertain the infanta a new church was built at st james's the foundation stone of which was laid by the spanish ambassador for the public exercise of her religion her portrait was multiplied in every corner of the town such as hoped to flourish under her eye suddenly began to be powerful in spain as wilson quaintly expresses himself the substance was as much courted as the shadow here indeed the infanta howell tells us was applying hard to the english language and was already called the princess of england to conclude charles complained of the repeated delays and he and the spanish court parted with a thousand civilities the infanta however observed that had the prince loved her he would not have quitted her how shall we dispel those clouds of mystery with which politics have covered this strange transaction it appears that james had in view the restoration of the palatinate to his daughter whom he could not effectually assist that the court of rome had speculations of the most dangerous tendency to the protestant religion that the marriage was broken off by that personal hatred which existed between olivares and buckingham and that if there was any sincerity existing between the parties concerned it rested with the prince and the infanta who were both youthful and romantic and were but two beautiful ivory balls in the hands of great players End of section one Section two of Curiosities of Literature, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama. Curiosities of Literature, Volume two by Isaac Disraeli. Duke of Buckingham the duke of buckingham in his bold and familiar manner appears to have been equally a favourite with james i and charles i he behaved with singular indiscretion both at the courts of france and spain various anecdotes might be collected from the memoir writers of those countries to convince us that our court was always little respected by its ill choice of this ambassador his character is hit off by one master stroke from the pencil of hume he had says this penetrating observer of men english familiarity and french levity so that he was in full possession of two of the most offensive qualities an ambassador can possess sir henry wotton has written an interesting life of our duke at school his character fully discovered itself even at that early period of life he would not apply to any serious studies but excelled in those lighter qualifications adapted to please in the world he was a graceful horseman musician and dancer his mother withdrew him from school at the early age of thirteen and he soon became a domestic favourite her fondness permitted him to indulge in every caprice and to cultivate those agreeable talents which were natural to him his person was beautiful, and his manners insinuating. In a word, he was adapted to become a courtier. The fortunate opportunity soon presented itself, for James saw him and invited him to court, and showered on him with a prodigal hand the cornucopia of royal patronage. Hosei, in his political memoirs, has detailed the anecdote of this duke, only known to the english reader in the general observation of the historian when he was sent to france to conduct the princess henrietta to the arms of charles i he had the insolence to converse with the queen of france not as an ambassador but as a lover the marchioness of senecy her lady of honour enraged at seeing this conversation continue seated herself in the armchair of the queen who that day was confined to her bed she did this to hinder the insolent duke from approaching the queen and probably taking other liberties as she observed that he still persisted in the lover sir she said in a severe tone of voice 
you must learn to be silent it is not thus we address the queen of france this audacity of the duke is further confirmed by nanny in his sixth book of the history of venice an historian who is not apt to take things lightly for when buckingham was desirous of once more being ambassador at that court in sixteen twenty six it was signified by the french ambassador that for reasons well known to himself his person would not be agreeable to his most christian majesty in a romantic threat the duke exclaimed he would go and see the queen in spite of the french court and to this petty affair is to be ascribed the war between the two nations the marshal of bassompierre in the journal of his embassy affords another instance to his english familiarity he says the king of england gave me a long audience and a very disputatious one he put himself in a passion while i without losing my respect expressed myself freely the duke of buckingham when he observed the king and myself very warm leapt suddenly betwixt his majesty and me exclaiming i am come to set all to rights betwixt you which i think is high time cardinal richelieu hated buckingham as sincerely as did the spaniard olivares this enmity was apparently owing to the cardinal writing to the duke without leaving any space open after the title of monsieur the duke to show his equality returned his answer in the same paper-sparing manner richelieu was jealous of buckingham whose favour with the queen of france was known this ridiculous circumstance between richelieu and buckingham reminds me of a similar one which happened to two spanish lords one signed at the end of his letter el marques the marquis as if the title had been peculiar to himself for its excellence his national vanity received a dreadful reproof from his correspondent who jealous of his equality signed otro marquis another marquis an anecdote given by sir henry wotton offers a characteristic trait of charles and his favourite they were now entered into the deep time of lent and could get no flesh into their inns whereupon fell out a pleasant passage if i may insert it by the way among more serious there was near bayon a herd of goats with their young ones on which site sir richard graham master of the horse to the marquis tells the marquis he could snap one of the kids and make some shift to carry him close to their lodgings which the prince overhearing why richard he says he do you think you may practice here your old tricks again upon the borders upon which word they first gave the goat herd good contentment and then while the marquis and his servant being both on foot were chasing the kid about the flock the prince from horseback killed him in the head with a scottish pistol let this serve for a journal parenthesis which may yet show how his highness even in such light and sportful damage had a noble sense of just dealing end of section two Section 3 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2 by Isaac Disraeli. The Death of Charles the Ninth. Dr. Cayet is an old French controversial writer, but is better known in French literature as an historian. His chronologie novenaire is full of anecdotes unknown to other writers. He collected them from his own observations, for he was under preceptor to Henry the Fourth. The dreadful massacre of St. Bartholomew took place in the reign of Charles the Ninth, on which occasion the English court went into mourning the singular death of charles has been regarded by the huguenots as an interposition of divine justice he died bathed in his blood which burst from his veins the horrors of this miserable prince on his dying bed are forcibly depicted by the anecdotes i am now collecting 
i shall premise however that charles was a mere instrument in the hands of his mother the political and cruel catherine of medicis dr Cayet, with honest naivete thus relates what he knew to have passed a few hours before his death king charles feeling himself near his end after having passed some time without pronouncing a word said as he turned himself on one side and as if he seemed to awake call my brother the queen mother was present who immediately sent for the duke of alencon the king perceiving him turned his back and again said let my brother come the queen his mother replied sir i do not know whom you mean here is your brother the king was displeased and said let them bring my brother the king of navarre it is he who is my brother the queen mother observing the dying monarch's resolute order sent for him but for reasons known only to herself she commanded the captain of the guards to conduct him under the vaults they went to the king of navarre and desired him to come and speak to the king at that moment this prince has since repeatedly said he felt a shuddering and apprehension of death so much that he would not go but king charles persisting on his coming the queen mother assured him that he should receive no injury in this promise however he put little trust he went accompanied by the viscount d'auchy on whose word he chiefly relied having however observed under these vaults a great number of halberdiers and arquebusiers in ranks he would have returned when the viscount and the captain reassured him that no harm should happen to him the soldiers bowed and their behaviour was respectful by a private staircase he entered the chamber of the king who immediately on perceiving him turned towards him and stretched out his arms the king of navarre was affected he sighed and wept and fell on his knees at the side of the bed charles embraced and having kissed him said my brother you lose a good master and a good friend i know it is not you who occasions me so much trouble had i believed what they said you would not have been alive but i have always loved you it is to you alone i trust my wife and daughter earnestly do i recommend them to your care do not trust the queen but god protect you the queen mother here interrupted him ah sir do not say that yes madam i must say it it is the truth believe me my brother love me assist my wife and daughter and implore god for mercy on me adieu my brother adieu the king of navarre remained till his majesty expired the following minute particulars are drawn from the journal of pierre de l'etoile in the simplicity of his narration so pleasing in the old writers the nurse and the monarch the religious remorse of the one and the artless consolations of the other become interesting objects king charles two days before his death having called for mazilla his chief physician and complaining of the pains he suffered asked him if it was not possible that he and so many other celebrated physicians that were in his realms could give some alleviation to his disorder for i am said he cruelly and horridly tormented to which mazilla replied that whatever had depended on them had been tried but that in truth god only could be the sovereign physician in such complaints i believe said the king that what you say is true and that you know nothing else draw from me my custode or large cap that i may try to rest mazilla withdrew and left orders that all should leave the king except three viz la tour st pri and his nurse whom his majesty greatly loved although she was a huguenot as she had just seated herself on a coffer and began to doze she heard the king groan bitterly weeping and sighing she then approached the bed softly and drawing away his custode the king said to her giving vent to a heavy sigh and shedding tears plentifully insomuch that they interrupted his discourse ah my dear nurse my beloved woman what blood what murders ah i have followed 
wicked advice oh my god pardon me and be merciful i know not where i am they have made me so perplexed and agitated how will all this end what shall i do i am lost for ever i know it then the nurse thus addressed him sire be the murders on those who forced you to order them your majesty could not help it and since you never consented and now regret them believe god will never impute them to you and will cover them with the mantle of justice of his son to whom alone you should look for aid ah for the honour of god let your majesty cease from this weeping having said this she rose for a handkerchief for his was drenched with tears charles having taken it from her made a sign that she should retire and leave him to repose the dreadful narrative of the massacre of st bartholomew is detailed in the history of de tu and the same scene is painted in glowing though in faithful colours by voltaire in the henriade charles whose last miserable moments we come from contemplating when he observed several fugitive huguenots about his palace in the morning after the massacre of thirty thousand of their friends took a fowling piece and repeatedly fired at them such was the effect of religion operating perhaps not on a malignant but on a feeble mind End of section three Section 4 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2 by Isaac Disraeli. Royal Promotions if the golden gate of preferment is not usually open to men of real merit persons of no worth have entered it in a most extraordinary manner chevreau informs us that the sultan osman having observed a gardener planting a cabbage with some peculiar dexterity the manner so attracted his imperial eye that he raised him to an office near his person and shortly afterwards he rewarded the planter of cabbages by creating him beglergebeg or viceroy of the isle of cyprus mark antony gave the house of a roman citizen to a cook who had prepared for him a good supper many have been raised to extraordinary preferment by capricious monarchs for the sake of a jest louis the eleventh promoted a poor priest whom he found sleeping in the porch of a church that the proverb might be verified that to lucky men good fortune will come even when they are asleep our henry the seventh made a viceroy of ireland if not for the sake of at least with a clench when the king was told that all ireland could not rule the earl of kildare he said then shall this earl rule all ireland it is recorded of henry the eighth that he raised a servant to a considerable dignity because he had taken care to have a roasted boar prepared for him when his majesty happened to be in the humour of feasting on one and the title of sugar loaf court in leadenhall street was probably derived from another piece of munificence of this monarch the widow of a mr cornwallis was rewarded by the gift of a dissolved priory there situated for some fine puddings with which she had presented his majesty when cardinal de monte was elected pope before he left the conclave he bestowed a cardinal's hat upon a servant whose chief merit consisted in the daily attentions he paid to his holiness's monkey louis barbier owed all his good fortune to the familiar knowledge he had of rabelais he knew his rabelais by heart this served to introduce him to the duke of orleans who took great pleasure in reading that author it was for this he gave him an abbey and he was gradually promoted till he became a cardinal georges villiers was suddenly raised from private station and loaded with wealth and honours by james i merely for his personal beauty footnote 
on his first coming to court he was made cup-bearer to the king then master of the horse then ennobled made lord high admiral warden of the sank poor constable of windsor castle ranger of royal parks etc etc a list of the public plunderings of himself and family is given in sloane manuscript eight to six amounting to more than twenty seven thousand pounds per annum in rents of manors irrespective of fifty thousand pounds paid to the duke by privy seal of free gifts but alleged to be intended for the navy many pensions and customs were also made over to his use End of footnote almost all the favourites of james became so from their handsomeness footnote king james delighted in calling the duke of buckingham steeny as has been already instanced in the letter quoted page four sixty three volume one this was not the duke's christian name but was invented for him by his royal master who fancied his features resembled those usually given to st stephen and whose face was usually depicted in, in accordance with the description in acts six fifteen as it had been the face of an angel in the footnote Monsieur de Chamillard, minister of France, owed his promotion merely to his being the only man who could beat Louis the Fourteenth at billiards. He retired with a pension after ruining the finances of his country. The Duke of Loignes was originally a country lad who insinuated himself into the favor of Louis the Thirteenth, then young by making bird traps, pie grieche to catch sparrows it was little expected says voltaire that these puerile amusements were to be terminated by a most sanguinary revolution de lunez after causing his patron the marshal d'ancre to be assassinated and the queen-mother to be imprisoned raised himself to a title and the most tyrannical power sir walter raleigh owed his promotion to an act of gallantry to queen elizabeth and sir christopher hatton owed his preferment to his dancing queen elizabeth observes granger with all her sagacity could not see the future lord chancellor in the fine dancer the same writer says nothing could form a more curious collection of memoirs than anecdotes of preferment could the secret history of great men be traced it would appear that merit is rarely the first step to advancement it would much oftener be found to be owing to superficial qualifications and even vices End of section four. section five of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2 by Isaac Disraeli. Nobility. Francis I was accustomed to say that when the nobles of his kingdom came to court, they were received by the world as so many little kings that the day after they were only beheld as so many princes, but on the third day they were merely considered as so many gentlemen and were confounded among the crowd of courtiers. It was supposed that this was done with a political view of humbling the proud nobility, and for this reason Henry the Fourth frequently said aloud in the presence of the princes of the blood, We are all gentlemen. It is recorded of Philip the Third of Spain that while he exacted the most punctilious respect from the grandees, he saluted the peasants. He would never be addressed but on the knees, for which he gave this artful excuse, that as he was of low stature, every one would have appeared too high for him. He showed himself rarely even to his grandees, that he might the better support his haughtiness and repress their pride. He also affected to speak to them by half-words, and reprimanded them if they did not guess the rest. In a word, he omitted nothing that could mortify his nobility. End of Section 5 
Section six of Curiosities of Literature, Volume two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. Curiosities of Literature, Volume two, by Isaac Disraeli modes of salutation and amicable ceremonies observed in various nations when men writes the philosophical compiler of l'esprit de usage et la coutumes salute each other in an amicable manner it signifies little whether they move a particular part of the body or practice a particular ceremony in these actions there must exist different customs. Every nation imagine it employs the most reasonable ones, but all are equally simple, and none are to be treated as ridiculous. This infinite number of ceremonies may be reduced to two kinds, to reverences or salutations, and to the touch of some part of the human body to bend and prostrate oneself to express sentiments of respect appears to be a natural motion for terrified persons throw themselves on the earth when they adore invisible beings and the affectionate touch of the person they salute is an expression of tenderness as nations decline from their ancient simplicity much farce and grimace are introduced superstition the manners of a people, and their situation, influence the modes of salutation, as may be observed from the instances we collect. Modes of salutation have sometimes very different characters, and it is no uninteresting speculation to examine their shades. Many display a refinement of delicacy, while others are remarkable for their simplicity, or for their sensibility. In general, however, they are frequently the same in the infancy of nations, and in more polished societies. Respect, humility, fear, and esteem are expressed much in a similar manner, for these are the natural consequence of the organization of the body. These demonstrations become in time only empty civilities, which signify nothing. We shall notice what they were originally, without reflecting on what they are. Primitive nations have no peculiar modes of salutation. They know no reverences or other compliments, or they despise and disdain them. The Greenlanders laugh when they see an European uncover his head and bend his body before him whom he calls his superior. The islanders, near the Philippines, take the hand or foot of him they salute, and with it they gently rub their face. The Laplanders apply their nose strongly against that of the person they salute. Dampier says that at New Guinea they are satisfied to put on their heads the leaves of trees which have ever passed for symbols of friendship and peace. This is at least a picturesque salute. Other salutations are very incommodious and painful. It requires great practice to enable a man to be polite in an island situated in the Straits of the Sound. Hotman tells us they saluted him in this grotesque manner. They raised his left foot, which they passed gently over the right leg, and from thence over his face. The inhabitants of the Philippines use a most complex attitude. They bend their body very low, place their hands on their cheeks, and raise at the same time one foot in the air with their knee bent. An Ethiopian takes the robe of another and ties it about his own waist so that he leaves his friend half naked. This custom of undressing on these occasions takes other forms. Sometimes men place themselves naked before the person whom they salute. It is to show their humility and that they are unworthy of appearing in his presence. 
This was practiced before Sir Joseph Banks, when he received the visits of two female Otaheitans. Their innocent simplicity, no doubt, did not appear immodest in the eyes of the virtuoso. Sometimes they only undress partially. The Japanese only take off a slipper. The people of Arakan their sandals in the street and their stockings in the house. In the progress of time, it appears servile to uncover oneself. The grandees of Spain claim the right of appearing covered before the king, to show that they are not so much subjected to him as the rest of the nation. And, this writer truly observes, we may remark that the English do not uncover their heads so much as the other nations of Europe. Mr. Hobhouse observes that uncovering the head with the Turks is a mark of indecent familiarity. In their mosques, the Franks must keep their hats on. The Jewish custom of wearing their hats in their synagogues is, doubtless, the same Oriental custom. In a word, there is not a nation, observes the humorous Montaigne, even to the people who, when they salute, turn their backs on their friends, but that can be justified in their customs. The Negroes are lovers of ludicrous actions, and hence all their ceremonies seem farcical. The greater part pull the fingers till they crack. Snellgrave gives an odd representation of the embassy which the king of Dahomey sent to him. The ceremonies of salutation consisted in the most ridiculous contortions. When two Negro monarchs visit, they embrace in snapping three times the middle finger. Barbarous nations frequently imprint on their salutations the dispositions of their character. When the inhabitants of Carmina, says Athenaeus, would show a peculiar mark of esteem, they breathed a vein, and presented for the beverage of their friend the flowing blood. The Franks tore the hair from their head, and presented it to the person they saluted. The slave cut his hair, and offered it to his master." The Chinese are singularly affected in their personal civilities. They even calculate the number of their reverences. These are the most remarkable postures. The men move their hands in an affectionate manner while they are joined together on the breast and bow their head a little. If they respect a person, they raise their hands joined and then lower them to the earth in bending the body. If two persons meet after a long separation, they both fall on their knees and bend the face to the earth, and this ceremony they repeat two or three times. Surely we may differ here with the sentiment of Montaigne, and confess this ceremony to be ridiculous. It arises from their national affectation. They substitute artificial ceremonies for natural actions." Their expressions mean as little as their ceremonies. If a Chinese is asked how he finds himself in health, he answers, Very well, thanks to your abundant felicity. If they would tell a man that he looks well, they say, Prosperity is painted on your face, or Your air announces your happiness. If you render them any service, they say, My thanks shall be immortal. If you praise them, they answer, How shall I dare to persuade myself of what you say of me? If you dine with them, they tell you at parting, We have not treated you with sufficient distinction. The various titles they invent for each other, it would be impossible to translate. It is to be observed that all these answers are prescribed by the Chinese ritual, or Academy of Compliments. There are determined the number of bows, the expressions to be employed, the genuflections and the inclinations which are to be made to the right or left hand, the salutations of the master before the chair where the stranger is to be seated, for he salutes it most profoundly, 
and wipes the dust away with the skirts of his robe. All these and other things are noticed, even to the silent gestures by which you are entreated to enter the house. The lower class of people are equally nice in these punctilios, and ambassadors pass forty days in practicing them before they are enabled to appear at court. A tribunal of ceremonies has been erected, and every day very odd decrees are issued, to which the Chinese most religiously submit. The marks of honor are frequently arbitrary. To be seated with us is a mark of repose and familiarity, to stand up that of respect. There are countries, however, in which princes will only be addressed by persons who are seated, and it is considered as a favor to be permitted to stand in their presence. This custom prevails in despotic countries. A despot cannot suffer without disgust the elevated figure of his subjects. He is pleased to bend their bodies with their genius. His presence must lay those who behold him prostrate on the earth. He desires no eagerness, no attention. He would only inspire terror. End of section six. Section seven of Curiosities of Literature, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2, by Isaac Disraeli. Fire and the Origin of Fireworks. In the Memoirs of the French Academy, a little essay on this subject is sufficiently curious. The following contains the facts. Fireworks were not known to antiquity. It is certainly a modern invention. If ever the ancients employed fires at their festivals, it was only for religious purposes. Fire, in primeval ages, was a symbol of respect or an instrument of terror. In both these ways God manifested himself to man. In the holy writings he compares himself sometimes to an ardent fire, to display his holiness and his purity. Sometimes he renders himself visible under the form of a burning bush, to express himself to be as formidable as a devouring fire. Again, he rains sulphur, and often, before he speaks, he attracts the attention of the multitude by flashes of lightning. Fire was worshipped as a divinity by several idolaters. The Platonists confounded it with the heavens, and considered it as the divine intelligence. Sometimes it is a symbol of majesty. God walked if we may so express ourselves, with his people, preceded by a pillar of fire, and the monarchs of Asia, according to Herodotus, commanded that such ensigns of their majesty should be carried before them. These fires, according to Quintus Curtius, were considered as holy and eternal, and were carried at the head of their armies on little altars of silver, in the midst of the magi who accompanied them and sang their hymns. Fire was also a symbol of majesty among the Romans, and if it was used by them in their festivals, it was rather employed for the ceremonies of religion than for a peculiar mark of their rejoicings. Fair was always held to be most proper and holy for sacrifices, in this the pagans imitated the Hebrews. The fire so carefully preserved by the Vestals was probably an imitation of that which fell from heaven on the victim offered by Aaron and long afterwards religiously kept up by the priests. Servius, one of the seven kings of Rome, commanded a great fire of straw to be kindled in the public place of every town in Italy to consecrate for repose a certain day in seed time, or sowing. The Greeks lighted lamps at a certain feast held in honor of Minerva, who gave them oil, of Vulcan, who was the inventor of lamps, and of Prometheus, who had rendered them service by the fire which he had stolen from heaven. Another feast to Bacchus was celebrated by a grand nocturnal illumination, in which wine was poured forth profusely to all passengers. A feast in memory of Ceres, who sought so long in the darkness of hell for her daughter, was kept by burning a number of torches. Great illuminations were made in various other meetings, 
particularly in the secular games, which lasted three whole nights, and so carefully were they kept up that these nights had no darkness. In all their rejoicings the ancients indeed used fires, but they were intended merely to burn their sacrifices, and, as the generality of them were performed at night, the illuminations served to give light to the ceremonies. Artificial fires were indeed frequently used by them, but not in public rejoicings. Like us, they employed them for military purposes, but we use them likewise successfully for our decorations and amusement. From the latest times of paganism to the early ages of Christianity, we can but rarely quote instances of fire lighted up for other purposes, in a public form, than for the ceremonies of religion. Illuminations were made at the baptism of princes as a symbol of that life of light in which they were going to enter by faith, or at the tombs of martyrs to light them during the watchings of the night. All these were abolished from the various abuses they introduced. We only trace the rise of feux de joie, or fireworks, given merely for amusing spectacles to delight the eye, to the epoca of the invention of powder and cannon, at the close of the thirteenth century. It was these two inventions, doubtless, whose effects furnished the ideas of all those machines and artifices which form the charms of these fires. To the Florentines and the Sienese, we are indebted not only for the preparation of powder with other ingredients to amuse the eyes, but also for the invention of elevated machines and decorations adapted to augment the pleasure of the spectacle. They began their attempts at the feasts of St. John the Baptist and the Assumption, on wooden edifices, which they adorned with painted statues, from whose mouth and eyes issued a beautiful fire. Callot has engraven numerous specimens of the pageants, triumphs, and processions under a great variety of grotesque forms, dragons, swans, eagles, etc., which were built up large enough to carry many persons, while they vomited forth the most amusing firework. This use passed from Florence to Rome, where, at the creation of the popes, they displayed illuminations of hand grenados thrown from the height of a castle. Pyrotechnics from that time have become an art, which, in the degree the inventions have displayed ability in combining the powers of architecture, sculpture, and painting, have produced a number of beautiful effects, which even give pleasure to those who read the descriptions without having beheld them. Footnote. The great exhibition of fireworks at Rome, at the castle of St. Angelo, during the festivities of the Holy Week, preserved the character of the displays of fireworks adopted on great occasions in the 17th century. An enormous explosion of squibs, crackers, and rockets was the tour de force in such celebrations. The volume describing the entry of Louis XIII to Lyon in 1624 contains an engraving of the fireworks constructed on barges in the river on that occasion. A blazing crowned sun, surrounded by a wheel of stars, squibs, star rockets, and water serpents flying about it, composed the feu d'artifice. In the volume descriptive of the rejoicings in the same city on the ratification of peace between France and Spain in 1660 are several engravings in which fireworks are shown, but they exhibit no novelties, being restricted to rockets and pots of fire bursting into colored stars. Henry Van Eaton's Mathematical Recreations, 1633, notes the principal artificial fireworks then in use, and gives engravings of several, and instructions to make them rockets, fireballs, stars, golden rain, serpents, and catherine wheels are the principal noted. Fiery dragons combatant, running on lines and filled with fireworks were the greatest stretch of invention at this time, and our author says they may be made to meet one another, having lights placed in the concavity of their bodies, which will give great grace to the action. End of footnote a pleasing account of decorated fireworks is given in the secret memoirs of France. In August 1764, Torre, an Italian artist, obtained permission to exhibit a pyrotechnic operation. The Parisians admired the variety of the colors and the ingenious forms of his fire, but his first exhibition was disturbed by the populace, as well as by the apparent danger of the fire, although it was displayed on the boulevards. In October it was repeated, and proper precautions having been taken, they admired the beauty of the fire without fearing it. 
These artificial fires are described as having been rapidly and splendidly executed. The exhibition closed with a transparent triumphal arch and a curtain illuminated by the same fire, admirably exhibiting the palace of Pluto. Around the columns, stanzas were inscribed, supported by cupids, with other fanciful embellishments. Among these little pieces of poetry appeared the following one, which ingeniously announced a more perfect exhibition. Les vents, les frimants, les orages, et un droit ces feux, pour un temps, mais ainsi que les fleurs, avec plus d'ovotage, ils reintront dans le printemps. Imitated The icy gale, the falling snow, extinction to these fires shall bring, but, like the flowers, with brighter glow, they shall renew their charms in spring. The exhibition was greatly improved according to this premise of the artist. His subject was chosen with much felicity. It was a representation of the forges of Vulcan under Mount Etna. The interior of the mount discovered Vulcan and his cyclops. Venus was seen to descend and demand of her consort Amor for Aeneas. Opposite to this was seen the palace of Vulcan, which represented a deep and brilliant perspective. The labors of the Cyclops produced numberless, very happy combinations of artificial fires. The public, with pleasing astonishment, beheld the effects of the volcano, so admirably adapted to the nature of these fires. At another entertainment he gratified the public with a representation of Orpheus and Eurydice in hell. Many striking circumstances occasioned a marvelous illusion. What subjects indeed could be more analogous to this kind of fire? Such scenical fireworks display more brilliant effects than our stars, wheels, and rockets. End of section 7「Section 8 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Fallis. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2, by Isaac Disraeli. The Bible Prohibited and Improved. The following are the express words contained in the regulation of the popes to prohibit the use of the Bible. As it is manifest by experience that if the use of the holy writers is permitted in the vulgar tongue, more evil than profit will arise. Because of the temerity of man, it is for this reason all Bibles are prohibited. Prohibentur Biblia. With all their parts, whether they be printed or written in whatever vulgar language soever, as also are prohibited all summaries or abridgments of Bibles or any books of the holy writings, although they should only be historical, and that in whatever vulgar tongue they may be written. It is there also said that the reading the Bibles of Catholic editors may be permitted to those by whose perusal or power the faith may be spread and who will not criticize it. But this permission is not to be granted without an express order of the bishop or the inquisitor with the advice of the curate and confessor, and their permission must first be had in writing, and he who, without permission, presumes to read the holy writings or to have them in his possession shall not be absolved of his sins before he first shall have returned the Bible to his bishop. A Spanish author says that if a person should come to his bishop to ask for leave to read the Bible with the best intention, the bishop should answer him from Matthew chapter 20, verse 20, you know not what you ask. And indeed, he observes, the nature of this demand indicates an heretical disposition. 
the reading of the Bible was prohibited by Henry the Eighth, except by those who occupied high offices in the state. A noble lady or gentlewoman might read it in their garden or orchard or other retired places, but men and women in the lower ranks were positively forbidden to read it or to have it read to them under the penalty of a month's imprisonment. Dr. Franklin has preserved an anecdote of the prohibited Bible in the time of our Catholic Mary. His family had an English Bible, and to conceal it the more securely, they conceived the project of fastening it open with pack threads across the leaves on the inside of the lid of a close stool. When my great-grandfather wished to read to his family, he reversed the lid of the close stool upon his knees and passed the leaves from one side to the other, which were held down on each by the pack thread. One of the children was stationed at the door to give notice if he saw an officer of the spiritual court make his appearance. In that case, the lid was restored to its place with the Bible concealed under it as before. The reader may meditate on what the popes did, and what they probably would have done, had not Luther happily been in a humor to abuse the pope and begin a reformation. It would be curious to sketch an account of the probable situation of Europe at the present moment, had the pontiffs preserved the omnipotent power of which they had gradually possessed themselves. It appears, by an act dated in 1516, that the Bible was called Bibliotheca, that is, per emphasim, the library. The word library was limited in its signification, then, to the biblical writings. No other books, compared with the holy writings, appear to have been worthy to rank with them or constitute what we call a library. We have had several remarkable attempts to recompose the Bible. Dr. Geddes's version is aridly literal and often ludicrous by its vulgarity, as when he translates the Passover as the skip-over, and introduces constables among the ancient Israelites. But the following attempts are of a very different kind. Sebastian Castellon, who afterwards changed his name to Castellian, with his accustomed affectation referring to Castellia, the fountain of the muses, took a very extraordinary liberty with the sacred writings. He fancied he could give the world a more classical version of the Bible, and for this purpose introduces phrases and entire sentences from profane writers into the text of Holy Writ. His whole style is finically quaint, overloaded with prettinesses and all the ornaments of false taste. Of the noble simplicity of the scripture, he seems not to have had the remotest conception but an attempt by Père Berrier is more extraordinary. In his Histoire du Poupel des Doux, he has recomposed the Bible as he would have written a fashionable novel. He conceives that the great legislator of the Hebrews is too barren in his descriptions, too concise in the events he records, nor is he careful to enrich his history by pleasing reflections and interesting conversation pieces, and hurries on the catastrophes, by which means he omits much entertaining matter. As, for instance, in the loves of Joseph and the wife of Potiphar, Moses is very dry and concise, which, however, our Père Bruyer is not. His histories of Joseph and of King David are relishing morsels, and were devoured eagerly in all the boudoirs of Paris. Take a specimen of the style. Joseph combined, with a regularity of features and a brilliant complexion, an air of the noblest dignity, all which contributed to render him one of the most amiable men in Egypt. At length, she declares her passion and pressed him to answer her. It never entered her mind that the advances of a woman of her rank could ever be rejected. Joseph, at first, only replied to all her wishes by his cold embarrassments. 
she would not yet give him up in vain he flies from her she was too passionate to waste even the moments of his astonishment this good father however does ample justice to the gallantry of the patriarch jacob he offers to serve laban seven years for rachel nothing is too much cries the venerable novelist when one really loves and this admirable observation he confirms by the facility with which the obliging rachel allows leah for one night to her husband in this manner the patriarchs are made to speak in the tone of the tenderest lovers judith is a parisian coquette holofernes is rude as a german baron and their dialogues are tedious with all the reciprocal politesse of metaphysical french lovers moses in the desert it was observed is precisely as pedantic as pere Brier, addressing his class at the university one cannot but smile at the following expressions by the easy manner in which god performed miracles one might easily perceive they cost no effort when he has narrated an adventure of the patriarchs he proceeds after such an extraordinary or curious or interesting adventure etc this good father had caught the language of the beau monde but with such perfect simplicity that in employing it on sacred history he was not aware of the ludicrous style in which he was writing a gothic bishop translated the scriptures into the goth language but omitted the book of kings lest the wars of which so much is there recorded should increase their inclination to fighting already too prevalent jorton notices this castrated copy of the bible in his remarks on ecclesiastical history as the bible in many parts consists merely of historical transactions and as too many exhibit a detail of offensive ones it has often occurred to the fathers of families as well as to the popes to prohibit its general reading archbishop tillotson formed a design of purifying the historical parts those who have given us a family shakespeare in the same spirit may present us with a family bible in these attempts to recompose the bible the broad vulgar colloquial diction which has been used by our theological writers is less tolerable than the quaintness of castalian and the floridity of pere Brier. the style now noticed long disgraced the writings of our divines and we see it sometimes still employed by some of a certain stamp matthew henry whose commentaries are well known writes in this manner on judges nine we are here told by what acts abimelech got into the saddle none would have dreamed of making such a fellow as he king see how he has wheedled them into the choice he hired into his service the scum and scoundrels of the country jotham was really a fine gentleman the Sechemites that set Abimelech up were the first to kick him off. The Sechemites said all the ill they could of him in their table talk. They drank healths to his confusion. Well, Gaul's interest in Sechem is soon at an end. Exit Gaul. Lancelot Addison, by the vulgar coarseness of his style, forms an admirable contrast with the amenity and grace of his son's spectators. He tells us in his voyage to Barbary that a rabbin once told him, among other heinous stuff, that he did not expect the felicity of the next world on the account of any merits but his own. Whoever kept the law would arrive at the bliss by coming upon his own legs. It must be confessed that the rabbin, considering he could not conscientiously have the same creed as Addison, did not deliver any very heinous stuff in believing that other people's merits have nothing to do with our own, and that we should stand on our own legs. But this was not proper words in proper places. End of section 8《Section Nine of Curiosities of Literature, Volume Two, 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2, by Isaac Disraeli. Origin of the Materials of Writing it is curious to observe the various substitutes for paper before its discovery ere the invention of recording events by writing trees were planted rude altars were erected or heaps of stone to serve as memorials of past events hercules probably could not write when he fixed his famous pillars the most ancient mode of writing was on bricks tiles and oyster shells and on tables of stone afterwards on plates of various materials on ivory on barks of trees on leaves of trees footnote specimens of most of these modes of writing may be seen at the british museum number three four seven eight in the slonian library is a nabob's letter on a piece of bark about two yards long and richly ornamented with gold numbered three two zero seven is a book of mexican hieroglyphics painted on bark in the same collection are various species many from the malabar coast and the east the latter writings are chiefly on leaves there are several copies of bibles written on palm leaves the ancients doubtless wrote on any leaves they found adapted for the purpose hence the leaf of a book alluding to that of a tree seems to be derived at the british museum we have also babylonian tiles or broken pots which the people used and made their contracts of business on a custom mentioned in the scriptures in the footnote engraving memorable events on hard surfaces was giving as it were speech to rocks and metals in the book of job mention is made of writing on stone on rocks and on sheets of lead on tables of stone moses received the law written by the finger of god hesiod's works were written on leaden tables lead was used for writing and rolled up like a cylinder as pliny states montfaucon notices a very ancient book of eight leaden leaves which on the back had rings fastened by a small leaden rod to keep them together they afterwards engraved on bronze the laws of the cretans were on bronze tables the romans etched their public records on brass the speech of claudius engraved on plates of bronze is yet preserved in the town hall of lyon in france footnote this speech was made by claudius who was born at lyon when censor a d forty eight and was of the highest importance to the men of lyon inasmuch as it led to the grant of the privileges of roman citizenship to them this important inscription was discovered in fifteen twenty eight on the heights of st sebastian above the town End of footnote. several bronze tables with etruscan characters have been dug up in tuscany the treaties among the romans spartans and the jews were written on brass and estates for better security were made over on this enduring metal in many cabinets may be found the discharge of soldiers written on copper plates this custom has been discovered in india a bill of furfment on copper has been dug up near bengal dated a century before the birth of christ among these early inventions many were singularly rude and miserable substitutes for a better material in the shepherd state they wrote their songs with thorns and awls on straps of leather which they wound round their crooks the icelanders appear to have scratched their runes a kind of hieroglyphics on walls and olaf according to one of the sagas built a large house on the bulks and spars of which he had engraved the history of his own and more ancient times while another northern hero appears to have had nothing better than his own chair and bed to perpetuate his own heroic acts on at the town hall in hanover are kept twelve wooden boards overlaid with beeswax on which are written the names of owners of houses but not the names of streets these wooden manuscripts must have existed before fourteen twenty three when hanover was first divided into streets such manuscripts may be found in public collections these are an evidence of a rude state of society the same event occurred among the ancient arabs who according to the history of mahomet seem to have carved on the shoulder-bones of sheep remarkable events 
with a knife and tying them with a string hung up these sheep-bone chronicles the laws of the twelve tables which the romans chiefly copied from the grecian code were after they had been approved by the people engraven on brass they were melted by lightning which struck the capital a loss highly regretted by augustus this manner of writing we still retain for inscriptions epitaphs and other memorials designed to reach posterity these early inventions led to the discovery of tables of wood and as cedar has an antiseptic quality from its bitterness they chose this wood for cases or chests to preserve their most important writings this well-known expression of the ancients when they meant to give the highest eulogium of an excellent work et cedro digna losuti that it was worthy to be written on cedar alludes to the oil of cedar with which valuable manuscripts of parchment were anointed to preserve them from corruption and moths perseus illustrates this who would not leave posterity such rhymes as cedar oil might keep to latest times they stained materials for writing upon with purple and rubbed them with exudations from the cedar the laws of the emperors were published on wooden tables painted with ceruz to which custom horace alludes lagus in sidery ligno such tables the term now softened into tablets are still used but in general are made of other materials than wood the same reason for which they preferred the cedar to other wood induced to write on wax as being incorruptible men generally used it to write their testaments on the better to preserve them thus juvenal says sarus implari capices this thin paste of wax was also used on tablets of wood that it might more easily admit of erasure for daily use they wrote with an iron bodkin as they did on the other substances we have noticed the stylus was made sharp at one end to write with and blunt and broad at the other to efface and correct easily hence the phrase where terry stylum to turn the stylus was used to express blotting out but the romans forbade the use of this sharp instrument from the circumstance of many persons having used them as daggers a schoolmaster was killed by the pugilares or table books and the styles of his own scholars footnote the paintings discovered at pompeii give representations of these books and implements End of footnote they substituted a stylus made of the bone of a bird or other animal so that their writings resembled engravings when they wrote on softer materials they employed reeds and canes split like our pens at the points which the orientalists still use to lay their colour or ink neater on the paper naudet observes that when he was in italy about sixteen forty two he saw some of those waxen tablets called pugilares so called because they were held in one hand and others composed of the barks of trees which the ancients employed in lieu of paper on these tablets or table books mr assel observes that the greeks and romans continued the use of wax table books long after the use of the papyrus leaves and skins became common because they were convenient for correcting extemporaneous compositions from these table books they transcribed their performances correctly into parchment books if for their own private use but if for sale or for the library the library or scribes performed the office the writing on table books is particularly recommended by quintilian in the third chapter of the tenth book of his institutions because the wax is readily effaced for any corrections he confesses weak eyes do not see so well on paper and observes that the frequent necessity of dipping the pen in the inkstand retards the hand and is but ill suited to the celerity of the mind some of these table books are conjectured to have been large and perhaps heavy for in plaudus a schoolboy is represented breaking his master's head with his table book 
the critics according to cicero were accustomed in reading their wax manuscripts to notice obscure or vicious phrases by joining a piece of red wax as we should underline such by red ink table books written upon with styles were not entirely laid aside in chaucer's time who describes them in his sompner's tale his fellow had a staff tipped with horn a pair of tables all of ivory and a point to polish fetusly and wrote always the names as he stood of all folk that gave him any good footnote the use of the table book was continued to the reign of james the first or later shakespeare frequently alludes to them and therefore will he wipe his tables clean and keep no tell-tale to his memory they were in the form of a modern pocket-book the leaves of asses skin or covered with a composition upon which a silver or leaden style would inscribe memoranda capable of erasure in the footnote by the word pen in the translation of the bible we must understand an iron style table books of ivory are still used for memoranda written with black lead pencils the romans used ivory to write the edicts of the senate on with a black colour and the expression of libri elephantini which some authors imagine alludes to books that for their size were called elephantine were most probably composed of ivory the tusk of the elephant among the romans they were undoubtedly scarce the pumice stone was a writing material of the ancients they used it to smooth the roughness of the parchment or to sharpen their reeds in the progress of time the art of writing consisted in painting with different kinds of ink this novel mode of writing occasioned them to invent other materials proper to receive their writing the thin bark of certain trees and plants or linen and at length when this was found apt to become mouldy they prepared the skins of animals on the dried skins of serpents were once written the iliad and odyssey the first place where they began to dress these skins was pergamus in asia whence the latin name is derived of pergameno or a parchment these skins are however better known amongst the authors of the purest latin under the name of membrana so called from the membranes of various animals of which they were composed the ancients had parchments of three different colours white yellow and purple at rome white parchment was disliked because it was more subject to be soiled than the others and dazzled the eye they generally wrote in letters of gold and silver on purple or violet parchment this custom continued in the early ages of the church and copies of the evangelists of this kind are preserved in the british museum when the egyptians employed for writing the bark of a plant or reed called papyrus or paper rush it superseded all former modes for its convenience formerly it grew in great quantities on the sides of the nile this plant has given its name to our paper although the latter is now composed of linen and rags and formerly had been of cotton wool which was but brittle and yellow and improved by using cotton rags which they glazed after the eighth century the papyrus was superseded by parchment the chinese make their paper with silk the use of paper is of great antiquity it is what the ancient latinists called charta or chartai before the use of parchment and paper passed to the romans they used the thin peel found between the wood and the bark of trees this skinny substance they called liber from whence the latin word liber a book and library and librarian in the european languages and the french livre for book but we of northern origin derive our book from the danish bog the beech tree because that being the most plentiful in denmark was used to engrave on anciently instead of folding this bark this parchment or paper as we fold ours they rolled it according as they wrote on it and the latin name which they gave these rolls has passed into our language as well as the others we say a volume or volumes although our books are composed of leaves bound together the books of the ancients on the shelves of their libraries were rolled up on a pin and placed erect 
titled on the outside in red letters or rubrics and appeared like a number of small pillars on the shelves footnote a box containing such written rolls is represented in one of the pictures exhumed at pompeii End of footnote. the ancients were as curious as ourselves in having their books richly conditioned propertius describes tablets with gold borders and ovid notices their red titles but in later times besides the tint of purple with which they tinged their vellum and the liquid gold which they employed for their ink they inlaid their covers with precious stones and i have seen in the library at Trire or trevis a manuscript the donation of some princes to a monastery studded with heads wrought in fine cameos footnote see note to volume one page five End of footnote. in the early ages of the church they painted on the outside commonly a dying christ in the curious library of mr deuce is a psalter supposed once to have appertained to charlemagne the vellum is purple and the letters gold the eastern nations likewise tinge their manuscripts with different colours and decorations assel possessed arabian manuscripts of which some leaves were of a deep yellow and others of a lilac colour sir william jones describes an oriental manuscript in which the name of mohammed was fancifully adorned with a garland of tulips and carnations painted in the brightest colours the favourite works of the persians are written on fine silky paper the ground of which is often powdered with gold or silver dust the leaves are frequently illuminated and the whole book is sometimes perfumed with essence of roses or sandalwood the romans had several sorts of paper for which they had as many different names one was the charter augusta in compliment to the emperor another lavinia named after the empress there was a charter blanca which obtained its title from its beautiful whiteness and which we appear to have retained by applying it to a blank sheet of paper which is only signed charte blanche they had also a charta nigra painted black and the letters were in white or other colours our present paper surpasses all other materials for ease and convenience of writing the first paper mill in england was erected at dartford by a german in fifteen eighty eight who was knighted by elizabeth but it was not before seventeen thirteen that one thomas watkins a stationer brought the art of paper-making to any perfection and to the industry of this individual we owe the origin of our numerous paper-mills france had hitherto supplied england and holland the manufacture of paper was not much encouraged at home even so late as in sixteen sixty two and the following observations by fuller are curious respecting the paper of his times paper participates in some sort of the characters of the country which makes it the venetian being neat subtle and court-like the french light slight and slender the dutch thick corpulent and gross sucking up the ink with the sponginess thereof he complains that the paper manufactories were not then sufficiently encouraged considering the vast sums of money expended in our land for paper out of italy france and germany which might be lessened were it made in our nation to such who object that we can never equal the perfection of venice paper i return neither can we match the purity of venice glasses and yet many green ones are blown in sussex profitable to the makers and convenient for the users our homespun paper might be found beneficial the present german printing paper is made so disagreeable both to printers and readers from their paper manufacturers making many more reams of paper from one hundred weight of rags than formerly rags are scarce and german writers as well as their language are voluminous mr assel deeply complains of the inferiority of our inks to those of antiquity an inferiority productive of the most serious consequences and which appears to originate merely in negligence 
from the important benefits arising to society from the use of ink and the injuries individuals may suffer from the frauds of designing men he wishes the legislature would frame some new regulations respecting it the composition of ink is simple but we possess none equal in beauty and colour to that used by the ancients the saxon manuscripts written in england exceed in colour anything of the kind the rolls and records from the fifteenth century to the end of the seventeenth compared with those of the fifth to the twelfth centuries show the excellence of the earlier ones which are all in the finest preservation while the others are so much defaced that they are scarcely legible the ink of the ancients had nothing in common with ours but the colour and gum gall nuts copperas and gum make up the composition of our ink whereas soot or ivory black was the chief ingredient in that of the ancients footnote the ink of old manuscripts is generally a thick solid substance and sometimes stands in relief upon the paper the red ink is generally a body colour of great brilliancy End of footnote ink has been made of various colours we find gold and silver ink and red green yellow and blue inks but the black is considered as the best adapted to its purpose end of section nine section ten of curiosities of literature volume two this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2 by Isaac Disraeli. Anecdotes of European Manners The following circumstances probably gave rise to the tyranny of the feudal power and are the facts on which the fictions of romance are raised castles were erected to repulse the vagrant attacks of the normans and in france from the year seven sixty eight to nine eighty seven these places disturbed the public repose the petty despots who raised these castles pillaged whoever passed and carried off the females who pleased them rapine of every kind were the privileges of the feudal lords Mesurey observes that it is from these circumstances romancers have invented their tales of knights errant monsters and giants de saint foy in his historical essays informs us that women and girls were not in greater security when they passed by abbeys the monks sustained an assault rather than relinquish their prey if they saw themselves losing ground they brought to their walls the relics of some saint then it generally happened that the assailants seized with awful veneration retired and dared not pursue their vengeance this is the origin of the enchanters of the enchantments and of the enchanted castles described in romances to these may be added what the author of northern antiquities volume one page two hundred and forty three writes that as the walls of the castles ran winding round them they often called them by a name which signified serpents or dragons and in these were commonly secured the women and young maids of distinction who were seldom safe at a time when so many bold warriors were rambling up and down in search of adventures it was this custom which gave occasion to ancient romancers who knew not how to describe anything simply to invent so many fables concerning princesses of great beauty guarded by dragons a singular and barbarous custom prevailed during this period it consisted in punishments by mutilations it became so general that the abbots instead of bestowing canonical penalties on their monks obliged them to cut off an ear an arm or a leg Vallée, in his history of france has described two festivals which give a just idea of the manners and devotion of a later period twelve thirty which like the ancient mysteries consisted of a mixture of farce and piety religion in fact was their amusement the following one existed even to the reformation in the church of paris and in several other cathedrals of the kingdom was held the feast of fools or madmen 
the priests and clerks assembled elected a pope an archbishop or a bishop conducted them in great pomp to the church which they entered dancing masked and dressed in the apparel of women animals and mary andrews sung infamous songs and converted the altar into a beaufet where they ate and drank during the celebration of the holy mysteries played with dice burned instead of incense the leather of their old sandals ran about and leaped from seat to seat with all the indecent postures with which the merry andrews know how to amuse the populace the other does not yield in extravagance this festival was called the feast of asses and was celebrated at beauvais they chose a young woman the handsomest in the town they made her ride on an ass richly harnessed and placed in her arms a pretty infant footnote this was in fact a realization of the traditional representations of the flight into egypt in which the virgin having the saviour in her lap is always depicted seated on an ass which is led by joseph End of footnote in this state followed by the bishop and clergy she marched in procession from the cathedral to the church of st stephen's entered into the sanctuary placed herself near the altar and the mass began whatever the choir sung was terminated by this charming burthen he han he han their prose half latin and half french explained the fine qualities of the animal every strophe finished by this delightful invitation Hey, Sirana, sa chante, belle bouche, rechigne, vous aurez du foin assez et de l'avoine si planté. They at length exhorted him in making a devout genuflection to forget his ancient food for the purpose of repeating without ceasing, Amen, Amen. The priest, instead of ite missa est, sung three times, he han, he han, he han and the people three times answered he han he han he han to imitate the braying of that grave animal what shall we think of this imbecile mixture of superstition and farce this ass was perhaps typical of the ass which jesus rode the children of israel worshipped a golden ass and balaam made another speak how fortunate then was james naylor who desirous of entering bristol on an ass hume informs us it is indeed but a piece of cold pleasantry that all bristol could not afford him one at the time when all these follies were practised they would not suffer men to play at chess Vali says a statute of eudes de sully prohibits clergymen not only from playing at chess but even from having a chess-board in their house who could believe that while half the ceremonies of religion consisted in the grossest buffoonery a prince preferred death rather than cure himself by a remedy which offended his chastity louis the eighth being dangerously ill the physicians consulted and agreed to place near the monarch while he slept a young and beautiful lady who when he awoke should inform him of the motive which had conducted her to him louis answered no my girl i prefer dying rather than to save my life by a mortal sin and in fact the good king died he would not be prescribed for out of the whole pharmacopoeia of love an account of our taste in female beauty is given by mr ellis who observes in his notes to ways fabliaux in the times of chivalry the minstrels dwelt with great complacency on the fair hair and delicate complexion of their damsels this taste was continued for a long time and to render the hair light was a great object of education even when wig first came into fashion they were all flaxen such was the colour of the gauls and of their german conquerors it required some centuries to reconcile their eyes to the swarthy beauties of their spanish and their italian neighbours footnote in the romances and poems of the middle ages the heroines are generally praised for the abundance and beauty of their yellow hair her yellow hair was braided in a tress behind her back a yard long i guess chaucer's knight's tale 
queen elizabeth had yellow hair hence it became the fashion at her court and ladies dyed their hair of the royal colour but this dyeing the hair yellow may be traced to the classic era galen tells us that in his time women suffered much from headaches contracted by standing bareheaded in the sun to obtain this coveted tint which others attempted by the use of saffron bulwer in his artificial changeling sixteen fifty three says the venetian women at this day and the paduan and those of verona and other parts of italy practise the same vanity and receive the same recompense for their affectation there being in all those cities open and manifest examples of those who have undergone a kind of martyrdom to render their hair yellow End of footnote the following is an amusing anecdote of the difficulty in which an honest vicar of bray found himself in those contentious times when the court of rome under the pontificates of gregory the ninth and innocent the fourth set no bounds to their ambitious projects they were opposed by the emperor frederick who was of course anathematized a curate of paris a humorous fellow got up in his pulpit with the bull of innocent in his hand you know my brethren said he that i am ordered to proclaim an excommunication against frederick i am ignorant of the motive all that i know is that there exists between this prince and the roman pontiff great differences and an irreconcilable hatred god only knows which of the two is wrong therefore with all my power i excommunicate him who injures the other and i absolve him who suffers to the great scandal of all christianity the following anecdotes relate to a period which is sufficiently remote to excite curiosity yet not so distant as to weaken the interest we feel in those minutiae of the times the present one may serve as a curious specimen of the despotism and simplicity of an age not literary in discovering the author of a libel it took place in the reign of henry the eighth a great jealousy subsisted between the londoners and those foreigners who traded here the foreigners probably observes mr lodge in his illustrations of english history worked cheaper and were more industrious there was a libel affixed on st paul's door which reflected on henry the eighth and these foreigners who were accused of buying up the wool with the king's money to the undoing of englishmen this tended to inflame the minds of the people the method adopted to discover the writer of the libel must excite a smile in the present day while it shows the state in which knowledge must have been in this country the plan adopted was this in every ward one of the king's council with an alderman of the same was commanded to see every man write that could and further took every man's book and sealed them and brought them to guildhall to confront them with the original so that if of this number many wrote alike the judges must have been much puzzled to fix on the criminal our hours of reflection are singularly changed in little more than two centuries in the reign of francis i observes the author of recreation historique they were accustomed to say levé à cinq dîner à neuf souper à cinq coucher à neuf fait vitre dans non non et neuf historians observe of louis the twelfth that one of the causes which contributed to hasten his death was the entire change of his regimen the good king by the persuasion of his wife says the history of bayard changed his manner of living when he was accustomed to dine at eight o'clock he agreed to dine at twelve and when he was used to retire at six o'clock in the evening he frequently sat up as late as midnight Husayi gives the following authentic notice drawn from the registers of the court which presents a curious account of domestic life in the fifteenth century of the dauphin louis son of charles the sixth who died at the age of twenty we are told that he knew the latin and french languages that he had many musicians in his chapel passed the night in vigils dined at three in the afternoon supped at midnight went to bed at the break of day and thus was ascertené that is threatened with a short life foissart mentions waiting upon the duke of lancaster at five o'clock in the afternoon when he had supped 
the custom of dining at nine in the morning relaxed greatly under francis i successor of louis the twelfth however persons of quality dined then the latest at ten and supper was at five or six in the evening we may observe this in the preface to the heptameron of the queen of navarre where this princess describing the mode of life which the lords and ladies whom she assembles at the castle of madame roisia should follow to be agreeably occupied and to banish languor thus expresses herself as soon as the morning rose they went to the chamber of madame roisia whom they found already at her prayers and when they had heard during a good hour her lecture and then the mass they went to dine at ten o'clock and afterwards each privately retired to his room but did not fail at noon to meet in the meadow speaking of the end of the first day which was in september the same lady oisilla says say where is the sun and hear the bell of the abbey which has for some time called us to vespers in saying this they all rose and went to the religionists who had waited for them above an hour vespers heard they went to supper and after having played a thousand sports in the meadow they retired to bed all this exactly corresponds with the lines above quoted charles v of france however who lived near two centuries before francis dined at ten supped at seven and all the court was in bed by nine o'clock they sounded the curfew which bell warned them to cover their fire at six in the winter and between eight and nine in the summer under the reign of henry the fourth the hour of dinner at court was eleven or at noon the latest a custom which prevailed even in the early part of the reign of louis the fourteenth in the provinces distant from paris it is very common to dine at nine they make a second repast about two o'clock sup at five and their last meal is made just before they retire to bed the labourers and peasants in france have preserved this custom and make three meals one at nine another at three and the last at the setting of the sun the marquis of mirabeau in la mi des hommes volume one page two hundred and sixty one gives a striking representation of the singular industry of the french citizens of that age he had learnt from several ancient citizens of paris that if in their youth a workman did not work two hours by candlelight either in the morning or evening he even adds in the longest days he would have been noticed as an idler and would not have found persons to employ him on the twelfth of may fifteen eighty eight when henry the third ordered his troops to occupy various posts at paris davilla writes that the inhabitants warned by the noise of the drums began to shut their doors and shops which according to the customs of that town to work before daybreak were already opened this must have been taking it at the latest about four in the morning in seventeen fifty adds the ingenious writer i walked on that day through paris at full six in the morning i passed through the most busy and populous part of the city and i only saw open some stalls of the vendors of brandy to the article anecdotes of fashions see volume one page two hundred and sixteen we may add that in england a taste for splendid dress existed in the reign of henry the seventh as is observable by the following description of nicholas lord vaux in the seventeenth of that reign at the marriage of prince arthur the brave young vaux appeared in a gown of purple velvet adorned with pieces of gold so thick and massive that exclusive of the silken furs it was valued at a thousand pounds about his neck he wore a collar of s s weighing eight hundred pounds in nobles in those days it not only required great bodily strength to support the weight of their cumbersome armour their very luxury of apparel for the drawing-room would oppress a system of modern muscles in the following reign according to the monarchs and wolsey's magnificent taste their dress was perhaps more generally sumptuous we then find the following rich ornaments in vogue shirts and shifts were embroidered with gold and bordered with lace strutt notices also perfumed gloves lined with white velvet and splendidly worked with embroidery and gold buttons 
not only gloves but various other parts of their habits were perfumed shoes were made of spanish perfumed skins carriages were not then used footnote that is carriages of the modern form and such as became common toward the end of elizabeth's reign but wagons and chairs covered with tapestry and used by ladies for journeys may be seen in illuminated manuscripts of the fourteenth century there is a fine example in the luterel psalter published in vetusta monumenta end of footnote so that lords would carry princesses on pillion behind them and in wet weather the ladies covered their heads with hoods of oilcloth a custom that has been generally continued to the middle of the seventeenth century coaches were introduced into england by fitzalan earl of arundel in fifteen eighty and at first were only drawn by a pair of horses the favourite buckingham about sixteen nineteen began to have them drawn by six horses and wilson in his life of james i tells us this was wondered at as a novelty and imputed to him as a mastering pride the same arbiter elegantiarum introduced sedan chairs in france catherine of medicis was the first to use the coach which had leathern doors and curtains instead of glass windows if the carriage of henry the fourth had had glass windows this circumstance might have saved his life carriages were so rare in the reign of this monarch that in a letter to his minister sully he notices that having taken medicine that day though he intended to have called on him he was prevented because the queen had gone out with the carriage even as late as in the reign of louis the fourteenth the courtiers rode on horseback to their dinner parties and wore their light boots and spurs count hamilton describes his boots of white spanish leather with gold spurs st foix observes that in sixteen fifty eight there were only three hundred and ten coaches in paris and in seventeen fifty eight there were more than fourteen thousand strutt has judiciously observed that though luxury and grandeur were so much affected and appearances of state and splendour carried to such lengths we may conclude that their household furniture and domestic necessaries were also carefully attended to on passing through their houses we may expect to be surprised at the neatness elegance and superb appearance of each room and the suitableness of every ornament but herein we may be deceived the taste of elegance amongst our ancestors was very different from the present and however we may find them extravagant in their apparel excessive in their banquets and expensive in their trains of attendance yet follow them home and within their houses you shall find their furniture is plain and homely no great choice but what was useful rather than any for ornament or show erasmus as quoted by jortin confirms this account and makes it worse he gives a curious account of english dirtiness he ascribes the plague from which england was hardly ever free and the sweating sickness partly to the incommodious form and bad exposition of the houses to the filthiness of the streets and to the sluttishness within doors the floors says he are commonly of clay strewed with rushes under which lies unmolested an ancient collection of beer grease fragments bones spittle excrement of dogs and cats and everything that is nasty footnote the use of censers or fire-pans to sweeten houses by burning coarse perfumes is noted by shakespeare his commentator stevens points out a passage in a letter of the earl of shrewsbury who when keeping mary queen of scots under his surveillance notes that her majesty was to be removed for five or six days to cleanse her chamber being kept very uncleanly that annoyances of a very disagreeable kind were constantly felt he instances in a passage from the memoir of anne countess of dorset who relates that a noble party were infested with insects not now to be named though named plainly by the lady and all this by sitting in sir thomas erskine's chamber End of footnote and now certainly we are the cleanest nation in europe and the word comfortable expresses so peculiar an idea that it has been adopted by foreigners to describe a sensation experienced nowhere but in england i shall give a sketch of the domestic life of a nobleman in the reign of charles i from the life of the duke of newcastle written by his duchess 
whom i have already noticed it might have been impertinent at the time of its publication it will now please those who are curious about english manners of his habit he accoutres his person according to the fashion if it be one that is not troublesome and uneasy for men of heroic exercises and actions he is neat and cleanly which makes him to be somewhat long in dressing though not so long as many effeminate persons are he shifts ordinarily once a day and every time when he uses exercise or his temper is more hot than ordinary of his diet in his diet he is so sparing and temperate that he never eats nor drinks beyond his set proportion so as to satisfy only his natural appetite he makes but one meal a day at which he drinks two good glasses of small beer one about the beginning the other at the end thereof and a little glass of sack in the middle of his dinner which glass of sack he also uses in the morning for his breakfast with a morsel of bread his supper consists of an egg and a draught of small beer and by this temperance he finds himself very healthful and may yet live many years he being now of the age of seventy-three his recreation and exercise his prime pastime and recreation hath always been the exercise of menage and weapons which heroic arts he used to practise every day but i observing that when he had overheated himself he would be apt to take cold prevailed so far that at last he left the frequent use of the menage using nevertheless still the exercise of weapons and though he doth not ride himself so frequently as he hath done yet he taketh delight in seeing his horses of menage rid by his escuyers whom he instructs in that art for his own pleasure but in the art of weapons in which he has a method beyond all that ever was famous in it found out by his own ingenuity and practice he never taught anybody but the now duke of buckingham whose guardian he hath been and his own two sons the rest of his time he spends in music poetry architecture and the like the value of money and the increase of our opulence might form says johnson a curious subject of research in the reign of edward the sixth latimer mentions it as a proof of his father's prosperity that though but a yeoman he gave his daughters five pounds each for their portion footnote he gives this piece of autobiography in his first sermon preached before edward the sixth fifteen forty nine my father was a yeoman and had no lands of his own only he had a farm of three or four pound by year at the uttermost and hereupon he tilled so much as kept half a dozen men he had a walk for a hundred sheep and my mother milked thirty kine he kept me to school he married my sisters with five pound or twenty nobles apiece so that he brought them up in godliness End of footnote at the latter end of elizabeth's reign seven hundred pounds were such a temptation to courtship as made all other motives suspected congreve makes twelve thousand pounds more than a counterbalance to the affection of belinda no poet will now fly his favourite character at less than fifty thousand clarissa harlowe had but a moderate fortune in sir john vanbrugh's confederacy a woman of fashion is presented with a bill of millinery as long as herself yet it only amounts to a poor fifty pounds at present this sounds oddly on the stage i have heard of a lady of quality and fashion who had a bill of her fancy dressmaker for the expenditure of one year to the tune of or rather which closed in the deep diapason of six thousand pounds End of section 10。section 11 of curiosities of literature volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org curiosities of literature volume 2 by isaac disraeli the early drama 
it is curious to trace the first rude attempts of the drama in various nations to observe at that moment how crude is the imagination and to trace the caprices it indulges and that the resemblance in these attempts holds in the earliest essays of greece of france of spain of england and what appears extraordinary even of china and mexico the rude beginnings of the drama of greece are sufficiently known and the old mysteries of europe have been exhibited in a former article the progress of the french theatre has been this etienne jodel in fifteen fifty two seems to have been the first who had a tragedy represented of his own invention entitled cleopatra it was a servile imitation of the form of the grecian tragedy but if this did not require the highest genius it did the utmost intrepidity for the people were through long habit intoxicated with the wild amusement they amply received from their farces and moralities the following curious anecdote which followed the first attempt at classical imitation is very observable jodel's success was such that his rival poets touched by the spirit of the grecian muse showed a singular proof of their enthusiasm for this new poet in a classical festivity which gave room for no little scandal in that day yet as it was produced by a carnival it was probably a kind of drunken bout fifty poets during the carnival of fifteen fifty two went to arquille chance says the writer of the life of the old french bard rossard who was one of the present profane party threw across their road a goat which having caught they ornamented the goat with chaplets of flowers and carried it triumphantly to the hall of their festival to appear to sacrifice to bacchus and to present it to jodel for the goat among the ancients was the prize of the tragic bards the victim of bacchus who presided over tragedy carmine qui tragico willem surtawit ab hersum the goat thus adorned and his beard painted was hunted about the long table at which the fifty poets were seated and after having served them for a subject of laughter for some time he was hunted out of the room and not sacrificed to bacchus each of the guests made verses on the occasion in imitation of the bacchanalia of the ancients ronsard composed some dithyrambics to celebrate the festival of the goat of etienne jodel and another entitled our travels to arquil however this bacchanalian freak did not finish as it ought where it had begun among the poets several ecclesiastics sounded the alarm and one chandier accused ronsard with having performed an idolatrous sacrifice and it was easy to accuse the moral habits of fifty poets assembled together who were far doubtless from being irreproachable they repented for some time of their classical sacrifice of a goat to tragedy hardy the french lope de vega wrote eight hundred dramatic pieces from sixteen hundred to sixteen hundred and thirty seven his imagination was the most fertile possible but so wild and unchecked that though its extravagances are very amusing they served as so many instructive lessons to his successors one may form a notion of his violation of the unities by his piece la force du sang in the first act leocadia is carried off and ravished in the second she is sent back with an evident sign of pregnancy in the third she lies in and at the close of this act her son is about ten years old in the fourth the father of the child acknowledges him and in the fifth lamenting his son's unhappy fate he marries leo cadia such are the pieces in the infancy of the drama Routreau was the first who ventured to introduce several persons in the same scene before his time they rarely exceeded two persons if a third appeared he was usually a mute actor who never joined the other two the state of the theatre was even then very rude 
the most lascivious embraces were publicly given and taken and rotru even ventured to introduce a naked page in the scene who in this situation holds a dialogue with one of his heroines in another piece scadasse ou l'hospitalite violet hardy makes two young spartans carry off scadasse's two daughters ravish them on the stage and violating them in the side scenes the spectators heard their cries and their complaints cardinal richelieu made the theatre one of his favourite pursuits and though not successful as a dramatic writer his encouragement of the drama gradually gave birth to genius scudery was the first to introduce the twenty-four hours from aristotle and marais studied the construction of the fable and the rules of the drama they yet groped in the dark and their beauties were yet only occasional corneille racine moliere crebillon and voltaire perfected the french drama in the infancy of the tragic art in our country the bowl and dagger were considered as the great instruments of a sublime pathos and the die all and die nobly of the exquisite and affecting tragedy of fielding were frequently realized in our popular dramas thomas gough of the university of oxford in the reign of james the first was considered as no contemptible tragic poet he concludes the first part of his courageous turk by promising a second thus if this first part gentles do like you well the second part shall greater murthers tell specimens of extravagant bombast might be selected from his tragedies the following speech of amurath the turk who coming on the stage and seeing an appearance of the heavens being on fire comets and blazing stars thus addresses the heavens which seem to have been in as mad a condition as the poet's own mind how now ye heavens grow you so proud that you must needs put on curled locks and clothe yourselves in periwigs of fire in the raging turk or bejazé the second he is introduced with this most raging speech am i not emperor he that breathes a no damns in that negative syllable his soul durst any god gainsay it he should feel the strength of fiercest giants in my armies mine angers at the highest and i could shake the firm foundation of the earthly globe could i but grasp the poles in these two hands i'd pluck the world asunder he would scale heaven and when he had got beyond the utmost sphere besieged the concave of this universe and hunger starved the gods till they confessed what furies did oppress his sleeping soul these plays went through two editions the last printed in sixteen fifty six the following passage from a similar bard is as precious the king in the play exclaims by all the ancient gods of rome and greece i love my daughter better than my niece if any one should ask the reason why i tell them nature makes the stronger tie one of the rude french plays about sixteen hundred is entitled la rebellion ou mes y des grenouilles contre jupiter in five acts the subject of this tragic comic piece is nothing more than the fable of the frogs who asked jupiter for a king in the pantomimical scenes of a wild fancy the actors were seen croaking in their fens or climbing up the steep ascent of olympus they were dressed so as to appear gigantic frogs and in pleading their cause before jupiter and his court the dull humour was to croak sublimely whenever they did not agree with their judge clavigero in his curious history of mexico has given acosta's account of the mexican theatre which appears to resemble the first scenes among the greeks and these french frogs but with more fancy and taste acosta writes the small theatre was curiously whitened adorned with boughs and arches made of flowers and feathers from which were suspended many birds rabbits and other pleasing objects the actors exhibited burlesque characters feigning themselves deaf sick with colds lame blind crippled and addressing an idol for the return of health the deaf people answered at cross purposes those who had colds by coughing and the lame by halting 
all recited their complaints and misfortunes which produced infinite mirth among the audience others appeared under the names of different little animals some disguised as beetles some like toads some like lizards and upon encountering each other reciprocally explained their employments which was highly satisfactory to the people as they performed their parts with infinite ingenuity several little boys also belonging to the temple appeared in the disguise of butterflies and birds of various colours and mounting upon the trees which were fixed there on purpose little balls of earth were thrown at them with slings occasioning many humorous incidents to the spectators something very wild and original appears in this singular exhibition where at times the actors seem to have been spectators and the spectators were actors End of section 11section 12 of curiosities of literature volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org curiosities of literature volume 2 by isaac disraeli the marriage of the arts as a literary curiosity can we deny a niche to that obliquity of distorted wit of barton holliday who has composed a strange comedy in five acts performed at christ church oxford sixteen thirty not for the entertainment as an anecdote records of james the first the title of the comedy of this unclassical classic for holiday is known as the translator of juvenal with a very learned commentary is tex notamia or the marriage of the arts sixteen thirty quarto extremely dull excessively rare and extraordinarily high priced among collectors it may be exhibited as one of the most extravagant inventions of a pedant who but a pedant could have conceived the dull fancy of forming a comedy of five acts on the subject of marrying the arts they are the dramatis personae of this piece and the bachelor of arts describes their intrigues and characters his actors are polites a magistrate physica astronomia daughter to physica ethicus an old man geographus a traveller and courtier in love with astronomia arithmetica in love with geometries logicus grammaticus a schoolmaster poeta historia in love with poeta rhetorica in love with logicus melancholico poeta's man phantastes servant to geographus collar grammaticus's man all these refined and abstract ladies and gentlemen have as bodily feelings and employ as gross language as if they had been everyday characters a specimen of his grotesque dullness may entertain fruits of dull heat and suiterkins of wit geographus opens the play with declaring his passion to astronomia and that very rudely indeed see the pedant wreathing the roses of love geographus come now you shall astronomia astronomia what shall i geographus geographus kiss astronomia what in spite of my teeth geographus no not so i hope you do not use to kiss with your teeth astronomia mary and i hope i do not use to kiss without them geographus ay but my fine wit-catcher i mean you do not show your teeth when you kiss he then kisses her as he says in the different manners of a french spanish and dutch kiss he wants to take off the zone of astronomia she begs he would not fondle her like an elephant as he is and geographus says again won't you then astronomia won't i what geographus be kind astronomia be kind how fortunately geographus is here interrupted by astronomia's mother physica this dialogue is a specimen of the whole piece very flat and very gross yet the piece is still curious not only for its absurdity but for that sort of ingenuity which so whimsically contrived to bring together the different arts this pedantic writer however owes more to the subject than the subject derived from him without wit or humour he has at times an extravagance of invention as for instance geographus and his man phantastes described to poeta the lying wonders they pretend to have witnessed and this is one 
fantastic sir we met with a traveller that could speak six languages at the same instant poeta how at the same instant that's impossible fantastes nay sir the actuality of the performance puts it beyond all contradiction with his tongue he'd so vow you out as smooth italian as any man breathing with his eye he would sparkle forth the proud spanish with his nose blow out most robustious dutch the creaking of his high-heeled shoe would articulate exact polonian the knocking of his shin-bone feminine french and his belly would grumble most pure and scholar-like hungary this though extravagant without fancy is not the worst part of the absurd humour which runs through this pedantic comedy the classical reader may perhaps be amused by the following strange conceits poeta who was in love with historia capriciously falls in love with astronomia and thus compares his mistress her brow is like a brave heroic line that does a sacred majesty enshrine her nose falusiake like in comely sort ends in a troche or a long and short her mouth is like a pretty dimeter her eyebrows like a little longer trimeter her chin is an adonike and her tongue is an hypermeter somewhat too long her eyes i may compare them unto two quick-turning dactyls for their nimble view her ribs like staves of sapphix do descend thither which but to name were to offend her arms like two iambics raised on high do with her brow bear equal majesty her legs like two straight spondees keep a pace slow as two skazans but with stately grace the piece concludes with a speech by polites who settles all the disputes and loves of the arts poeta promises for the future to attach himself to historia rhetorica though she loves logicus yet as they do not mutually agree she is united to grammaticus polites counsels phlegmatico who is logicus's man to leave off smoking and to learn better manners and collar grammaticus's man to bridle himself that ethicus and economa would vouchsafe to give good advice to poeta and historia and physica to her children geographus and astronomia for grammaticus and rhetorica he says their tongues will always agree and will not fall out and for geometries and arithmetica they will be very regular melancholico who is poeta's man is left quite alone and agrees to be married to musica and at length phantastes by the entreaty of poeta becomes a servant of melancholico and musica physiognomus and chiromantes who are in the character of gypsies and fortune-tellers are finally exiled from the island of fortunata where lies the whole scene of the action and the residence of the married arts the pedant comic writer has even attended to the dresses of his characters which are minutely given thus melancholico wears a black suit a black hat a black cloak and black work band black gloves and black shoes sanguis the servant of medicus is in a red suit on the breast is a man with his nose bleeding on the back one letting blood in his arm with a red hat and band red stockings and red pumps it is recorded of this play that the oxford scholars resolving to give james the first a relish of their genius requested leave to act this notable piece honest anthony wood tells us that it being too grave for the king and too scholastic for the auditory or as some have said the actors had taken too much wine his majesty offered several times after two acts to withdraw he was prevailed to sit it out in mere charity to the oxford scholars the following humorous epigram was produced on the occasion at christ church marriage done before the king lest that those mates should want an offering the king himself did offer what i pray he offered twice or thrice to go away End of section twelve. section thirteen of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jason in Panama. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2, by Isaac Disraeli. A Contrivance in Dramatic Dialogue. Crown, in his City Politiques, 1688, 
a comedy written to satirize the Whigs of those days, was accused of having copied his character too closely after life, and his enemies turned his comedy into a libel. He has defended himself in his preface from this imputation. It was particularly laid to his charge that in the characters of Bartoline, an old corrupt lawyer, and his wife Lucinda, a wanton country girl, he intended to ridicule a certain Sergeant M and his young wife. It was even said that the comedian mimicked the odd speech of the aforesaid sergeant, who, having lost all his teeth, uttered his words in a very peculiar manner. On this, Crown tells us in his defense that uh, the comedian must not be blamed for this peculiarity, as it was an invention of the author himself who had taught it to the player. He seems to have considered it as no ordinary invention, and was so pleased with it that he has most painfully printed the speeches of the lawyer in this singular gibberish, and his reasons, as well as his discovery, appear remarkable. He says that, not any one old man more than another is mimicked by Mr. Lee's way of speaking, which all comedians can witness, was my own invention, and Mr. Lee was taught it by me. To prove this farther, I have printed Bartoline's part in that manner of spelling by which I taught it Mr. Lee. They who have no teeth cannot pronounce many letters plain, but perpetually lisp and break their words, and some words they cannot bring out at all. As, for instance, v is pronounced by thrusting the tongue hard to the teeth, therefore that sound they cannot make, but something like it. For that reason you will often find in Bartoline's part, instead of v, ya as yat for that, yish for this, yoj for those, and sometimes a t is left out, as housand for thousand, hurdy for thirty. S they pronounce like sh, as sure for sir, musht for must, t they speak like ch. Therefore you will find true for true, treason for treason, cho for two, chu for two, chen for ten, chake for take, and this ch is not to be pronounced as k, as tis in Christian, but as in child, church, chest. I desire the reader to observe these things, because otherwise he will hardly understand much of the lawyer's part, which in the opinion of all is the most divertising in the comedy, but when this ridiculous way of speaking is familiar with him, it will render the part more pleasant. One hardly expects so curious a piece of orthopy in the preface to a comedy. It may have required great observation and ingenuity to have discovered the cause of old toothless men mumbling their words, but as a piece of comic humor, on which the author appears to have prided himself, the effect is far from fortunate. Humor arising from a personal defect is but a miserable substitute for that of a more genuine kind. I shall give a specimen of this strange gibberish as it is so laboriously printed. It may amuse the reader to see his mother's language transformed into so odd a shape that it is with difficulty he can recognize it. Old Bartoline thus speaks. I wronged my shelf. Cho enter in chubange of marriage and could not perform covenant. I might well shank. You would take the forfeiture of the bond, and I never found equity in a bench in my life but I'll trounce you both. I have paved jails with the bones of honester people, yin you are, yet never did nor any man me wrong, but had law of year sige and right o year sige, but because ye had not me on year sige. I have thrown them in jails, and got your estates for my clients, yet had no more title to them than dogs. End of section 13. Section 14 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2, by Isaac Disraeli. The Comedy of a Madman. Desmarais, the friend of Richelieu, was a very extraordinary character and produced many effusions of genius in early life till he became a mystical fanatic it was said of him that he was the greatest madman among poets and the best poet among madmen his comedy of the visionaries is one of the most extraordinary dramatic projects and in respect to its genius and its lunacy may be considered as a literary curiosity in this singular comedy all bedlam seems to be let loose on the stage and every character has a high claim to an apartment in it it is indeed suspected that the cardinal had a hand in this anomalous drama and in spite of its extravagance it was favourably received by the public who certainly had never seen anything like it every character in this piece acts under some hallucination of the mind or a fit of madness artabaz is a cowardly hero who believes he has conquered the world amidor is a wild poet who imagines he ranks above homer philidon is a lover who becomes inflammable as gunpowder for every mistress he reads of in romances phalant is a beggarly bankrupt who thinks himself as rich as croesus melis in reading the history of alexander has become madly in love with this hero and will have no other husband than him of macedon esprit imagines her fatal charms occasion a hundred disappointments in the world but prides herself on her perfect insensibility sestian who knows no other happiness than comedies and whatever she sees or hears immediately plans a scene for dramatic effect renounces any other occupation and finally alcidon the father of these three mad girls as imbecile as his daughters are wild so much for the amiable characters the plot is in perfect harmony with the genius of the author and the characters he has invented perfectly unconnected and fancifully wild alcidon resolves to marry his three daughters who however have no such project of their own he offers them to the first who comes he accepts for his son-in-law the first who offers and is clearly convinced that he is within a very short period of accomplishing his wishes as the four ridiculous personages whom we have noticed frequently haunt his house he becomes embarrassed in finding one lover too many having only three daughters the catastrophe relieves the old gentleman from his embarrassments melis faithful to her macedonian hero declares her resolution of dying before she marries any meaner personage esperi refuses to marry out of pity for mankind for to make one man happy she thinks she must plunge a hundred into despair sestian only passionate for comedy cannot consent to any marriage and tells her father in very lively verses je ne veux point mon père épouser un censeur puisque vous me souffrez recevoir la douceur des plaisirs innocents que le théâtre apporte prendrai-je le hasard de vivre d'autres sortes puis on a des enfants qui vous sont sur les bras les mener en théâtre ô oh dieu quel embarras tantôt couche ou grossesse ou quelque maladie pour jamais vous font dire adieu la comédie imitated no no my father i will have no critic miscalled a husband since you still permit the innocent sweet pleasures of the stage and shall i venture to exchange my lot then we have children folded in our arms to bring them to the playhouse heavens what troubles then we lie in are big or sick or vexed these make us bid farewell to comedy at length these imagined sons-in-law appear philidon declares that in these three girls he cannot find the mistress he adores Amidor confesses he only asked for one of his daughters out of pure gallantry, and that he is only a lover, in verse. When Falon is questioned after the great fortunes he hinted at, the father discovers that he has not a stiver, and out of credit to borrow, while Artabas declares that he only allowed Alcidon, out of mere benevolence, to flatter himself for a moment with the hope of an honour that even Jupiter would not dare to pretend to. The four lovers disperse, and leave the old gentleman more embarrassed than ever and his daughters perfectly enchanted to enjoy their whimsical reveries and die old maids all alike visionaries end of section 14
Section fifteen of Curiosities of Literature, Volume Two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume Two by Isaac Disraeli. Solitude. We possess among our own native treasures two treatises on this subject composed with no ordinary talent, and not their least value consists in one being an apology for solitude, while the other combats that prevailing passion of the studious. Zimmerman's popular work is overloaded with commonplace, the garrulity of eloquence. The two treatises now noticed may be compared to the highly finished gems, whose figure may be more finely designed and whose strokes may be more delicate in the smaller space they occupy than the ponderous block of marble hewed out by the german chiseller sir george mackenzie a polite writer and a most eloquent pleader published in sixteen sixty five a moral essay preferring solitude to public employment the eloquence of his style was well suited to the dignity of his subject the advocates for solitude have always prevailed over those for active life because there is something sublime in those feelings which would retire from the circle of indolent triflers or depraved geniuses the tract of mackenzie was ingeniously answered by the elegant taste of john evelyn in sixteen sixty seven mackenzie though he wrote in favor of solitude passed a very active life first as a pleader and afterwards as a judge that he was an eloquent writer and an eloquent critic we have the authority of dryden who says that till he was acquainted with that noble wit of scotland sir george mackenzie he had not known the beautiful turn of words and thoughts in poetry which sir george had explained and exemplified to him in conversation as a judge and king's advocate will not the barbarous customs of the age defend his name he is most hideously painted forth by the dark pencil of a poetical spagnoletti graham in his poem on the birds of scotland sir george lived in the age of rebellion and used torture we must entirely put aside his political to attend to his literary character blair has quoted his pleadings as a model of eloquence and graham is unjust to the fame of mackenzie when he alludes to his half-forgotten name in sixteen eighty nine he retired to oxford to indulge the luxuries of study in the bodleian library and to practise that solitude which so delighted him in theory but three years afterwards he fixed himself in london evelyn who wrote in favour of public employment being preferable to solitude passed his days in the tranquillity of his studies and wrote against the habits which he himself most loved by this it may appear that that of which we have the least experience ourselves will ever be what appears most delightful alas everything in life seems to have in it the nature of a bubble of air and when touched we find nothing but emptiness in our hand it is certain that the most eloquent writers in favour of solitude have left behind them too many memorials of their unhappy feelings when they indulge this passion to excess and some ancient has justly said that none but a god or a savage can suffer this exile from human nature the following extracts from sir george mackenzie's tract on solitude are eloquent and impressive and merit to be rescued from that oblivion which surrounds many writers whose genius has not been effaced but concealed by the transient crowd of their posterity i have admired to see persons of virtue and humour long much to be in the city where when they come they found nor sought for no other divertissement than to visit one another and there to do nothing else than to make legs view others habit talk of the weather or some such pitiful subject and it may be if they made a farther inroad upon any other affair they did so pick one another that it afforded them matter of eternal quarrel for what was at first but an indifferent subject is by interest adopted into the number of our quarrels what pleasure can be received by talking of new fashions buying and selling of lands advancement or ruin of favourites victories or defeats of strange princes which is the ordinary subject of ordinary conversation 
most desire to frequent their superiors and these men must either suffer their raillery or must not be suffered to continue in their society if we converse with them who speak with more address than ourselves then we repine equally at our own dullness and envy the acuteness that accomplishes the speaker or if we converse with duller animals than ourselves then we are weary to draw the yoke alone and fret at our being in ill company but if chance blows us in amongst our equals then we are so at guard to catch all advantages and so interested in point d'honneur that it rather cruciates than recreates us how many make themselves cheap by these occasions whom we had valued highly if they had frequented us less and how many frequent persons who laugh at that simplicity which the addresser admires in himself as wit and yet both recreate themselves with double laughters in solitude he addresses his friend my dear Salador, enter into your own breast and there survey the several operations of your own soul the progress of your passions the strugglings of your appetite the wanderings of your fancy and ye will find i assure you more variety in that one piece than there is to be learned in all the courts of christendom represent to yourself the last age all the actions and interests in it how much this person was infatuated with zeal that person with lust how much one pursued honour and another riches and in the next thought draw that scene and represent them all turned to dust and ashes i cannot close this subject without the addition of some anecdotes which may be useful a man of letters finds solitude necessary and for him solitude has its pleasures and its conveniences but we shall find that it also has a hundred things to be dreaded solitude is indispensable for literary pursuits no considerable work has yet been composed but its author like an ancient magician retired first to the grove or the closet to invocate his spirits every production of genius must be the production of enthusiasm when the youth sighs and languishes and feels himself among crowds in an irksome solitude that is the moment to fly into seclusion and meditation where can he indulge but in solitude the fine romances of his soul where but in solitude can he occupy himself in useful dreams by night and when the morning rises fly without interruption to his unfinished labours retirement to the frivolous is a vast desert to the man of genius it is the enchanted garden of armida cicero was uneasy amidst applauding rome and he has designated his numerous works by the titles of his various villas where they were composed voltaire had talents and a taste for society yet he not only withdrew by intervals but at one period of his life passed five years in the most secret seclusion and fervent studies montesquieu quitted the brilliant circles of paris for his books his meditations and for his immortal work and was ridiculed by the gay triflers he relinquished harrington to compose his oceana severed himself from the society of his friends and was so wrapped in abstraction that he was pitied as a lunatic descartes inflamed by genius abruptly breaks off all his friendly connections hires an obscure house in an unfrequented corner at paris and applies himself to study during two years unknown to his acquaintance adam smith after the publication of his first work throws himself into a retirement that lasted ten years even hume rallied him for separating himself from the world but the great political inquirer satisfied the world and his friends by his great work on the wealth of nations but this solitude at first a necessity and then a pleasure at length is not born without repining i will call for a witness a great genius and he shall speak himself gibbon says i feel and shall continue to feel that domestic solitude however it may be alleviated by the world by study and even by friendship is a comfortless state which will grow more painful as i descend in the vale of years and afterwards he writes to a friend your visit has only served to remind me that man however amused and occupied in his closet was not made to live alone 
i must therefore now sketch a different picture of literary solitude than some sanguine and youthful minds conceive even the sublimest of men milton who is not apt to vent complaints appears to have felt this irksome period of life in the preface to smectimnuus he says it is but justice not to defraud of due esteem the wearisome labours and studious watchings wherein i have spent and tired out almost a whole youth solitude in a later period of life or rather the neglect which awaits the solitary man is felt with acuter sensibility cowley that enthusiast for rural seclusion in his retirement calls himself the melancholy cowley mason has truly transferred the same epithet to gray read in his letters the history of solitude we lament the loss of cowley's correspondence through the mistaken notion of spratt he assuredly had painted the sorrows of his heart but shenstone has filled his pages with the cries of an amiable being whose soul bleeds in the dead oblivion of solitude listen to his melancholy expressions now i am come from a visit every little uneasiness is sufficient to introduce my whole train of melancholy considerations and to make me utterly dissatisfied with the life i now lead and the life i foresee i shall lead i am angry and envious and dejected and frantic and disregard all present things as becomes a madman to do i am infinitely pleased though it is a gloomy joy with the application of dr swift's complaint that he is forced to die in a rage like a poisoned rat in a hole let the lover of solitude muse on its picture throughout the year in the following stanza by the same poet tedious again to curse the drizzling day again to trace the wintry tracks of snow or soothed by vernal airs again survey the self-same hawthorn's bud and cowslips blow swift's letters paint in terrifying colours a picture of solitude and at length his despair closed with idiotism the amiable Gresset could not sport with the brilliant wings of his butterfly muse without dropping some querulous expression on the solitude of genius in his epistle to his muse he exquisitely paints the situation of men of genius je les vois victimes du génie au foible prix d'un éclat passager vivre insolé sans jouir de la vie and afterwards he adds vingt ans d'ennui pour quelques jours de gloire i conclude with one more anecdote on solitude which may amuse when menage attacked by some and abandoned by others was seized by a fit of the spleen he retreated into the country and gave up his famous mercurialis those wednesdays when the literati assembled at his house to praise up or cry down one another as is usual with the literary populace menage expected to find that tranquillity in the country which he had frequently described in his verses but as he was only a poetical plagiarist it is not strange that our pastoral writer was greatly disappointed some country rogues having killed his pigeons they gave him more vexation than his critics he hastened his return to paris it is better he observed since we are born to suffer to feel only reasonable sorrows End of section fifteen section sixteen of curiosities of literature volume two this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2, by Isaac Disraeli. Literary Friendships The memorable friendship of Beaumont and Fletcher so closely united their labors that we cannot discover the productions of either and biographers cannot without difficulty compose the memoirs of the one without running into the life of the other they portrayed the same characters while they mingled sentiment with sentiment and their days were as closely interwoven as their verses metastasio and farinelli were born about the same time and early acquainted they called one another gemello or the twin both the delight of europe both lived to an advanced age and died nearly at the same time their fortune bore too a resemblance for they were both pensioned but lived and died separated in the distant courts of vienna and madrid montaigne and charon were rivals but always friends 
such was montaigne's affection for charon that he permitted him by his will to bear the full arms of his family and charon evinced his gratitude to the manes of his departed friend by leaving his fortune to the sister of montaigne who had married forty years of friendship uninterrupted by rivalry or envy crowned the lives of pogius and leonard Areton, two of the illustrious revivers of letters a singular custom formerly prevailed among our own writers which was an affectionate tribute to our literary veterans by young writers the former adopted the latter by the title of sons ben jonson had twelve of these poetical sons walton the angler adopted cotton the translator of montaigne among the most fascinating effusions of genius are those little pieces which it consecrates to the cause of friendship in that poem of cowley composed on the death of his friend harvey the following stanza presents a pleasing picture of the employments of two young students say for you saw us ye immortal lights how oft unwearied have we spent the nights till the laden stars so famed for love wondered at us from above we spent them not in toys in lust or wine but search of deep philosophy wit eloquence and poetry arts which i loved for they my friend were thine Milton has not only given the exquisite Lycidas to the memory of a young friend, but in his Epitaphium Demonis, to that of Deodatus, has poured forth some interesting sentiments. It has been versified by Langhorne. Now, says the poet, to whom shall I my hopes and fears impart, or trust the cares and follies of my heart? The elegy of Tickle, maliciously called by Steele prose in rhyme, is alike inspired by affection and fancy. It has a melodious languor and a melancholy grace. The sonnet of Gray to the memory of West is a beautiful effusion and a model for English sonnets. Helvetius was the protector of men of genius whom he assisted not only with his criticism but his fortune. At his death, Sorin read in the French Academy an epistle to the manes of his friend. Sorin, wrestling with obscurity and poverty, had been drawn into literary existence by the supporting hand of Helvetius. Our poet thus addresses him in the warm tones of gratitude. C'est toi qui me cherchant au sein de l'infortune releva mon sort abattu, et su me rendre chère une vie importune. Qu'importe ces pleurs, aux douleurs impuissantes, aux regrets superflus, je vis, hélas, je vis, et mon ami n'est plus. Imitated. In misery's haunts, thy friend, thy bounty sees and give an urgent life some days of ease. Ah, ye vain griefs, superfluous tears, I chide. I live, alas, I live, and thou hast died. The literary friendship of a father with his son is one of the rarest alliances in the Republic of Letters. It was gratifying to the feelings of young Gibbon, in the fervor of literary ambition, to dedicate his first fruits to his father. The too lively son of Crébillon, though his was a very different genius to the grandeur of his father's, yet dedicated his works to him, and for a moment put aside his wit and raillery for the pathetic expressions of filial veneration. We have had a remarkable instance in the two Richardsons, and the father, in his original manner, has in the most glowing language expressed his affectionate sentiments. He says, My time of learning was employed in business, but after all I have the Greek and Latin tongues, because a part of me possesses them to whom I can recur at pleasure, just as I have a hand, when I would write or paint, feet to walk and eyes to see. My son is of my learning, as I am that to him which he has not. We make one man, and such a compound man may probably produce what no single man can. And further, I always think it my peculiar happiness to be, as it were, enlarged, expanded, made another man by the acquisition of my son, and he thinks in the same manner concerning my union with him. This is as curious as it is uncommon, however the cynic may call it egotism. Some, for their friend, have died penetrated with inconsolable grief. Some have sacrificed their character to preserve his own. Some have shared their limited fortune, and some have remained attached to their friend in the cold season of adversity. Jurieu denounced Bale as an impious writer, and drew his conclusions from the Avis aux réfugiés. This work is written against the Calvinists, and therefore becomes impious in Holland. Bale might have exculpated himself with facility by declaring the work was composed by La Roque, but he preferred to be persecuted rather than to ruin his friend. He therefore was silent and was condemned. 
when the minister fouquet was abandoned by all it was the men of letters he had patronized who never forsook his prison and many have dedicated their works to great men in their adversity whom they scorned to notice at the time when they were noticed by all the learned goguet bequeathed his manuscripts and library to his friend fugere with whom he had united his affections and his studies his work on the origin of the arts and sciences had been much indebted to his aid fugere who knew his friend to be past recovery preserved a mute despair during the slow and painful disease and on the death of goguet the victim of sensibility perished amidst the manuscripts which his friend had in vain bequeathed to prepare for publication the abbe de saint pierre gave an interesting proof of literary friendship when he was at college he formed a union with varignon the geometrician they were of congenial dispositions when he went to Paris, he invited Varignon to accompany him, but Varignon had nothing, and the abbé was far from rich. A certain income was necessary for the tranquil pursuits of geometry. Our abbé had an income of eighteen hundred livres. From this, he deducted three hundred, which he gave to the geometrician, accompanied by a delicacy which few but a man of genius could conceive. I do not give it to you, he said, as a salary, but an annuity, that you may be independent and quit me when you dislike me. Something nearly similar embellishes our own literary history. When Akenside was in great danger of experiencing famine as well as fame, Mr. Dyson allowed him three hundred pounds a year. Of this gentleman, perhaps, nothing is known, yet whatever his life may be, it merits the tribute of the biographer. To close with these honorable testimonies of literary friendship, we must not omit that of Churchill and Lloyd. It is known that when Lloyd heard of the death of our poet, he acted the part which Fugere did to Goguet. The page is crowded, but my facts are by no means exhausted. The most illustrious of the ancients prefixed the name of some friend to the head of their works. We too often place that of some patron. They honorably inserted it in their works. When a man of genius, however, shows that he is not less mindful of his social affection than his fame, he is the more loved by his reader. Plato communicated a ray of his glory to his brothers, for in his Republic he ascribed some parts to Adamanthus and Glaucon and Antiphon, the youngest, is made to deliver his sentiments in the Parmenides. To perpetuate the fondness of friendship, several authors have entitled their works by the name of some cherished associate. Cicero, to his treatise on orators, gave the title of Brutus, to that of friendship, Lelius, and to that of old age, Cato. They have been imitated by the moderns. The poetical Tasso, to his dialogue on friendship, gave the name of Manso, who was afterwards his affectionate biographer. Sepulveda entitles his treatise on glory by the name of his friend Gonsalves. Lociel, to his dialogues on the lawyers of Paris, prefixes the name of the learned Pasquier. Thus, Plato distinguishes his dialogues by the names of certain persons. The one on lying is entitled Hippias, on rhetoric Gorgias, and on beauty Phaedrus. Luther has perhaps carried this feeling to an extravagant point. He was so delighted by his favorite commentary on the Epistle to the Galatians that he distinguished it by a title of doting fondness. He named it after his wife and called it his Catherine. End of section 16section 17 of Curiosities of Literature, volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2, by Isaac Disraeli. Anecdotes of Abstraction of Mind Some have exercised this power of abstraction to a degree that appears marvellous to volatile spirits and puny thinkers. To this patient habit, Newton is indebted for many of his great discoveries, an apple falls upon him in his orchard, and the system of attraction succeeds in his mind. He observes boys blowing soap bubbles, and the properties of light display themselves. Of Socrates it is said that he would frequently remain an entire day and night in the same attitude, absorbed in meditation, and why should we doubt this when we know that La Fontaine and Thomson, Descartes and Newton experienced the same abstraction? Mercato, the celebrated geographer, found such delight in the ceaseless progression of his studies that he would never willingly quit his maps to take the necessary refreshments of life. In Cicero's treatise on old age, Cato applauds Gallus, 
who, when he sat down to write in the morning, was surprised by the evening, and when he took up his pen in the evening, was surprised by the appearance of the morning. Buffon once described these delicious moments with his accustomed eloquence. Invention depends on patience. Contemplate your subject long. It will gradually unfold, till a sort of electric spark convulses for a moment the brain, and spreads down to the very heart a glow of irritation. Then come the luxuries of genius, the true hours for production and composition, hours so delightful that I have spent twelve and fourteen successively at my writing desk, and still been in a state of pleasure. The anecdote related of Marini, the Italian poet, may be true. Once absorbed in revising his Adonis, he suffered his leg to be burned for some time without any sensation. Abstraction of this sublime kind is the first step to that noble enthusiasm which accompanies genius. It produces those raptures and that intense delight which some curious facts will explain to us. Podgers relates of Dante that he indulged his meditations more strongly than any man he knew. Whenever he read, he was only alive to what was passing in his mind. To all human concerns, he was as if they had not been. Dante went one day to a great public procession. He entered the shop of a bookseller to be a spectator of the passing show. He found a book which greatly interested him. He devoured it in silence and plunged into an abyss of thought. On his return, he declared that he had neither seen nor heard the slightest occurrence of the public exhibition which had passed before him. This enthusiasm renders everything surrounding us as distant as if an immense interval separated us from the scene. A modern astronomer, one summer night, withdrew to his chamber. The brightness of the heaven showed the phenomenon. He passed the whole night in observing it, and when they came to him early in the morning and found him in the same attitude, he said, like one who had been recollecting his thoughts for a few moments, It must be thus, but I'll go to bed before it is late. He had gazed the entire night in meditation and did not know it. This intense abstraction operates visibly. This perturbation of the faculties, as might be supposed, affects persons of genius physically. What a forcible description the late Madame Roland, who certainly was a woman of the first genius, gives of herself on her first reading of Telemachus and Tasso. My respiration rose. I felt a rapid fire colouring my face, and my voice changing had betrayed my agitation. I was Eucharist for Telemachus, and Erminia for Tancred. However, during this perfect transformation, I did not yet think that I myself was anything for anyone. The whole had no connection with myself. I sought for nothing around me. I was them. I saw only the objects which existed for them. It was a dream without being awakened. Metastasio describes a similar situation. When I apply with a little attention, the nerves of my sensorium are put into a violent tumult. I grow as red in the face as a drunkard, and am obliged to quit my work. When Malbranche first took up Descartes on man, the German origin of his philosophy, he was obliged frequently to interrupt his reading by a violent palpitation of the heart. When the first idea of the essay on the arts and sciences rushed on the mind of Rousseau, it occasioned such a feverish agitation that it approached to a delirium. This delicious inebriation of the imagination occasioned the ancients, who sometimes perceived the effects, to believe it was not short of divine inspiration. Fielding says, I do not doubt but that the most pathetic and affecting scenes have been writ with tears. He perhaps would have been pleased to have confirmed his observation by the following circumstances. The tremors of Dryden, after having written an ode, a circumstance tradition has accidentally handed down, were not unusual with him. In the preface to his tales, he tells us that in translating Homer, he found greater pleasure than in Virgil, but it was not a pleasure without pain. The continual agitation of the spirits must needs be a weakener to any constitution, especially in age, and many pauses are required for refreshment betwixt the heats. In writing the ninth scene of the second act of the Olympiad, Metastasio found himself in tears, an effect which afterwards, says Dr. Burney, proved very contagious. It was on this occasion that that tender poet commemorated the circumstance in the following interesting sonnet. Sonnet from Metastasio Scrivendo l'autore in Vienna, l'anno 1733, la sua Olimpiade, si senti commosa fino alle lacrime, 
nell'esprimere la divisione di due teneri amici e meravigliandosi che un falso e da lui inventato disastro potesse cagionargli una sì vera passione si fece a riflettere quanto poco ragione volè e solido fondamento possano aver le altre che solion frequentemente agitaci nel corso di nostra vita sogni e favole io fingo eppure in carte mentre favole e sogni orno e disegno in lor folle ch'io son prendo tal parte che del mal che inventai piango e mi sdegno ma forse allor che non m'inganna l'arte più saggio io sono e l'agitato ingegno forse allo più tranquillo o forse parte da più salda cagion l'amor lo sdegno a che non sol quelle ch'io canto o scrivo favole son ma quanto temo o spero tutte manzogna e delirando io vivo sogno della mia vita e il corso intero de tu signor quando ad estar mi arrivo fa ch'io trovi riposo in sen del vero in seventeen thirty three the author composing his olympiad felt himself suddenly moved even to tears in expressing the separation of two tender lovers surprised that a fictitious grief invented too by himself could raise so true a passion he reflected how little reasonable and solid a foundation the others had which so frequently agitated us in this state of our existence sonnet imitated fables and dreams i feign yet though but verse the dreams and fables that adorn this scroll fond fool i rave and grieve as i rehearse while genuine tears for fancied sorrows roll perhaps the dear delusion of my heart is wisdom and the agitated mind as still responding to each plaintive part with love and rage a tranquil hour can find ah not alone the tender rhymes i give are fictions but my fears and hopes i deem are fables all deliriously i live and life's whole course is one protracted dream eternal power when shall i wake to rest this wearied brain on truth's immortal breast End of section 17section 18 of curiosities of literature volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by greg giordano curiosities of literature Volume two by Isaac Desraeli Richardson The censure which the Shakespeare of novelists has incurred for the tedious procrastination in the minute details of his fable, his slow unfolding characters, and the slightest gestures of his personages, is extremely unjust, for it is not evident that we could not have his peculiar excellences without these accompanying defects when characters are fully delineated the narrative must be suspended whenever the narrative is rapid which so much delights superficial readers the characters cannot be very minutely featured and the writer who aims to instruct as richardson avowedly did by the glow and eloquence of his feelings must often sacrifice to this his local descriptions Richardson himself has given us the principle that guided him in composing. He tells us, quote, If I give speeches and conversations, I ought to give them justly, for the humors and characters of persons cannot be known unless I repeat what they say and their manner of saying. End quote. Foreign critics have been more just to Richardson than many of his own countrymen. I shall notice the opinions of three celebrated writers, D'Alembert, Rousseau, and Diderot. D'Alembert was a great mathematician. His literary taste was extremely cold. He was not worthy of reading Richardson. The volumes, if he ever read them, must have fallen from his hands. The delicate and subtle turnings, 
those folds of the human heart which require so nice a touch was a problem which the mathematician could never solve there is no other de there is no other demonstration in the human heart but an appeal to its feelings and what are the calculating feelings of an arithmetician of lines and curves he therefore declared of richardson that quote, le nature en bon en imite ma non pas jusqu'à l'on ami but thus it was not with the other two congenial geniuses the fervent opinion of rousseau must be familiar to the reader but diderot in his eloge on richardson exceeds even rousseau in the enthusiasm of his feelings i extract some of the most interesting passages of clarissa he says quote, i yet remember with delight the first time it came into my hands i was in the country how deliciously was i affected at every moment i saw my happiness abridged by a page and then experienced the same sensations those feel who have long lived with one they love and are on the point of separation at the close of the work i seem to remain deserted End quote. the impassioned diderot then breaks forth quote, o richardson thou singular genius in my eyes thou shalt form my reading in all times if forced by sharp necessity my friend falls into indigence if the mediocrity of my fortune is not sufficient to bestow upon my children the necessary cares for their education i will sell my books but thou shalt remain yes thou shalt rest in the same class with moses homer euripides and sophocles to be read alternately o richardson i dare pronounce that the most veritable history is full of fictions and thy romances are full of truths history paints some individuals thou paintest the human species history attributes to some individuals what they have neither said nor done all that thou attributest to man he has said and done history embraces but a portion of duration a point on the surface of the globe thou hast embraced all places and all times the human heart which has ever been and ever shall be the same is the model which thou copiest if we were severely to criticize the best historian would he maintain his ground as thou in this point of view i venture to say that frequently history is a miserable romance and romance as thou hast composed it is a good history painter of nature thou never liest i have never yet met with a person who shared my enthusiasm that i was not tempted to embrace and to press him in my arms richardson is no more his loss touches me as if my brother was no more i bore him in my heart without having seen him and knowing him but by his works he has not had all the reputation he merited richardson if living thy merit has been disputed how great wilt thou appear to our children's children when we shall view thee at the distance we now view homer then who will dare to steal a line from thy sublime works thou hast had more admirers amongst us than in thine own country and at this i rejoice End quote. it is probable that to a frenchman the style of richardson is not so objectionable when translated as to ourselves i think myself that it is very idiomatic and energetic others have thought differently the misfortune of richardson was that he was unskilful in the art of writing and that he could never lay the pen down while his ink-horn supplied it he was delighted by his own works no author enjoyed so much the bliss of excessive fondness i heard from the late charlotte lennox the anecdote which so severely reprimanded his innocent vanity which boswell has recorded the lady was a regular visitor at richardson's house and she could scarcely recollect one visit which was not taxed by our author reading one of his voluminous letters or two or three if his auditor was quiet and friendly 
the extreme delight which he felt on a review of his own works the works themselves witness each is an evidence of what some will deem a violent literary vanity to pamela is prefixed a letter from the editor whom we know to be the author consisting of one of the most minutely labored panegyrics of the work itself that ever the blindest idolater of some ancient classic paid to the object of his frenetic imagination in several places there he contrives to repeat the striking parts of the narrative which display the fertility of his imagination to great advantage to the author's own edition of his clarissa is appended an alphabetical arrangement of the sentiments dispersed throughout the work and such was the fondness that dictated this voluminous arrangement such trivial aphorisms as quote, habits are not easily changed men are known by their companions etc End quote. seem alike to be the object of their author's admiration this collection of sentiments said indeed to have been sent to him anonymously is curious and useful and shows the value of the work by the extensive grasp of that mind which could think so justly on such numerous topics and in his third and final labor to each volume of sir charles grandison is not only prefixed a complete index with as much exactness as if it were a history of england but there is also appended a list of the similes and allusions in the volume some of which do not exceed three or four in nearly as many hundred pages literary history does not record a more singular example of that self-delight which an author has left on a revision of his works it was this intense pleasure which produced his voluminous labors it must be confessed there are readers deficient in that sort of genius which makes the mind of richardson so fertile and prodigal end of section eighteen recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida Section 19 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2 by Isaac Disraeli. Influence of a Name. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet names by an involuntary suggestion produce an extraordinary illusion favor or disappointment has been often conceded as the name of the claimant has affected us and the accidental affinity or coincidence of a name connected with ridicule or hatred with pleasure or disgust has operated like magic but the facts connected with this subject will show how this prejudice has branched out footnote lowers english surnames an essay on family nomenclature may be profitably studied in connection with this curious subject End of footnote. stern has touched on this unreasonable propensity of judging by names in his humorous account of the elder mr shandy's system of christian names and wilkes has expressed in boswell's life of johnson all the influence of baptismal names even in matters of poetry he said the last city poet was elkanah settle there is something in names which one cannot help feeling now elkanah settle sounds so queer who can expect much from that name we should have no hesitation to give it for john dryden in preference to elkanah settle from the names only without knowing their different merits a lively critic noticing some american poets says there is or was a mr dwight who wrote a poem in the shape of an epic and his baptismal name was timothy and involuntarily we infer the sort of epic that a timothy must write stern humorously exhorts all godfathers not to nicodemus a man into nothing 
there is more truth in this observation than some may be inclined to allow and that it affects mankind strongly all ages and all climates may be called on to testify even in the barbarous age of louis eleven they felt a delicacy respecting names which produced an ordinance from his majesty the king's barber was named olivier le diable at first the king allowed him to get rid of the offensive part by changing it to le malin but the improvement was not happy and for a third time he was called le mauvais even this did not answer his purpose and as he was a great racer he finally had his majesty ordinance to be called le dain under penalty of law if any one should call him le diable le malin or le mauvais according to platina sergius the second was the first pope who changed his name in ascending the papal throne because his proper name was hog's mouth very unsuitable with the pomp of the tiara the ancients felt the same fastidiousness and among the romans those who were called to the equestrian order having low and vulgar names were new named on the occasion lest the former one should disgrace the dignity footnote fortunate names the bona nomina of cicero were chiefly selected in accordance with the classic maxim bonum nomen bonum omen End of footnote when berlier a french wit was chosen for the preceptor of colbert's son he felt his name was so uncongenial to his new profession that he assumed the more splendid one of docour by which he is now known madame gomez had married a person named bonhomme but she would never exchange her nobler spanish name to prefix her married one to her romances which indicated too much of meek humility Gouet, a beggar is a french writer of great pomp of style but he felt such extreme delicacy at so low a name that to give some authority to the splendour of his diction he assumed the name of his estate and is well known as balzac a french poet of the name of theophile viot finding that his surname pronounced like vaux calf exposed him to the infinite jests of the minor wits silently dropped it by retaining the more poetical appellation of theophile various literary artifices have been employed by some who still preserving a natural attachment to the names of their fathers yet blushing at the same time for their meanness have in their latin works attempted to obviate the ridicule which they provoked one gaucher left-handed borrowed the name of scavola because scavola having burnt his right arm became consequently left-handed thus also one de la borgne one-eyed called himself strabo de charpentier took that of fabricius de valet translated his servilius and an unlucky gentleman who bore the name of du boudum boldly assumed that of virilus dorat a french poet had for his real name disnemandi which in the dialect of the limousin signifies one who dines in the morning that is who has no other dinner than his breakfast this degrading name he changed to dorat or gilded a nickname which one of his ancestors had borne for his fair tresses but by changing his name his feelings were not entirely quieted for unfortunately his daughter cherished an invincible passion for a learned man who unluckily was named goulou that is a shark as gluttonous as a shark miss disnemandi felt naturally a strong attraction for a, a goulou and in spite of her father's remonstrances she once more renewed his sorrows in this alliance there are unfortunate names which are very injurious to the cause in which they are engaged for instance the long parliament in cromwell's time called by derision the rump was headed by one barebones a leather seller it was afterwards called by his unlucky name which served to heighten the ridicule cast over it by the nation formerly a custom prevailed with learned men to change their names they showed at once their contempt for vulgar denominations and their ingenious 
erudition they christened themselves with latin and greek this disguising of names came at length to be considered to have a political tendency and so much alarmed pope paul the second that he imprisoned several persons for their using certain affected names and some indeed which they could not give a reason why they assumed desiderius erasmus was a name formed out of his family name gerard which in dutch signifies amiable or gar all aired nature he first changed it to a latin word of much the same signification desiderius which afterwards he refined into the greek erasmus by which name he is now known the celebrated reuchlin which in german signifies smoke considered it more dignified to smoke in greek by the name of capnio an italian physician of the name of senza malizia prided himself as much on his translating it into the greek akakia as on the works which he published under that name one of the most amiable of the reformers was originally named hertz schwartz black earth which he elegantly turned into the greek name melanchthon the vulgar name of a great italian poet was trapasso but when the learned gravius resolved to devote the youth to the muses he gave him a mellifluous name which they have long known and cherished metastasio harsh names will have in spite of all our philosophy a painful and ludicrous effect on our ears and our associations it is vexatious that the softness of delicious vowels or the wreckedness of inexorable consonants should at all be connected with a man's happiness or even have an influence on his fortune the actor macklin was softened down by taking in the first and last syllables of the name of mclaughlin as malloch was polished to malay and even our sublime milton in a moment of humour and hatred to the scots condescends to insinuate that their barbarous names are symbolical of their natures and from a man of the name of mac Colkittock, he expects no mercy virgil when young formed a design of a national poem but was soon discouraged from proceeding merely by the roughness and asperity of the old roman names such as decius mus the sumo wibius saudex the same thing has happened to a friend who began an epic on the subject of drake's discoveries the name of the hero often will produce a ludicrous effect but one of the most unlucky of his chief heroes must be thomas doughty one of blackmore's chief heroes in his alfred is named gunter a printer's erratum might have been fatal to all his heroism as it is he makes a sorry appearance metastasio found himself in the same situation in one of his letters he writes the title of my new opera is il re pastor the chief incident is the restitution of the kingdom of sidon to the lawful heir a prince with such a hypochondriac name that he would have disgraced the title page of any piece who would have been able to bear an opera entitled l'abdolanimo i have contrived to name him as seldom as possible so true is it as the caustic boileau exclaims of an epic poet of his days who had shown some dexterity in cacophony when he chose his hero oh le plaisant projet d'un poète ignorant qui de temps de hero va choisir childebrand dans ce nom quelquefois le son dur est bizarre bon d'un poème entier ou burlesque ou barbare art poétique quinto trois vers deux cent quarante et un in such a crowd the poet were to blame to choose king chilperic for his hero's name sir w soames this epic poet perceiving the town joined in the severe raillery of the poet published a long defence of his hero's name but the town was inexorable and the epic poet afterwards changed childebrand's name to charles martel which probably was discovered to have something more humane 
Corneille's Partherite was an unsuccessful tragedy, and Voltaire deduces its ill fortune partly from its barbarous names, such as Garibald and Edvige. Voltaire, in giving the names of the founders of Helvetic freedom, says the difficulty of pronouncing these respectable names is injurious to their celebrity. They are Melchthal, Stauffarcher, and Walthurfurst. We almost hesitate to credit what we know to be true, that the length or the shortness of a name can seriously influence the mind. But history records many facts of this nature. Some nations have long cherished a feeling that there is a certain elevation or abasement in proper names. Montaigne on this subject says, A gentleman, one of my neighbors, in overvaluing the excellences of old times, never omitted noticing the pride and magnificence of the names of the nobility of those days don grumadan quadragon argesilon when fully sounded were evidently men of another stamp than peter giles and michael what could be hoped for from the names of ebenezer malachi and methuselah the spaniards have long been known for cherishing a passion for dignified names and are marvellously affected by long and voluminous ones to enlarge them they often add the places of their residence we ourselves seem affected by triple names and the authors of certain periodical publications always assume for their nom de guerre a triple name which doubtless raises them much higher in their readers esteem than a mere christian and surname many spaniards have given themselves names from some remarkable incident in their lives one took the name of the royal transport for having conducted the infanta in italy or in days added de la paz for having signed the peace in seventeen twenty five navarro after a naval battle off toulon added la vittoria though he had remained in safety at cadiz while the french admiral le Cour had fought the battle which was entirely in favour of the english a favourite of the king of spain a great genius and the friend of farinelli who had sprung from a very obscure origin to express his contempt of these empty and haughty names assumed when called to the administration that of the marquis of la ensenada nothing in himself but the influence of long names is of very ancient standing lucian notices one simon who coming to a great fortune aggrandized his name to simonides diocletian had once been plain diocles before he was emperor when bruna became queen of france it was thought proper to convey some of the regal pomp in her name by calling her bruna Hoat the spaniards then must feel a most singular contempt for a very short name and on this subject fuller has recorded a pleasant fact an opulent citizen of the name of john cutts what name can be more unluckily short was ordered by elizabeth to receive the spanish ambassador but the latter complained grievously and thought he was disparaged by the shortness of his name he imagined that a man bearing a monosyllabic name could never in the great alphabet of civil life have performed anything great or honourable but when he found that honest john cutts displayed a hospitality which had nothing monosyllabic in it he groaned only at the utterance of the name of his host there are names indeed which in the social circle will in spite of all due gravity awaken a harmless smile and shenstone solemnly thanked god that his name was not liable to a pun there are some names which excite horror such as mr stabback others contempt as mr twopenny and others of vulgar or absurd signification subject too often to the insolence of domestic whittlings which occasions irritation even in the minds of worthy but suffering men there is an association of pleasing ideas with certain names and in the literary world they produce a fine effect bloomfield is a name apt and fortunate for a rustic bard as florian seems to describe his sweet and flowery style dr parr derived his first acquaintance with the late mr homer from the aptness of his name associating with his pursuits 
our writers of romances and novels are initiated into all the arcana of names which cost them many painful inventions it is recorded of one of the old spanish writers of romance that he was for many days at a loss to coin a fit name for one of his giants he wished to hammer out one equal in magnitude to the person he conceived in imagination and in the haughty and lofty name of traquitantos he thought he had succeeded richardson the great father of our novelists appears to have considered the name of sir charles grandison as perfect as his character for his heroine writes you know his noble name my lucy he felt the same for his clementina for miss byron writes ah lucy what a pretty name is clementina we experience a certain tenderness for names and persons of refined imaginations are fond to give affectionate or lively epithets to things and persons they love petrarch would call one friend lellis and another socrates as descriptive of their character in our own country formerly the ladies appear to have been equally sensible to poetical or elegant names such as alicia cilicia diana helena etc spenser the poet gave to his two sons two names of this kind he called one sylvanus from the woody kilcolman his estate and the other peregrine from his having been born in a strange place and his mother then travelling the fair eloisa gave the whimsical name of astrolabus to her boy it bore some reference to the stars as her own to the sun whether this name of astrolabus had any scientific influence over the sun i know not but i have no doubt that whimsical names may have a great influence over our characters the practice of romantic names among persons even of the lowest orders of society has become a very general evil and doubtless many unfortunate beauties of the names of clarissa and eloisa might have escaped under the less dangerous appellatives of elizabeth or deborah i know a person who has not passed his life without some inconvenience from his name mean talents and violent passions not according with antoninus and a certain writer of verses might have been no versifier unless a lover of the true falernian had it not been for his namesake horace the americans by assuming roman names produced ludicrous associations romulus higgs and junius brutus booth there was more sense when the foundling hospital was first instituted by in baptizing the most robust boys designed for the sea service by the names of drake norris or blake after our famous admirals it is no trifling misfortune in life to bear an illustrious name and in an author it is peculiarly severe a history now by a mr hume or a poem by a mr pope would be examined with different eyes than had they borne any other name the relative of a great author should endeavour not to be an author thomas cornier had the unfortunate honour of being brother to a great poet and his own merits have been considerably injured by the involuntary comparison the son of racine has written with an amenity not unworthy of his celebrated father amiable and candid he had his portrait painted with the works of his father in his hand and his eye fixed on this verse from phaedra et moi fils inconnu dans si glorieux père but even his modesty only served to wet the dart of epigram it was once bitterly said of the son of an eminent literary character he tries to write because his father writ and shows himself a bastard by his wit amongst some of the disagreeable consequences attending some names is when they are unluckily adapted to an uncommon rhyme how can any man defend himself from this malicious ingenuity of wit Frere, one of those unfortunate victims to boileau's verse is said not to have been deficient in the decorum of his manners and he complained that he was represented as a drunkard merely because his name rhymed to cabaret murphy no doubt felicitated himself in his literary quarrel with dr franklin the poet and critical reviewer by adopting the singular rhyme of envy rankling to his rivals and critics name 
superstition has interfered even in the choice of names and this solemn folly has received the name of a science called onomantia of which the superstitious ancients discovered a hundred foolish mysteries they cast up the numeral letters of names and achilles was therefore fated to vanquish hector from the numeral letters in his name amounting to a higher number than his rivals they made many whimsical divisions and subdivisions of names to prove them lucky or unlucky but these follies are not those that i am now treating on some names have been considered as more auspicious than others cicero informs us that when the romans raised troops they were anxious that the name of the first soldier who enlisted should be one of good augury when the censors numbered the citizens they always began by a fortunate name such as salvius valerius a person of the name of regilianus was chosen emperor merely from the royal sound of his name and jovian was elected because his name approached nearest to the beloved one of the philosophic julian this fanciful superstition was even carried so far that some were considered as auspicious and others as unfortunate the superstitious belief in auspicious names was so strong that caesar in his african expedition gave a command to an obscure and distant relative of the scipios to please the popular prejudice that the scipios were invincible in africa suetonius observes that all those of the family of caesar who bore the surname of caius perished by the sword the emperor severus consoled himself for the licentious life of his empress julia from the fatality attending those of her name this strange prejudice of lucky and unlucky names prevailed in modern europe the successor of adrian VI, as guicciardini tells us wished to preserve his own name on the papal throne but he gave up the wish when the conclave of cardinals used the powerful argument that all the popes who had preserved their own names had died in the first year of their pontificates cardinal marcel servin who preserved his name when elected pope died on the twentieth day of his pontificate and this confirmed this superstitious opinion la motte le Valle gravely asserts that all the queens of naples of the name of joan and the kings of scotland of the name of james have been unfortunate and we have formal treatises of the fatality of christian names it is a vulgar notion that every female of the name of agnes is fated to become mad every nation has some names labouring with this popular prejudice herrera the spanish historian records an anecdote in which the choice of a queen entirely arose from her name when two french ambassadors negotiated a marriage between one of the spanish princesses and louis eight the names of the royal females were uraca and blanche the former was the elder and the more beautiful and intended by the spanish court for the french monarch but they resolutely preferred blanche observing that the name of uraca would never do and for the sake of a more mellifluous sound they carried off exulting in their own discerning ears the happier named but less beautiful princess there are names indeed which are painful to the feelings from the associations of our passions Footnote plautus thought it quite enough to damn a man that he bore the name of lyca which is said to signify a greedy wolf and livy calls the name atreus umber abominandi ominous snowman a name of horrible portent nares heraldic anomalies End of footnote i have seen the christian name of a gentleman the victim of the caprice of his godfather who is called blast us godly which were he designed for a bishop must irritate religious feelings i am not surprised that one of the spanish monarchs refused to employ a sound catholic for his secretary because his name martin lutero had an affinity to the name of the reformer mr rose has recently informed us that an architect called malacarne who i believe had nothing against him but his name was lately deprived of his place as principal architect by the austrian government let us hope not for his unlucky name though that government according to mr rose acts on capricious principles the fondness which some have felt to perpetuate their names when their race has fallen extinct is well known and a fortune has then been bestowed for a change of name but the affection for names has gone even farther a similitude of names candum 
observes doth kindle sparks of love and liking among mere strangers i have observed the great pleasure of persons with uncommon names meeting with another of the same name an instant relationship appears to take place and i have known that fortunes have been bequeathed for namesakes an ornamental manufacturer who bears a name which he supposes to be very uncommon having executed an order for a gentleman of the same name refused to send his bill never having met with the like preferring to payment the honour of serving him for name's sake among the greeks and the romans beautiful and significant names were studied the sublime plato himself has noticed the present topic his visionary ear was sensible to the delicacy of a name and his exalted fancy was delighted with beautiful names as well as every other species of beauty in his cratylus he is solicitous that persons should have happy harmonious and attractive names according to aulus gellius the athenians enacted by a public decree that no slave should ever bear the consecrated names of their two youthful patriots harmodius and aristogiton names which had been devoted to the liberties of their country they considered would be contaminated by servitude the ancient romans decreed that the surnames of infamous patricians should not be borne by any other patrician of that family that their very names might be degraded and expire with them eutropius gives a pleasing proof of national friendships being cemented by a name by a treaty of peace between the romans and the sabines they agreed to melt the two nations into one mass that they should bear their names conjointly the roman should add his to the sabine and the sabine take a roman name footnote the names adopted by the romans were very significant the nomen was indicative of the branch of the family distinguished by the cognomen while the prenomen was invented to distinguish one from the rest thus a man of family had three names and even a fourth was added when it was won by great deeds End of footnote the ancients named both persons and things from some event or other circumstance connected with the object they were to name chance fancy superstition fondness and piety have invented names it was a common and whimsical custom among the ancients observes larcher to give as nicknames the letters of the alphabet thus a lame girl was called lambda on account of the resemblance which her lameness made her bear to the letter lambda or lambda aesop was called theta by his master from his superior acuteness another was called beta from his love of beet it was thus scarron with infinite good temper alluded to his zigzag body by comparing himself to the letter s or z the learned calmet also notices among the hebrews nicknames and names of raillery taken from defects of body or mind etc one is called nabal or fool another hamor the ass hagab the grasshopper etc women had frequently the names of animals as deborah the bee rachel the sheep others from their nature or other qualifications as tamar the palm tree hadassah the myrtle sarah the princess hannah the gracious the indians of north america employ sublime and picturesque names such are the great eagle the partridge dawn of the day great swift arrow path opener sun bright End of Section 19。Section 20 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Diana Schmidt. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2, by Isaac Disraeli. The Jews of York. Among the most interesting passages of history are those in which we contemplate an oppressed yet sublime spirit, agitated by the conflict of two terrific passions, implacable hatred attempting a resolute vengeance, while that vengeance, though impotent, with dignified and silent horror, sinks into the last expression of despair in a degenerate nation we may on such rare occasions discover among them a spirit superior to its companions and its fortune in the ancient and modern history of the jews we may find two kindred examples i refer the reader for the more ancient narrative to the second book of maccabees 
Chapter 14, verse 37. No feeble and unaffecting painting is presented in the simplicity of the original. I proceed to relate the narrative of the Jews of York. When Richard I ascended the throne, the Jews, to conciliate the royal protection, brought their tributes. Many had hastened from remote parts of England, and appearing at Westminster, the court and the mob imagined that they had leagued to bewitch his majesty. An edict was issued to forbid their presence at the coronation, but several, whose curiosity was greater than their prudence, conceived that they might pass unobserved among the crowd, and ventured to insinuate themselves into the abbey. Probably their voice and their visage alike betrayed them, for they were soon discovered. They flew diversely in great consternation, while many were dragged out with little remains of life. A rumor spread rapidly through the city that in honor of the festival the Jews were to be massacred. The populace, at once eager of royalty and riot, pillaged and burnt their houses and murdered the devoted Jews. Benedict, a Jew of York, to save his life, received baptism, and returning to that city with his friend Josinus, the most opulent of the Jews, died of his wounds. Josinus and his servants narrated the late tragic circumstances to their neighbors, but where they hoped to move sympathy, they excited rage. The people at York soon gathered to imitate the people at London, and their first assault was on the house of the late Benedict, which, having some strength and magnitude, contained his family and friends, who found their graves in its ruins. The alarmed Jews hastened to Josinus, who conducted them to the governor of York Castle, and prevailed on him to afford them an asylum for their persons and effects. In the meanwhile, their habitations were leveled, and the owners murdered, except a few unresisting beings who, unmanly in sustaining honor, were adapted to receive baptism. The castle had sufficient strength for their defense, but a suspicion arising that the governor, who oft went out, intended to betray them, they one day refused him entrance. He complained to the sheriff of the county, and the chiefs of the violent party, who stood deeply indebted to the Jews, Uniting with him, orders were issued to attack the castle. The cruel multitude, united with the soldiery, felt such a desire of slaughtering those they intended to despoil, that the sheriff, repenting of the order, revoked it, but in vain. Fanaticism and robbery, once set loose, will satiate their appetency for blood and plunder. They solicited the aid of the superior citizens, who, perhaps not owing quite so much money to the Jews, humanely refused it, but having addressed the clergy, the barbarous clergy of those days, were by them animated, conducted, and blessed. The leader of this rabble was a canon regular, whose zeal was so fervent that he stood by them in his surplice, which he considered as a coat of mail, and reiteratedly exclaimed, Destroy the enemies of Jesus! This spiritual laconism invigorated the army of men, who perhaps wanted no other stimulative than the hope of obtaining the immense property of the besieged. It is related of this canon that every morning before he went to assist in battering the walls he swallowed a consecrated wafer. One day, having approached too near, defended as he conceived by his surplice, this church militant was crushed by a heavy fragment of the wall rolled from the battlement. But the avidity of certain plunder prevailed over any reflection which, on another occasion, the loss of so pious a leader might have raised. Their attacks continued, till at length the Jews perceived they could hold out no longer and a council was called to consider what remained to be done in the extremity of danger. Among the Jews, their elder rabbin was most respected. It had been customary with this people to invite for this place some foreigner, renowned among them for the depth of his learning and the sanctity of his manners. At this time the aham, or elder rabbin, was a foreigner, who had been sent over to instruct them in their laws, and was a person, as we shall observe, of no ordinary qualifications. When the Jewish council was assembled, the Aham rose and addressed them in this manner. 
Men of Israel, the God of our ancestors, is omniscient, and there is no one who can say, Why dost thou this? This day he commands us to die for his law, for that law which we have cherished from the first hour it was given, which we have preserved pure throughout our captivity in all nations, and which for the many consolations it has given us, and the eternal hope it communicates. Can we do less than die? Posterity shall behold this book of truth, sealed with our blood, and our death, while it displays our sincerity, shall impart confidence to the wanderer of Israel. Death is before our eyes, and we have only to choose an honorable and easy one. If we fall into the hands of our enemies, which you know we cannot escape, our death will be ignominious and cruel. For these Christians, who picture the Spirit of God in a dove, and confide in the meek Jesus, are athirst for our blood, and prowl around the castle like wolves. It is therefore my advice that we elude their tortures, that we ourselves should be our own executioners, and that we voluntarily surrender our lives to our Creator. We trace the invisible Jehovah in His acts. God seems to call for us, but let us not be unworthy of that call. Suicide, on occasions like the present, is both rational and lawful. Many examples are not wanting among our forefathers. As I advise, men of Israel, they have acted on similar occasions. Having said this, the old man sat down and wept. The assembly was divided in their opinions. Men of fortitude applauded its wisdom, but the pusillanimous murmured that it was a dreadful counsel. Again the rabbin rose, and spoke these few words in a firm and decisive tone. My children, since we are not unanimous in our opinions, let those who do not approve of my advice depart from this assembly. Some departed, but the greater number attached themselves to their venerable priest. They now employed themselves in consuming their valuables by fire, and every man, fearful of trusting to the timid and irresolute hand of the women, first destroyed his wife and children, and then himself. Josinus and the rabbin alone remained. Their lives were protracted to the last, that they might see everything performed according to their orders. Josinus, being the chief Jew, was distinguished by the last mark of human respect in receiving his death from the consecrated hand of the aged rabbin who immediately after performed the melancholy duty on himself all this was transacted in the depth of the night in the morning the walls of the castle were seen wrapped in flames and only a few miserable and pusillanimous beings unworthy of the sword were viewed on the battlements pointing to their extinct brethren when they opened the gates of the castle, these men verified the prediction of their late rabbin, for the multitude, bursting through the solitary courts, found themselves defrauded of their hopes, and in a moment avenged themselves on the feeble wretches who knew not how to die with honor. Such is the narrative of the Jews of York, of whom the historian can only cursorily observe that five hundred destroyed themselves but it is the philosopher who inquires into the causes and the manner of these glorious suicides these are histories which meet only the eye of few yet they are infinitely more advantage than those which are read by every one we instruct ourselves in meditating on these scenes of heroic exertion and if by such histories we make but a slow progress in chronology our heart however expands with sentiment I admire not the stoicism of Cato more than the fortitude of the rabbin, or rather we should applaud that of the rabbin much more, for Cato was familiar with the animating visions of Plato, and was the associate of Cicero and of Caesar. The rabbin had probably read only the Pentateuch, and mingled with companions of mean occupations and meaner minds. Cato was accustomed to the grandeur of the mistress of the universe and the rabbin to the littleness of a provincial town. Men, like pictures, may be placed in an obscure and unfavorable light, but the finest picture 
in the unilluminated corner still remains the design and coloring of the master my rabbin is a companion for cato his history is a tale which cato's self had not disdained to hear pope end of section twenty section twenty one of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jason in panama curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli the sovereignty of the seas the sovereignty of the seas which foreigners dispute with us is as much a conquest as any one obtained on land it is gained and preserved by our cannon and the french who for ages past exclaim against what they call our tyranny are only hindered from becoming themselves universal tyrants over land and sea by that sovereignty of the seas without which great britain would cease to exist in a memoir of the french institute i read a bitter philippic against this sovereignty and a notice then adapted to a writer's purpose under bonaparte of two great works one by selden and the other by grotius on this subject the following is the historical anecdote useful to revive in sixteen thirty four a dispute arose between the english and dutch concerning the herring fishery upon the british coast the french and dutch had always persevered in declaring that the seas were perfectly free and grounded their reasons on a work of grotius so early as in sixteen o nine the great grotius had published his treatise of mar liberum in favour of the freedom of the seas and it is a curious fact that in sixteen eighteen selden had composed another treatise in defence of the king's dominion over the seas but which from accidents which are known was not published till the dispute revived the controversy selden in sixteen thirty six gave the world his mare clausum in answer to the mare liberum of grotius both these great men felt a mutual respect for each other they only knew the rivalry of genius as a matter of curious discussion and legal investigation the philosopher must incline to the arguments of selden who has proved by records the first occupancy of the english and the english dominion over the four seas to the utter exclusion of the french and dutch from fishing without our license he proves that our kings have always levied great sums without even the concurrence of their parliaments for the express purpose of defending this sovereignty at sea a copy of selden's work was placed in the council chest of the exchequer and in the court of admiralty as one of our most precious records the historical anecdote is finally closed by the dutch themselves who now agreed to acknowledge the english sovereignty in the seas and pay a tribute of thirty thousand pounds to the king of england for liberty to fish in the seas and consent to annual tributes that the dutch yielded to selden's arguments is a triumph we cannot venture to boast the ultima ratio regum prevailed and when we had destroyed their whole fishing fleet the affair appeared much clearer than in the ingenious volumes of grotius or selden another dutchman presented the states-general with a ponderous reply to selden's mar clausum but the wise sommelsteik advised the states to suppress the idle discussion observing that this affair must be decided by the sword and not by the pen it may be curious to add that as no prevailing or fashionable subject can be agitated but some idler must interfere to make it extravagant and very new so this grave subject did not want for something of this nature a learned italian i believe agreed with our author selden in general that the sea as well as the earth is subject to some states but he maintained that the dominion of the sea belonged to the genoese end of section twenty one section twenty two of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jason in panama curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli 
on the custom of kissing hands monsieur morin a french academician has amused himself with collecting several historical notices of this custom i give a summary for the benefit of those who have had the honour of kissing his majesty's hand it is not those who kiss the royal hand who could write best on the custom this custom is not only very ancient and nearly universal but has been alike participated by religion and society to begin with religion from the remotest times men saluted the sun moon and stars by kissing the hand job assures us that he was never given to this superstition thirty one twenty six the same honor was rendered to baal one kings nineteen eighteen other instances might be adduced we now pass to greece there all foreign superstitions were received lucian after having mentioned various sorts of sacrifices which the rich offered the gods adds that the poor adored them by the simpler compliment of kissing their hands that author gives an anecdote of demosthenes which shows this custom when a prisoner to the soldiers of antipater he asked to enter a temple when he entered he touched his mouth with his hands which the guards took for an act of religion he did it however more securely to swallow the poison he had prepared for such an occasion he mentions other instances from the greeks it passed to the romans pliny places it among those ancient customs of which they were ignorant of the origin or the reason persons were treated as atheists who would not kiss their hands when they entered a temple when apuleius mentions psyche he says she was so beautiful that they adored her as venus in kissing the right hand the ceremonial action rendered respectable the earliest institutions of christianity it was a custom with the primeval bishops to give their hands to be kissed by the ministers who served at the altar this custom however as a religious rite declined with paganism in society our ingenious academician considers the custom of kissing hands as essential to its welfare it is a mute form which expresses reconciliation which entreats favors or which thanks for those received it is a universal language intelligible without an interpreter which doubtless preceded writing and perhaps speech itself solomon says of the flatterers and suppliants of his time that they ceased not to kiss the hands of their patrons till they had obtained the favors which they solicited in homer we see priam kissing the hands and embracing the knees of achilles while he supplicates for the body of hector this custom prevailed in ancient rome but it varied in the first ages of the republic it seems to have been only practiced by inferiors to their superiors equals gave their hands and embraced in the progress of time even the soldiers refused to show this mark of respect to their generals and their kissing the hand of cato when he was obliged to quit them was regarded as an extraordinary circumstance at a period of such refinement the great respect paid to the tribunes councils and dictators obliged individuals to live with them in a more distant and respectful manner and instead of embracing them as they did formerly they considered themselves as fortunate if allowed to kiss their hands under the emperors kissing hands became an essential duty even for the great themselves inferior courtiers were obliged to be content to adore the purple by kneeling touching the robe of the emperor by the right hand and carrying it to the mouth even this was thought too free and at length they saluted the emperor at a distance by kissing their hands in the same manner as when they adored their gods it is superfluous to trace this custom in every country where it exists it is practiced in every known country in respect to sovereigns and superiors even amongst the negroes and the inhabitants of the new world cortez found it established at mexico where more than a thousand lords saluted him in touching the earth with their hands which they afterwards carried to their mouths thus whether the custom of salutation is practised by kissing the hands of others from respect or in bringing one's own to the mouth it is of all other customs the most universal this practice is now become too gross a familiarity and it is considered as a meanness to kiss the hand of those with whom we are in habits of intercourse 
and this custom would be entirely lost if lovers were not solicitous to preserve it in all its full power. End of section 22section 23 of curiosities of literature volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jason in panama curiosities of literature volume 2 by isaac disraeli popes valois observes that the popes scrupulously followed in the early ages of the church the custom of placing their names after that of the person whom they addressed in their letters this mark of their humility he proves by letters written by various popes thus when the great projects of politics were yet unknown to them did they adhere to christian meekness at length the day arrived when one of the popes whose name does not occur to me said that it was safer to quarrel with a prince than with a friar henry the sixth being at the feet of pope celestine his holiness thought proper to kick the crown off his head which ludicrous and disgraceful action baronius has highly praised jortin observes on this great cardinal and advocate of the roman see that he breathes nothing but fire and brimstone and accounts kings and emperors to be mere catchpoles and constables bound to execute with implicit faith all the commands of insolent ecclesiastics bellarmin was made a cardinal for his efforts and devotion to the papal cause and maintaining this monstrous paradox that if the pope forbid the exercise of virtue and command that of a vice the roman church under pain of a sin was obliged to abandon virtue for vice if it would not sin against conscience it was nicholas i a bold and enterprising pope who in eight fifty eight forgetting the pious modesty of his predecessors took advantage of the divisions in the royal families of france and did not hesitate to place his name before that of the kings and emperors of the house of france to whom he wrote since that time he has been imitated by all his successors and this encroachment on the honours of monarchy has passed into a custom from having been tolerated in its commencement concerning the acknowledged infallibility of the popes it appears that gregory the seventh in council decreed that the church of rome neither had erred and never should err it was thus this prerogative of his holiness became received till thirteen thirteen when john twenty second abrogated decrees made by three popes his predecessors and declared that what was done amiss by one pope or council might be corrected by another and gregory eleventh thirteen seventy in his will deprecates si quid in catholica fide ereset the university of vienna protested against it calling it a contempt of god and an idolatry if any one in matters of faith should appeal from a council to the pope that is from god who presides in councils to man but the infallibility was at length established by leo x especially after luther's opposition because they despaired of defending their indulgences bulls etc by any other method imagination cannot form a scene more terrific than when these men were at the height of power and to serve their political purposes hurled the thunders of their excommunications over a kingdom it was a national distress not inferior to a plague or famine philip augustus desirous of divorcing ingelberg to unite himself to agnes de morani the pope put his kingdom under an interdict the churches were shut during the space of eight months they said neither mass nor vespers they did not marry and even the offspring of the married born at this unhappy period were considered as illicit and because the king would not sleep with his wife it was not permitted to any of his subjects to sleep with theirs in that year france was threatened with an extinction of the ordinary generation a man under this curse of public penance was divested of all his functions civil military and matrimonial he was not allowed to dress his hair to shave to bathe or even change his linen so that upon the whole this made a filthy penitent the good king robert incurred the censures of the church for having married his cousin 
he was immediately abandoned. Two faithful domestics alone remained with him, and these always passed through the fire whatever he touched. In a word, the horror which an excommunication occasioned was such that a courtesan, with whom one Pelletier had passed some moments, having learnt soon afterwards that he had been about six months an excommunicated person, fell into a panic, and with great difficulty recovered from her convulsions. End of section 23《Section 24 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.《Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2 by Isaac Disraeli. Literary Composition To literary composition we may apply the saying of an ancient philosopher, a little thing gives perfection although perfection is not a little thing the great legislator of the hebrews orders us to pull off the fruit for the first three years and not to taste them he was not ignorant how it weakens a young tree to bring to maturity its first fruits thus on literary compositions our green essays ought to be picked away the word zamar by a beautiful metaphor from pruning trees means in hebrew to compose verses blotting and correcting was so much churchill's abhorrence that i've heard from his publisher he once energetically expressed himself that it was like cutting away one's own flesh this strong figure sufficiently shows his repugnance to an author's duty churchill now lies neglected for posterity will only respect those who file off the mortal part of glowing thought with attic art young i have heard that this careless bard after a successful work usually precipitated the publication of another relying on its crudeness being passed over by the public curiosity excited by its better brother he called this getting double pay for thus he secured the sale of a hurried work but churchill was a spendthrift of fame and enjoyed all his revenue while he lived posterity owes him little and pays him nothing bale an experienced observer in literary matters tells us that correction is by no means practicable by some authors as in the case of ovid in exile his compositions were nothing more than spiritless repetitions of what he had formerly written he confesses both negligence and idleness in the corrections of his works the vivacity which animated his first productions failing him when he revised his poems he found correction too laborious and he abandoned it this however was only an excuse it is certain that some authors cannot correct they compose with pleasure and with ardour but they exhaust all their force they fly with but one wing when they review their works the first fire does not return there is in their imagination a certain calm which hinders their pen from making any progress their mind is like a boat which only advances by the strength of oars dr moore the platonist had such an exuberance of fancy that correction was a much greater labour than composition he used to say that in writing his works he was forced to cut his way through a crowd of thoughts as through a wood and that he threw off in his compositions as much as would make an ordinary philosopher moore was a great enthusiast and of course an egotist so that criticism ruffled his temper notwithstanding all his platonism when accused of obscurities and extravagances he said that like the ostrich he laid his eggs in the sands which would prove vital and prolific in time however these ostrich eggs have proved to be addled a habit of correctness in the lesser parts of composition will assist the higher it is worth recording that the great milton was anxious for correct punctuation and that addison was solicitous after the minutiae of the press savage armstrong and others felt tortures on similar objects 
it is said of julius scaliger that he had this peculiarity in his manner of composition he wrote with such accuracy that his manuscripts and the printed copy corresponded page for page and line for line malherbe the father of french poetry tormented himself by a prodigious slowness and was employed rather in perfecting than in forming works his muse is compared to a fine woman in the pangs of delivery he exulted in his tardiness and after finishing a poem of one hundred verses or a discourse of ten pages he used to say he ought to repose for ten years balzac the first writer in french prose who gave majesty and harmony to a period did not grudge to expend a week on a page never satisfied with his first thoughts our costive gray entertained the same notion and it is hard to say if it arose from the sterility of their genius or their sensibility of taste the manuscripts of tasso still preserved are illegible from the vast number of their corrections i have given a facsimile as correct as it is possible to conceive of one page of pope's manuscript homer as a specimen of his continual corrections and critical erasures the celebrated madame dacier never could satisfy herself in translating homer continually retouching the version even in its happiest passages there were several parts which she translated in six or seven manners and she frequently noted in the margin i have not yet done it when pascal became warm in his celebrated controversy he applied himself with incredible labour to the composition of his provincial letters he was frequently twenty days occupied on a single letter he recommenced some above seven and eight times and by this means obtained that perfection which has made his work as voltaire says one of the best books ever published in france the quintus curtius of vogelus occupied him thirty years generally every period was translated in the margin five or six different ways chapelain and conrar who took the pains to review this work critically were many times perplexed in their choice of passages they generally liked best that which had been first composed hume had never done with corrections every edition varies from the preceding ones but there are more fortunate and fluid minds than these voltaire tells us of fenelon's telemachus that the amiable author composed it in his retirement in the short period of three months fenelon had before this formed his style and his mind overflowed with all the spirit of the ancients he opened a copious fountain and there were not ten erasures in the original manuscript the same facility accompanied gibbon after the experience of his first volume and the same copious readiness attended adam smith who dictated to his amanuensis while he walked about his study the ancients were as pertinacious in their corrections isocrates it is said was employed for ten years on one of his works and to appear natural studied with the most refined art after a labour of eleven years virgil pronounced his aeneid imperfect dio cassius devoted twelve years to the composition of his history and diodorus siculus thirty there is a middle between velocity and torpidity the italians say it is not necessary to be a stag but we ought not to be a tortoise many ingenious expedients are not to be contemned in literary labours the critical advice to choose an author as we would a friend is very useful to young writers the finest geniuses have always affectionately attached themselves to some particular author of congenial disposition pope in his version of homer kept a constant eye on his master dryden corneille's favourite authors were the brilliant tacitus the heroic livy and the lofty lucin the influence of their characters may be traced in his best tragedies the great clarendon when employed in writing his history read over very carefully tacitus and livy to give dignity to his style tacitus did not surpass him in his portraits though clarendon never equalled livy in his narrative 
the mode of literary composition adopted by that admirable student sir william jones is well deserving our attention after having fixed on his subjects he always added the model of the composition and thus boldly wrestled with the great authors of antiquity on board the frigate which was carrying him to india he projected the following works and noted them in this manner one elements of the laws of england model the essay on bailments aristotle two the history of the american war model thucydides and polybius three britain discovered an epic poem machinery hindu gods model homer four speeches political and forensic model demosthenes five dialogues philosophical and historical model plato and of favourite authors there are also favourite works which we love to be familiarised with bartholinus has a dissertation on reading books in which he points out the superior performances of different writers of st austin his city of god of hippocrates coacae praenotiones of cicero de officius of aristotle de animalibus of catullus coma berenices of virgil the sixth book of the aeneid etc such judgments are indeed not to be our guides but such a mode of reading is useful by condensing our studies evelyn who has written treatises on several subjects was occupied for years on them his manner of arranging his materials and his mode of composition appear excellent having chosen a subject he analyzed it into its various parts under certain heads or titles to be filled up at leisure under these heads he set down his own thoughts as they occurred occasionally inserting whatever was useful from his reading when his collections were thus formed he digested his own thoughts regularly and strengthened them by authorities from ancient and modern authors or alleged his reasons for dissenting from them his collections in time became voluminous but he then exercised that judgment which the formers of such collections are usually deficient in with hesiod he knew that half is better than the whole and it was his aim to express the quintessence of his reading but not to give it in a crude state to the world and when his treatises were sent to the press they were not half the size of his collections thus also winkelmann in his history of art an extensive work was long lost in settling on a plan like artists who make random sketches of their first conceptions he threw on paper ideas hints and observations which occurred in his readings many of them indeed were not connected with his history but were afterwards inserted in some of his other works even gibbon tells us of his roman history at the outset all was dark and doubtful even the title of the work the true era of the decline and fall of the empire the limits of the introduction the division of the chapters and the order of the narration and i was often tempted to cast away the labour of seven years akenside has exquisitely described the progress and the pains of genius in its delightful reveries pleasures of imagination book three verse three seventy three the pleasures of composition in an ardent genius were never so finely described as by buffon speaking of the hours of composition he said these are the most luxurious and delightful moments of life moments which have often enticed me to pass fourteen hours at my desk in a state of transport this gratification more than glory is my reward the publication of gibbon's memoirs conveyed to the world a faithful picture of the most fervid industry it is in youth the foundations of such a sublime edifice as his history must be laid the world can now trace how this colossus of erudition day by day and year by year prepared himself for some vast work gibbon has furnished a new idea in the art of reading we ought says he not to attend to the order of our books so much as of our thoughts the perusal of a particular work gives birth perhaps to ideas unconnected with the subject it treats i pursue these ideas and quit my proposed plan of reading thus in the midst of homer he read longinus a chapter of longinus led to an epistle of pliny and having finished longinus he followed the train of his ideas of the sublime and beautiful in the inquiry of burke 
and concluded with comparing the ancient with the modern longinus of all our popular writers the most experienced reader was gibbon and he offers an important advice to an author engaged on a particular subject i suspended my perusal of any new book on the subject till i had reviewed all that i knew or believed or had thought on it that i might be qualified to discern how much the authors added to my original stock these are valuable hints to students and such have been practised by others footnote edgar poe's account of the regular mode by which he designed and executed his best and most renowned poem the raven is an instance of the use of methodical rule successfully applied to what appears to be one of the most fanciful of mental works End of footnote anselon was a very ingenious student he seldom read a book throughout without reading in his progress many others his library table was always covered with a number of books for the most part open this variety of authors bred no confusion they all assisted to throw light on the same topic he was not disgusted by frequently seeing the same thing in different writers their opinions were so many new strokes which completed the ideas which he had conceived the celebrated father paul studied in the same manner he never passed over an interesting subject till he had confronted a variety of authors in historical researches he never would advance till he had fixed once for all the places time and opinions a mode of study which appears very dilatory but in the end will make a great saving of time and labour of mind those who have not pursued this method are all their lives at a loss to settle their opinions and their belief from the want of having once brought them to such a test i shall now offer a plan of historical study and a calculation of the necessary time it will occupy without specifying the authors as i only propose to animate a young student who feels he has not to number the days of a patriarch that he should not be alarmed at the vast labyrinth historical researches present to his eye if we look into public libraries more than thirty thousand volumes of history may be found longlet de fresnois one of the greatest readers calculated that he could not read with satisfaction more than ten hours a day and ten pages in folio an hour which makes one hundred pages every day supposing each volume to contain one thousand pages every month would amount to three volumes which make thirty-six volumes in folio in the year in fifty years a student could only read eighteen hundred volumes in folio all this too supposing uninterrupted health and an intelligence as rapid as the eyes of the laborious researcher a man can hardly study to advantage till past twenty and at fifty his eyes will be dimmed and his head stuffed with much reading that should never be read his fifty years for eighteen hundred volumes are reduced to thirty years and one thousand volumes and after all the universal historian must resolutely face thirty thousand volumes but to cheer the historiographer he shows that a public library is only necessary to be consulted it is in our private closet where should be found those few writers who direct us to their rivals without jealousy and mark in the vast career of time those who are worthy to instruct posterity his calculation proceeds on this plan that six hours a day and the term of ten years are sufficient to pass over with utility the immense field of history he calculates an alarming extent of historical ground for a knowledge of sacred history he gives three months ancient egypt babylon and assyria modern assyria or persia one ditto greek history six ditto roman history by the moderns seven ditto roman history by the original writers six ditto ecclesiastical history general and particular thirty ditto modern history twenty four ditto to this may be added for recurrences and reperusals forty eight ditto the total will amount to ten and a half years thus in ten years and a half 
a student in history has obtained an universal knowledge and this on a plan which permits as much leisure as every student would choose to indulge as a specimen of du fresnoir's calculations take that of sacred history for reading pere calmet's learned dissertations in the order he points out twelve days for pere calmet's history in two volumes quarto now in four twelve for Prideaux's history ten for josephus twelve for basnage's history of the jews twenty in all sixty-six days he allows however ninety days for obtaining a sufficient knowledge of sacred history in reading this sketch we are scarcely surprised at the erudition of a gibbon but having admired that erudition we perceive the necessity of such a plan if we would not learn what we have afterwards to unlearn a plan like the present even in a mind which should feel itself incapable of the exertion will not be regarded without that reverence we feel for genius animating such industry this scheme of study though it may never be rigidly pursued will be found excellent ten years labour of happy diligence may render a student capable of consigning to posterity a history as universal in its topics as that of the historian who led to this investigation end of literary composition Section 25 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sonia. Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2 by Isaac Disraeli. Poetical Imitations and Similarities. Tantus amor florum et generandi gloria melis georgica liber four verse two hundred and four such rage of honey in our bosom beats and such a zeal we have for flowery sweets dryden this article was commenced by me many years ago in the early volumes of the monthly magazine and continued by various correspondents with various success i have collected only those of my own contribution because i do not feel authorized to make use of those of other persons however some may be desirable one of the most elegant of literary recreations is that of tracing poetical or prose imitations and similarities for assuredly similarity is not always imitation bishop hurd's pleasing essay on the marks of imitation will assist the critic in deciding on what may only be an accidental similarity rather than a studied imitation those critics have indulged an intemperate abuse in these entertaining researches who from a single word derived the imitation of an entire passage wakefield in his edition of gray is very liable to this censure this kind of literary amusement is not despicable there are few men of letters who have not been in the habit of marking parallel passages or tracing imitation in the thousand shapes it assumes it forms it cultivates it delights taste to observe by what dexterity and variation genius conceals or modifies an original thought or image and to view the same sentiment or expression borrowed with art or heightened by embellishment the ingenious writer of a criticism on gray's elegy in continuation of dr johnson's has given some observation on this subject which will please it is often entertaining to trace imitation to detect the adopted image the copied design the transferred sentiment the appropriate phrase and even the acquired manner and frame under all the disguises that imitation combination and accommodation may have thrown around them must require both parts and diligence but it will bring with it no ordinary gratification a book professedly on the history and progress of imitation in poetry written by a man of perspicuity an adept in the art of discerning likenesses even when minute with examples properly selected and gradations duly marked would make an impartial accession to the store of human literature and furnish rational curiosity with a high regale let me premise that these notices the wrecks of a large collection of passages i had once formed merely as exercises to form my taste are not given with the petty malignant delight of detecting the unacknowledged imitations of our best writers 
but merely to habituate the young student to an instructive amusement and to exhibit that beautiful variety which the same image is capable of exhibiting when retouched with all the art of genius gray in his ode to spring has the attic warbler pours her throat wakefield in his commentary has a copious passage on this poetical diction he conceives it to be an admirable improvement of the greek and roman classics Cain auden hesiod scutum herculis three hundred ninety six suaves ex ore loquelas funde lucretius one forty this learned editor was little conversant with modern literature as he proved by his memorable editions of gray and pope the expression is evidently borrowed not from hesiod nor from lucretius but from a brother at home is it for thee the linnet pours her throat essay on man epistola three verse thirty three gray in the ode to adversity addresses the power thus thou tamer of the human breast whose iron scourge and torturing hour the bad affright afflict the best wakefield censures the expression torturing hour by discovering an impropriety and incongruity he says consistency of figure rather required some material image like iron scourge and adamantine chain it is curious to observe a verbal critic lecture such a poet as gray the poet probably would never have replied or in a moment of excessive urbanity he might have condescended to point out to this minutest of critics the following passage in milton when the scourge inexorably and the torturing hour calls us to penance paradise lost b two verse ninety gray in his ode to adversity has light they disperse and with them go the summer friend fond of this image he has it again in his bard they swarm that in thy noontide beam are born gone perhaps the germ of this beautiful image may be found in shakespeare for men like butterflies show not their mealy wings but to the summer troilus and cressida act three scene seven and two similar passages in timon of athens the swallow follows not summer more willingly than we your lordship timon no more willingly leaves winter such summer birds are men act three again in the same one cloud of winter showers these flies are couched act two gray in his progress of poetry has in climes beyond the solar road wakefield has traced this imitation to dryden gray himself refers to virgil and petrarch wakefield gives the line from dryden thus beyond the year and out of heaven's highway which he calls extremely bold and poetical i confess a critic might be allowed to be somewhat fastidious in this unpoetical diction on the highway which i believe dryden never used i think his line was thus beyond the year out of the solar walk pope has expressed the image more elegantly though copied from dryden far as the solar walk or milky way gray has in his bard dear as the light that visits these sad eyes dear as the ruddy drops that warm my heart gray himself points out the imitation in shakespeare of the latter image but it is curious to observe that otway in his venice preserved makes priuli most pathetically exclaim to his daughter that she is dear as the vital warmth that feeds my life dear as these eyes that weep in fondness over thee gray tells us that the image of his bard loose his beard and hoary hair streamed like a meteor to the troubled air was taken from a picture of the supreme being by raphael it is however remarkable and somewhat ludicrous that the beard of hudibras is also compared to a meteor and the accompanying observation of butler almost induces one to think that gray derived from it the whole plan of that sublime ode since his bard precisely performs what the beard of hudibras denounced these are the verses this hairy meteor did denounce the fall of sceptres and of crowns hudibras canto one i have been asked if i am serious in my conjecture that the meteor beard of hudibras might have given birth to the bard of gray i reply that the burlesque and the sublime are extremes and extremes meet how often does it merely depend on our own state of mind and on our own taste to consider the sublime as burlesque 
a very vulgar but acute genius thomas paine whom we may suppose destitute of all delicacy and refinement has conveyed to us a notion of the sublime as it is probably experienced by ordinary and uncultivated minds and even by acute and judicious ones who are destitute of imagination he tells us that the sublime and the ridiculous are often so nearly related that it is difficult to class them separately one step above the sublime makes the ridiculous and one step above the ridiculous makes the sublime again may i venture to illustrate this opinion would it not appear the ridiculous or burlesque to describe the sublime revolution of the earth on her axle round the sun by comparing it with the action of a top flogged by a boy and yet some of the most exquisite lines in milton do this the poet only alluding in his mind to the top the earth he describes whether she from west her silent course advance with inoffensive pace that spinning sleeps on her soft axle while she paces even be this as it may it has never i believe been remarked to return to gray that when he conceived the idea of the beard of his bard he had in his mind the language of milton who describes azazel sublimely unfurling the imperial ensign which full high advanced shone like a meteor streaming to the wind paradise lost b one verse five hundred thirty five very similar to gray's streamed like a meteor to the troubled air gray has been severely censured by johnson for the expression give ample room and verge enough the characters of hell to trace the bard on the authority of the most unpoetical of critics we must still hear that the poet has no line so bad ample room is feeble but would have passed unobserved in any other poem but in the poetry of gray who has taught us to admit nothing but what is exquisite verge enough is poetical since it conveys a material image to the imagination no one appears to have detected the source from whence probably the whole line was derived i am inclined to think it was from the following passage in dryden let fortune empty her whole quiver on me i have a soul that like an ample shield can take in all and verge enough for more dryden's don sebastian gray in his elegy has even in our ashes live their wonted fires this line is so obscure that it is difficult to apply it to what precedes it mason in his edition in vain attempts to derive it from a thought of petrarch and still more vainly attempts to amend it wakefield expends an octavo page to paraphrase this single verse from the following lines of chaucer one would imagine gray caught the recollected idea the old reef in his prologue says of himself and of old men for one we may not dawn than we spaken yet in our ashen cold is fire ereken terwitz chaucer volume one page one hundred fifty three verse three thousand eight hundred seventy nine gray has a very expressive word highly poetical but i think not common for who to dumb forgetfulness a prey daniel has as quoted in cooper's muses library and in himself with sorrow does complain the misery of dark forgetfulness a line of popes in his dunciad high-born howard echoed in the ear of gray when he gave with all the artifice of alliteration high-born howell's harp johnson bitterly censures gray for giving to adjectives the termination of participles such as the cultured plain the daisied bank but he solemnly adds i was sorry to see in the line of a scholar like gray the honeyed spring had johnson received but the faintest tincture of the rich italian school of english poetry he would never have formed so tasteless a criticism honeyed is employed by milton in more places than one hide me from day's garish eye while the bee with honeyed thigh penseroso verse one hundred forty two the celebrated stanza in gray's elegy seems partly to be borrowed full many a gem of purest ray serene the dark unfathomed eaves of ocean bear full many a flower is torn to blush unseen and waste its sweetness in the desert air pope had said they're kept by charms concealed from mortal eye like roses that in deserts bloom and die rape of the lock young says of nature in distant wilds by human eye unseen she rears her flowers and spreads her velvet green 
pure gurgling rills the lonely desert trace and waste their music on the savage race and shenstone has and like the desert's lily bloom to fade elegy four gray was so fond of this pleasing imagery that he repeats it in his ode to the installation and mason echoes it in his ode to memory milton thus paints the evening sun if chance the radiant sun with farewell sweet extends his evening beam the fields revive the birds their notes renew etc paradise lost b two verse four hundred ninety two can there be a doubt that he borrowed this beautiful farewell from an obscure poet quoted by poole in his english parnassus sixteen fifty seven the date of milton's great work i find since admits the conjecture the first edition being that of sixteen sixty nine the homely lines in poole are these to thetis watery bowers the sun doth high bidding farewell unto the gloomy sky young in his love of fame very adroitly improves on a witty conceit of butler it is curious to observe that while butler had made a remote allusion of a window to a pillory a conceit is grafted on this conceit with even more exquisite wit each window like the pillory appears with heads thrust through nailed by the ears hudibras part two canto three verse three hundred and one an opera like a pillory may be said to nail our ears down and expose our head young's satires in the duenna we find this thought differently illustrated by no means imitative though the satire is congenial don jerome alluding to the serenader says these amorous orgies that steal the senses in the hearing as they say egyptian embalmers serve mummies extracting the brain through the ears the wit is original but the subject is the same in three passages the whole turning on the allusion to the head and to the ears when pope composed the following lines on fame how vain that second life in others breath the estate which wits inherit after death ease health and life for this they must resign unsure the tenure but how vast the fine temple of fame he seems to have had present in his mind a single idea of butler by which he has very richly amplified the entire imagery butler says honour is a lease for lives to come and cannot be extended from the legal tenant hudibras part one canto three verse thousand forty three the same thought may be found in sir george mackenzie's essay on preferring solitude to public employment first published in sixteen sixty five Hudibras preceded it by two years. The thought is strongly expressed by the eloquent Mackenzie. Fame is a revenue payable only to our ghosts, and to deny ourselves all present satisfaction, or to expose ourselves to so much hazard for this, were as great madness as to starve ourselves, or fight desperately for food, to be laid on our tombs after our death. Dryden, in his Absalom and Achitophel, says of the Earl of Shaftesbury, David for him his tuneful harp had strung, and heaven had wanted one immortal song. This verse was ringing in the ear of Pope, when with equal modesty and felicity he adopted it in addressing his friend Dr. Arbuthnot. Friend of my life, which did not you prolong, the world had wanted many an idle song. Howell has prefixed to his letters a tedious poem, written in the taste of the times, and he there says of letters that they are the heralds and sweet harbingers that move from east to west on embassies of love they can the tropic cut and cross the line it is probable that pope had noted this thought for the following lines seem a beautiful heightening of the idea heaven first taught letters for some wretch's aid some banished lover or some captive maid then he adds they speed the soft intercourse from soul to soul and waft a sigh from indus to the pole eloisa there is another passage in howell's letters which has a great affinity with the thought of pope who in the rape of the lock says fair tresses man's imperial race and snare and beauty draws us with a single hair howell writes page two hundred and ninety tis a powerful sex they were too strong for the first the strongest and the wisest man that was they must needs be strong when one hair of a woman can draw more than a hundred pair of oxen 
pope's description of the death of the lamb in his essay on man is finished with the nicest touches and is one of the finest pictures our poetry exhibits even familiar as it is to our ear we never examine it but with undiminished admiration the lamb thy riot dooms to bleed to-day had he thy reason would he skip and play pleased to the last he crops the flowery food and licks the hand just raised to shed his blood after pausing on the last two fine verses will not the reader smile that i should conjecture the image might originally have been discovered in the following humble verses in a poem once considered not as contemptible a gentle lamb has rhetoric to plead and when she sees the butcher's knife decreed her voice entreats him not to make her bleed dr king's mully of mount town this natural and affecting image might certainly have been observed by pope without his having perceived it through the less polished lens of the telescope of dr king it is however a similarity though it may not be an imitation and is given as an example of that art in composition which can ornament the humblest conception like the graceful vest thrown over naked and sordid beggary i consider the following lines as strictly copied by thomas wharton the daring artist explored the pangs that rent the royal breast those wounds that lurk beneath the tissued vest thomas wharton on shakespeare sir philip sidney in his defence of poesy has the same image he writes tragedy openeth the greatest wounds and showeth forth the ulcers that are covered with tissue the same appropriation of thought will attach to the following lines of tickle while the charmed reader with thy thought complies and views thy rosamond with henry's eyes tickle to addison evidently from the french horace en vain contre les sites un ministre se ligue tout paris pour chimène a les yeux de rodrigue boileau oldham the satirist says in his satires upon the jesuits that had cain been of this black fraternity he had not been content with a quarter of mankind had he been jesuit had he but put on their savage cruelty the rest had gone satire too doubtless at that moment echoed in his poetical ear the energetic and caustic epigram of andrew marvel against blood stealing the crown dressed in a parson's cassock and sparing the life of the keeper with the priest's vestment had he but put on the prelate's cruelty the crown had gone the following passages seem echoes to each other and it is but justice due to oldham the satirist to acknowledge him as the parent of this antithesis on butler who can think without just rage the glory and the scandal of the age satire against poetry it seems evidently borrowed by pope when he applies the thought to erasmus at length erasmus the great injured name the glory of the priesthood and the shame young remembered the antithesis when he said of some for glory such the boundless rage that they're the blackest scandal of the age voltaire a great reader of pope seems to have borrowed part of the expression scandale d'eglise et des rois le modèle de caux an old french poet in one of his moral poems on an hourglass inserted in modern collections has many ingenious thoughts that this poem was read and admired by goldsmith the following beautiful image seems to indicate de caux comparing the world to his hourglass says beautifully c'est un verre qui lui qu'un souffle peut détruire et qu'un souffle a produit goldsmith applies the thought very happily princes and lords may flourish or may fade a breath can make them as a breath has made i do not know whether we might not read for modern copies are sometimes incorrect a breath unmakes them as a breath has made thompson in his pastoral story of palamon and lavinia appears to have copied a passage from otway palamon thus addresses lavinia oh let me now into a richer soil transplant thee safe where vernal suns and showers diffuse their warmest largest influence and of my garden be the pride and joy chamon employs the same image when speaking of monimia he says you took her up a little tender flower and with a careful loving hand transplanted her into your own fair garden 
where the sun always shines the origin of the following imagery is undoubtedly grecian but it is still embellished and modified by our best poets while universal pan knit with the graces and the hours in dance let on the eternal spring paradise lost thompson probably caught this strain of imagery sudden to heaven thence weary vision turns where leading soft the silent hours of love with purest ray sweet venus shines summer verse one thousand six hundred ninety two gray in repeating this imagery has borrowed a remarkable epithet from milton lo where the rosy bosomed hours fair venus train appear ode to spring along the crisped shades and bowers revels the spruce and jocund spring the graces and the rosy bosomed hours thither all their bounty spring comus verse nine hundred eighty four collins in his ode to fear whom he associates with danger there grandly personified was i think considerably indebted to the following stanza of spencer next him was fear all armed from top to toe yet thought himself not safe enough thereby but feared each sudden movement to and fro and his own arms when glittering he did spy or clashing heard he fast away did fly as ashes pale of yew and wingy heeled and evermore on danger fixed his eye gainst whom he always bent the brazen shield which his right hand unarmed fearfully did wield fairy queen b three canto twelve stanza twelve warm from its perusal he seems to have seized it as a hint to the ode to fear and in his passions to have very finely copied an idea here first fear his hand his skill to try amid the course bewildered laid and back recoiled he knew not why even at the sound himself had made o oh, to the passions the stanza in beatty's minstrel first book in which his visionary boy after the storm of summer rain views the rainbow brighten to the setting sun and runs to reach it fond fool that deems the streaming glory nigh how vain the chase thine ardour has begun this fled afar ere half thy purposed race be run thus it fares with age etc the same train of thought and imagery applied to the same subject though the image itself be somewhat different may be found in the poems of the platonic john norris a writer who has great originality of thought and a highly poetical spirit his stanza runs thus so to the unthinking boy the distant sky seems on some mountain surface to rely he with ambitious haste climbs the ascent curious to touch the firmament but when with an unwearied pace he is arrived at the long wished for place with sighs the sad defeat he does deplore his heaven is still as distant as before the infidel by john norris in the modern tragedy of the castle spectre is this fine description of the ghost of evelina suddenly a female form glided along the vault i flew towards her my arms were already unclosed to clasp her when suddenly her figure changed her face grew pale a stream of blood gushed from her bosom while speaking her form withered away the flesh fell from her bones a skeleton loathsome and meagre clasped me in her mouldering arms her infected breath was mingled with mine her rotting fingers pressed my hand and my face was covered with her kisses oh then how i trembled with disgust there is undoubtedly singular merit in this description i shall contrast it with one which the french virgil has written in an age whose faith was stronger in ghosts than ours yet which perhaps had less skill in describing them there are some circumstances which seem to indicate that the author of the castle spectre lighted his torch at the altar of the french muse athalia thus narrates her dream in which the spectre of jezebel her mother appears c'est toi pendant l'horreur d'une profonde nuit ma mère jezabel devant moi s'est montrée comme au jour de sa mort pompeusement parée en achevant ces mots épouvantables son ombre vers mon lit apparut se baisser et moi je lis ton doigt les mains pour l'embrasser mais je n'ai plus trouvé qu'un horrible mélange d'eau et de chair meurtrie 
et traîner dans la fange des lambeaux pleins de sang et des membres affreux. Racines Atali, Act Two, Scene Five. Goldsmith, when in his pedestrian tour he sat amidst the Alps, as he paints himself in his traveller, and felt himself the solitary neglected genius he was, desolate amidst the surrounding scenery, probably at that moment applied to himself the following beautiful imagery of Thomson. As in the hollow breast of Apennine, beneath the centre of encircling hills, a myrtle rises far from human eyes, and breathes its balmy fragrance over the wild. Autumn, verse 202. Goldsmith very pathetically applies a similar image. Even now, when alpine solitudes ascend, I sit me down a pensive hour to spend, like yon neglected shrub at random cast that shades the steep and sighs at every blast. Traveller. Akenside illustrates the native impulse of genius by a simile of Memnon's marble statue sounding its lyre at the touch of the sun. For as old Memnon's image, long renowned, by fabling Nihilus to the quivering touch of Titan's ray, with each repulsive string consenting, sounded through the warbling air, unbidden strains, even so did nature's hand, etc. It is remarkable that the same image, which does not appear obvious enough to have been the common inheritance of poets, is precisely used by old Rignier, the first French satirist, in the dedication of his satires to the French king. Louis XIV supplies the place of nature to the courtly satirist. These are his words. On lit qu'en Éthiope, il y a voit une statue qui rend doit un son harmonieux, toutes les fois que le soleil levant la regardoit. Ce même miracle, sire, avez-vous fait en moi, qui touché de l'astre de votre majesté, et reçu la voix et la parole. In that sublime passage in Pope's Essay on Man, Epistola 1, verse 237, beginning, Vast chain of being, which from God began, and proceeds to, From nature's chain, whatever link you strike, tenth or ten thousandth breaks the chain alike. Pope seems to have caught the idea and image from Waller, whose last verse is as fine as any in the essay on man. The chain that's fixed to the throne of Jove, on which the fabric of our world depends, one link dissolved, the whole creation ends. Of the danger his majesty escaped, etc. Verse 168. It has been observed by Thayer that Milton borrowed the expression imbrowned and brown, which he applies to the evening shade, from the Italian. See Thayer's elegant note in B4, verse 246, and where the unpierced shade imbrowned the noontide bowers, and B9, verse 1086, where highest woods impenetrable to sun or starlight spread their umbrage broad and brown as evening. Falim Bruno is an expression used by the Italians to denote the approach of the evening. Boyardo, Ariosto and Tasso have made a very picturesque use of this term, noticed by Thayer. I doubt if it be applicable to our colder climate, but Thompson appears to have been struck by the fine effect it produces in poetical landscape, for he has, with quickened step, brown night retires. Summer, verse 51. If the epithet be true, it cannot be more appropriately applied than in the season he describes, which most resembles the genial clime with the deep serenity of an Italian heaven. Milton in Italy had experienced the brown evening, but it may be suspected that Thompson only recollected the language of the poet. The same observation may be made on two other poetical epithets. I shall notice the epithet laughing applied to inanimate objects and purple to beautiful objects. The natives of Italy and the softer climates receive emotions from the views of their waters in the spring not equally experienced in the British roughness of our skies. The fluency and softness of the water are thus described by Lucretius. Tibi suava is daida latellus, submitted flores. Tibi rident, aequora ponti. Inelegantly rendered by Creech. The roughest sea puts on smooth looks and smiles. Dryden, more happily, the ocean smiles and smooths her wavy breast. But Metastasio has copied Lucretius. A te fioriscono gli erbosi prat, e i flutti ridono nel mar placati. 
it merits observation that the northern poets could not exalt their imagination higher than that the water smiled while the modern italian having before his eyes a different spring found no difficulty in agreeing with the ancients that the waves laughed modern poetry has made a very free use of the animating epithet laughing gray has laughing flowers and langhorne in two beautiful lines personifies flora where tweed's soft banks in liberal beauty lie and flora laughs beneath an azure sky sir william jones in the spirit of oriental poetry has the laughing air dryden has employed this epithet boldly in the delightful lines almost entirely borrowed from his original chaucer the morning lark the messenger of day saluted in her song the morning gray and soon the sun arose with beams so bright that all the horizon laughed to see the joyous sight palamon and arcite b two footnote the old poet is the most fresh and powerful in his words the passage is thus given in wright's edition the busy lark messenger of day saluteth in her song the morrow gray and fiery phoebus rises up so bright that all the orient laugheth of the light lee hunt remarks with justice that dryden falls short of the freshness and feeling of the sentiment his lines are beautiful but they do not come home to us with so happy and cordial a face End of footnote. it is extremely difficult to conceive what the ancients precisely meant by the word purpureus they seem to have designed by it anything bright and beautiful a classical friend has furnished me with numerous significations of this word which are very contradictory albinovanus in his elegy on livia mentions nivem purpureum catullus quercus ramus purpureus horus purpureo bibet ore nectar and somewhere mentions olores purpureos virgil has purpuream vomit ille animam and homer calls the sea purple and gives it in some other book the same epithet when in a storm the general idea however has been fondly adopted by the finest writers in europe the purple of the ancients is not known to us what idea therefore have the moderns affixed to it edison in his vision of the temple of fame describes the country as being covered with a kind of purple light gray's beautiful line is well known the bloom of young desire and purple light of love and tasso in describing his hero godfrey says heaven li empie d'onor la faccia e vi riduce di giovinezza il bel purpureo lume both gray and tasso copied virgil where venus gives to her son aeneas lumen quo juventae purpureum dryden has omitted the purple light in his version nor is it given by pitt but dryden expresses the general idea by with hands divine had formed his curling locks and made his temples shine and given his rolling eyes a sparkling grace it is probable that milton has given us his idea of what was meant by this purple light when applied to the human countenance in the felicitous expression of celestial rosy red gray appears to me to be indebted to milton for a hint for the opening of his elegy as in the first line he had dante and milton in his mind he perhaps might also in the following passage have recollected a congenial one in comus which he altered milton describing the evening marks it out by what time the laboured ox in his loose traces from the furrow came and the swinged hedger at his supper set gray has the lowing herd winds slowly over the lee the ploughman homeward plods his weary way wharton has made an observation on this passage in comus and observes further that it is a classical circumstance but not a natural one in an english landscape for our ploughmen quit their work at noon i think therefore the imitation is still more evident and as wharton observes both gray and milton copied here from books and not from life there are three great poets who have given us a similar incident dryden introduces the highly finished picture of the hare in his annus mirabilis stanza one hundred thirty one so i have seen some fearful hare maintain a course till tired before the dog she lay who stretched behind her pants upon the plain past power to kill as she to get away one hundred thirty two with his loll tongue he faintly licks his prey his warm breath blows her flicks up as she lies 
she trembling creeps upon the ground away and looks back to him with beseeching eyes thompson paints the stag in a similar situation fainting breathless toil sick seizes on his heart he stands at bay the big round tears run down his dappled face he groans in anguish autumn verse four hundred fifty one shakespeare exhibits the same object the wretched animal heaved forth such groans that their discharge did stretch his leathern coat almost to bursting and the big round tears coursed one another down his innocent nose in piteous chase of these three pictures the beseeching eyes of dryden perhaps is more pathetic than the big round tears certainly borrowed by thomson from shakespeare because the former expression has more passion and is therefore more poetical the sixth line in dryden is perhaps exquisite for its imitative harmony and with peculiar felicity paints the action itself thomson adroitly drops the innocent nose of which one word seems to have lost its original signification and the other offends now by its familiarity the dappled face is a term more picturesque more appropriate and more poetically expressed end of section twenty six Section 26 of Curiosities of Literature, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. Curiosities of Literature volume two by isaac desraeli explanation of the facsimile the manuscripts of pope's version of the iliad and odyssey are preserved in the british museum in three volumes the gift of david mallet they are written chiefly on the backs of letters amongst which are several from addison Steele, gervais roe young carl Walsh, Sir Godfrey Neller, Fenton, Craigs, Congreve, Hughes, his mother, Editha, and Lito, and Tonson, the booksellers. Footnote. This use of what most persons would consider waste paper obtained for the poet the designation of paper-sparing pope. End of footnote. From these letters, no information can be gathered which merits public communication. They relate generally to the common civilities and common affairs of life. What little could be done has already been given in the additions to Pope's works. It has been observed that Pope taught himself to write by copying printed books. Of this singularity we have in this collection a remarkable instance. Several parts are written in Roman and Italic characters, which for some time I mistook for print. No imitation can be more correct. What appears on this facsimile I have printed to assist its deciphering, and I have also subjoined the passage as it was given to the public for immediate reference. The manuscript from whence this page is taken consists of the first rude sketches, an intermediate copy having been employed for the press, so that the corrected verses of this facsimile occasionally vary from those published. This passage has been selected because the parting of Hector and Andromache is perhaps the most pleasing episode in the Iliad, while it is confessedly one of the most finished passages. The lover of poetry will not be a little gratified when he contemplates the variety of epithets, the imperfect idea, the gradual embellishment, and the critical erasures which are here discovered. Footnote. Dr. Johnson, in noticing the manuscript of Milton, preserved to Cambridge, has made, with his usual force of language, the following observation, quote, Such relics show how excellence is acquired. What we hope ever to do with ease, we may learn first to do with diligence. End, quote. End of footnote. The action of Hector, in lifting his infant in his arms, occasioned Pope much trouble, and at length the printed copy has a different reading. I must not omit noticing 
that the whole is on the back of a letter franked by Addison, which cover I have given at one corner of the plate. The parts distinguished by italics were rejected. Thus having spoke, the illustrious chief of Troy extends his eager arms to embrace his boy. Lovely, stretched his fond arms to seize the beauteous boy. Babe, the boy clung crying to his nurse's breast, scared at the dazzling helm and nodding crest. Each kind, with silent pleasure, the fond parent smiled, and Hector hastened to relieve his child. The glittering terrors unbound, his radiant helmet from his brows, unbraced on the ground, he, and on the ground the glittering terror placed, beamy, and placed the radiant helmet on the ground. Then seized the boy, and raising him in air, lifting, then fondling in his arms, his infant heir, dancing. Thus to the gods addressed a father's prayer. Glory fills, O thou whose thunder shakes thy ethereal throne, deathless, and all ye other powers protect my son. Like mine this war, blooming youth with every virtue blessed, grace, the shield and glory of the Trojan race. Like mine his valor, and his just renown, like mine his labors to defend the crown. Grant him, like me, to purchase just renown, the Trojans, to guard my country, to defend the crown, in arms like me, his country's war to wage. And rise the Hector of the future age, against his country's foes the war to wage. And rise the Hector of the future age, successful so when triumph from the glorious toils of heroes slain he bears the reeking spoils whole hosts may all troy shall hail him with deserved acclaim own the sun and cry this chief transcends his father's fame while pleased amidst the general shouts of troy his mother's conscious heart o'erflows with joy fondly on her he said and gazing o'er his consort's charms, restored his infant to her longing arms, on soft in her fragrant breast the babe she laid, pressed to her heart, and with a smile surveyed, to repose, hushed him to rest, and with a smile surveyed passion. But soon the troubled pleasure, mixed with rising fears, dashed with fear, the tender pleasure soon, chastised by fear, she mingled with the smile a tender tear the passage appears thus in the printed work i have marked in italics the variations thus having spoke the illustrious chief of troy stretched his fond arms to clasp the lovely boy the babe clung crying to his nurse's breast scared at the dazzling helm and nodding crest with secret pleasure each fond parent smiled footnote silent in the manuscript observes a critical friend is greatly superior to secret as it appears in the printed work End of footnote. and hector hasted to relieve his child the glittering terrors from his brows unbound and placed the beaming helmet on the ground then kissed the child and lifting high in air thus to the gods preferred a father's prayer O thou whose glory fills the ethereal throne, and all ye deathless powers protect my son, grant him like me to purchase just renown, to guard the Trojans, to defend the crown, against his country's foes the war to wage, and rise the Hector of the future age. So when, triumphant from successful toils, of heroes slain he bears the reeking spoils, whole hosts may hail him with deserved acclaim and say this chief transcends his father's fame while pleased admits the general shouts of troy his mother's conscious heart o'erflows with joy he spoke and fondly gazing on her charms restored the pleasing burden to her arms soft on her fragrant breast the babe she laid hushed to repose 
and with a smile surveyed the troubled pleasure soon chastised by fear she mingled with the smile of a tender tear end of section twenty six recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida section twenty seven of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by jason in panama curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli literary fashions there is such a thing as literary fashion and prose and verse have been regulated by the same caprice that cuts our coats and cocks our hats dr kippis who had a taste for literary history has observed that dodsley's economy of human life long received the most extravagant applause from the supposition that it was written by a celebrated nobleman an instance of the power of literary fashion the history of which as it hath appeared in various ages and countries and as it hath operated with respect to the different objects of science learning art and taste would form a work that might be highly instructive and entertaining the favourable reception of dodsley's economy of human life produced a whole family of economies it was soon followed by a second part the gratuitous ingenuity of one of those officious imitators whom an original author never cares to thank. Other economies trod on the heels of each other. For some memoranda towards a history of literary fashions, the following may be arranged. At the restoration of letters in Europe, commentators and compilers were at the head of the literati. Translators followed, who enriched themselves with their spoils on the commentators. When in the progress of modern literature, writers aimed to rival the great authors of antiquity the different styles in their servile imitations clashed together and parties were formed who fought desperately for the style they chose to adopt the public were long harassed by a fantastic race who called themselves ciceronian of whom are recorded many ridiculous practices to strain out the words of cicero into their hollow verbosities they were routed by the facetious erasmus then followed the brilliant era of epigrammatic points and good sense and good taste were nothing without the spurious ornaments of false wit another age was deluged by a million of sonnets and volumes were for a long time read without their readers being aware that their patience was exhausted there was an age of epics which probably can never return again for after two or three the rest can be but repetitions with a few variations in italy from fifteen thirty to fifteen eighty a vast multitude of books were written on love the fashion of writing on that subject for certainly it was not always a passion with the indefatigable writer was an epidemical distemper they wrote like pedants and pagans those who could not write their love in verse diffused themselves in prose when the polyphilus of colonna appeared which is given in the form of a dream this dream made a great many dreamers as it happens in company says the sarcastic zeno when one yawner makes many yawn when bishop hall first published his satires he called them toothless satires but his latter ones he distinguished as biting satires many good-natured men who could only write good-natured verse crowded in his footsteps and the abundance of their labours only showed that even the toothless satires of hall could bite more sharply than those of servile imitators after spencer's fairy queen was published the press overflowed with many mistaken imitations in which fairies were the chief actors this circumstance is humorously animadverted on by marston in his satires as quoted by wharton every scribe now falls asleep and in his dreams straight ten pound to one outsteps some fairy awakes straight rubs his eyes and prints his tail the great personage who gave a fashion to this class of literature was the courtly and romantic elizabeth herself 
her obsequious wits and courtiers would not fail to feed and flatter her taste whether they all felt the beauties or languished over the tediousness of the fairy queen and the arcadia of sydney at least her majesty gave a vogue to such sentimental and refined romance the classical elizabeth introduced another literary fashion having translated the hercules Oedicus, she made it fashionable to translate greek tragedies there was a time in the age of fanaticism and the long parliament that books were considered the more valuable for their length the seventeenth century was the age of folios carroll wrote commentary on job in two volumes folio of above one thousand two hundred sheets as it was intended to inculcate the virtue of patience these volumes gave at once the theory and the practice one is astonished at the multitude of the divines of this age whose works now lie buried under the brick and mortar tombs of four or five folios which on a moderate calculation might now be wire woven into thirty or forty modern octavos in charles the first's time love and honour were heightened by the wits into florid romance but lord goring turned all into ridicule and he was followed by the duke of buckingham whose happy vein of ridicule was favoured by charles the second who gave it the vogue it obtained sir william temple justly observes that changes in veins of wit are like those of habits or other modes on the return of charles the second none were more out of fashion among the new courtiers than the old earl of norwich who was esteemed the greatest wit in his father's time among the old modern times have abounded with what may be called fashionable literature tragedies were some years ago as fashionable as comedies are at this day thomas mallet francis hill applied their genius to a department in which they lost it all footnote the great feature of the modern stage within the last twenty years has been the classical burlesque drama which though originating in the last century in such plays as midas really reached its culmination under the auspices of madame vestris End of footnote. Declamation and rant, and over-refined language, were preferred to the fable, the manners, and to nature, and those now sleep on our shelves. Then, too, we had a family of paupers in the parish of poetry, in imitations of Spencer. Not many years ago, Churchill was the occasion of deluging the town with political poems in quarto. These, again, were succeeded by narrative poems, in the ballad measure, from all sizes of poets. The castle of Otranto was the father of that marvellous, which once overstocked the circulating library and closed with Mrs. Radcliffe. Lord Byron has been the father of hundreds of graceless sons. Travels and voyages have long been a class of literature so fashionable that we began to prepare for, or to dread, the arrival of certain persons from the continent different times then are regulated by different tastes what makes a strong impression on the public at one time ceases to interest it at another an author who sacrifices to the prevailing humours of his day has but little chance of being esteemed by posterity and every age of modern literature might perhaps admit a new classification by dividing it into its periods of fashionable literature End of section 27section 28 of curiosities of literature volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org curiosities of literature volume 2 by isaac disraeli the pantomimical characters il est des gens de qui l'esprit guendé sous un front jamais déridé ne souffre n'approuve et n'estime que la pompe et le sublime pour moi j'ose poser en fait quand de certains moments l'esprit le plus parfait peut aimer sans rougir jusqu'aux marionnettes et qu'il est des thèmes et des lieux 
où le grave et le sérieux ne valent pas d'agréables sonnettes. Poe, Don. People there are who never smile, their foreheads still unsmooth the while. Some lambent flame of mirth will play that wins the easy heart away. Such only choose in prose or rhyme a bristling pomp they call sublime. I blush not to like Harlequin, would he but talk and all his kin yes there are times and there are places when flams and old wives tales are worth the graces cervantes in the person of his hero has confessed the delight he received from amusements which disturb the gravity of some who are apt however to be more entertained by them than they choose to acknowledge don quixote thus dismisses a troop of merry strollers andad con dios buente gente y hazard vestra fiesta porque desde muchacho fui aficionado a la caratula y en mi mocedad nece ne iban los ojos tras la farandula in a literal version the passage may run thus go good people god be with you and keep your merry-making for from childhood i was in love with the caratula and in my youth my eyes would lose themselves amidst the farandula according to pineda la caratula is an actor masked and la farandula is a kind of farce footnote Mateau, whose translation lord woodhouse lee distinguishes as the most curious turns the passage thus i wish you well good people drive on to act your play for in my very childhood i love shows and have been a great admirer of dramatic representations part two canto eleven the other translators have nearly the same words but in employing the generic term they lose the species that is the thing itself but what is less tolerable in the flatness of the style they lose that delightfulness with which cervantes conveys to us the recollected pleasures than busying the warm brain of his hero an english reader who often grows weary over his quixote appears not always sensible that one of the secret charms of cervantes like all great national authors lies concealed in his idiom and style End of footnote. even the studious bale wrapping himself in his cloak and hurrying to the market-place to punchinello would laugh when the fellow had humour in him as was usually the case and i believe the pleasure some still find in pantomimes to the annoyance of their gravity is a very natural one and only wants a little more understanding in the actors and the spectators footnote the author of the descriptive letter-press to george cruikshank's illustrations of punch says he saw the late mr wyndham then one of the secretaries of state on his way from downing street to the house of commons on the night of an important debate pause like a truant boy until the whole performance was concluded to enjoy a hearty laugh at the whimsicalities of the motley hero End of footnote. the truth is that here our harlequin and all his lifeless family are condemned to perpetual silence they came to us from the genial hilarity of the italian theatre and were all the grotesque children of wit and whim and satire why is this burlesque race here privileged to cost so much to do so little and to repeat that little so often our own pantomime may indeed boast of two inventions of its own growth we have turned harlequin into a magician and this produces the surprise of sudden changes of scenery whose splendour and curious correctness have rarely been equalled while in the metamorphosis of the scene a certain sort of wit to the eye mechanic wit as it has been termed has originated as when a surgeon's shop is turned into a laundry with the inscription mangling done here or counsellors at the bar changed into fishwomen every one of this grotesque family were the creatures of national genius chosen by the people for themselves italy both ancient and modern exhibits a gesticulating people of comedians and the same comic genius characterized the nation through all its revolutions as well as the individual through all his fortunes the lower classes still betray their aptitude in that vivid humour where the action is suited to the word silent gestures sometimes expressing whole sentences they can tell a story and even raise the passions without opening their lips 
no nation in modern europe possesses so keen a relish for the burlesque insomuch as to show a class of unrivalled poems which are distinguished by the very title and perhaps there never was an italian in a foreign country however deep in trouble but would drop all remembrance of his sorrow should one of his countrymen present himself with the paraphernalia of punch at the corner of a street i was acquainted with an italian a philosopher and a man of fortune residing in this country who found so lively a pleasure in performing punchinello's little comedy that for this purpose with considerable expense and curiosity he had his wooden company in all their costumes sent over from his native place the shrill squeak of the tin whistle had the same comic effect on him as the notes of the rans des vaches have in awakening the tenderness of domestic emotions in the wandering swiss the national genius is dramatic lady wortley montague when she resided at a villa near brescia was applied to by the villagers for leave to erect a theatre in her saloon they had been accustomed to turn the stables into a playhouse every carnival she complied and as she tells us was surprised at the beauty of their scenes though painted by a country painter the performance was yet more surprising the actors being all peasants but the italians have so natural a genius for comedy they acted as well as if they had been brought up to nothing else particularly the arlequina who far surpassed any of our english though only the tailor of our village and i am assured never saw a play in any other place italy is the mother and the nurse of the whole harlequin race hence it is that no scholars in europe but the most learned italians smit by the national genius could have devoted their vigils to narrate the revolutions of pantomime to compile the annals of harlequin to unroll the genealogy of punch and to discover even the most secret anecdotes of the obscure branches of that grotesque family amidst their changeful fortunes during a period of two thousand years nor is this all princes have ranked them among the rosciuses and harlequins and scaramouches have been ennobled even harlequins themselves have written elaborate treatises on the almost insurmountable difficulties of their art i despair to convey the sympathy they have inspired me with to my reader but every tramontane genius must be informed that of what he has never seen he must rest content to be told of the ancient italian troop we have retained three or four of the characters while their origin has nearly escaped our recollection but of the burlesque comedy the extempore dialogue the humorous fable and its peculiar species of comic acting all has vanished many of the popular pastimes of the romans unquestionably survived their dominion for the people will amuse themselves though their masters may be conquered and tradition has never proved more faithful than in preserving popular sports many of the games of our children were played by roman boys the mountebanks with the dancers and tumblers on their movable stages still in our fairs are roman the disorders of the bacchanalia italy appears to imitate in her carnivals among these roman diversions certain comic characters have been transmitted to us along with some of their characteristics and their dresses the speaking pantomimes and extemporal comedies which have delighted the italians for many centuries are from this ancient source footnote rich in his companion to the latin diction has an excellent illustration of this passage this art was of very great antiquity and much practised by the greeks and romans both on the stage and in the tribune induced by their habit of addressing large assemblies in the open air where it would have been impossible for the majority to comprehend what was said without the assistance of some conventional signs which enabled the speaker to address himself to the eye as well as the ear of the audience these were chiefly made by certain positions of the hands and fingers the meaning of which was universally recognized and familiar to all classes and the practice itself reduced to a regular system as it remains at the present time amongst the populace of naples who will carry on a long conversation between themselves by mere gesticulation without pronouncing a word 
that many of these signs are similar to those used by the ancients is proved by the same author who copies from an antique vase a scene which he explains by the action of the hands of the figures adding a common lazzaroni when shown one of these compositions will at once explain the purport of the action which a scholar with all his learning cannot divine the gesture to signify love employed by the ancients and modern neapolitans was joining the tips of the thumb and forefinger of the left hand an imputation or asseveration by holding forth the right hand a denial by raising the same hand extending the fingers in mediaeval works of art a particular attitude of the fingers is adopted to exhibit malicious hate it is done by crossing the forefinger of each hand and is generally seen in figures of herod or judas iscariot End of, footnote. of the mimi and the pantomimi of the romans the following notices enter into our present researches the mimi were an impudent race of buffoons who exulted in mimicry and like our domestic fools were admitted into convivial parties to entertain the guests from them we derive the term mimetic art their powers enabled them to perform a more extraordinary office for they appear to have been introduced into funerals to mimic the person and even the language of the deceased suetonius describes an archimimus accompanying the funeral of vespasian this arch mime performed his part admirably not only representing the person but imitating according to custom ut est mos the manners and language of the living emperor he contrived a happy stroke at the prevailing foible of vespasian when he inquired the cost of all this funeral pomp ten millions of sesterces on this he observed that if they would give him but a hundred thousand they might throw his body into the tiber the pantomimi were quite of a different class they were tragic actors usually mute they combined with the arts of gesture music and dances of the most impressive character their silent language often drew tears by the pathetic emotions which they excited their very nod speaks their hands talk and their fingers have a voice says one of their admirers seneca the father grave as was his profession confessed his taste for pantomimes had become a passion and by the decree of the senate that the roman knight should not attend the pantomimic plays in the streets it is evident that the performers were greatly honoured lucian has composed a curious treatise on pantomimes we may have some notion of their deep conception of character and their invention by an anecdote recorded by macrobius of two rival pantomimes when hylas dancing a hymn which closed with the words the great agamemnon to express that idea he took it in its literal meaning and stood erect as if measuring his size pylades his rival exclaimed you make him tall but not great the audience obliged pylades to dance the same hymn when he came to the words he collected himself in a posture of deep meditation this silent pantomimic language we ourselves have witnessed carried to singular perfection when the actor palmer after building a theatre was prohibited the use of his voice by the magistrates it was then he powerfully affected the audience by the eloquence of his action in the tragic pantomime of don juan Footnote this measure of restrictive policy which gave to the patent theatres the sole right of performing the legitimate drama properly led to the construction of plays for the minor theatres entirely carried on by action occasionally aided by inscriptions painted on scrolls and unrolled and exhibited by the actor when his power of expressing such words failed this led to the education of a series of pantomimists who taught action conventionally to represent words at the close of the last century there were many such and the reader who may be curious to see the nature of these dumb dramas may do so in two volumes named circusiana by j c cross the author of very many that were performed at the royal circus in st george's fields the whole action of the drama was performed to music composed expressly to aid the expression of the performers among the best of whom were bologna and Dejvia. it is a class of dramatic art which has now almost entirely passed away or is seen but in a minor degree in the pantomimic action of a grand ballet at the opera End of footnote. these pantomimi seem to have been held in great 
honour many were children of the graces and the virtues the tragic and the comic masks were among the ornaments of the sepulchral monuments of an arch mime and a pantomime montfaucon conjectures that they formed a select fraternity they had such an influence over the roman people that when two of them quarrelled augustus interfered to renew their friendship pylades was one of them and he observed to the emperor that nothing could be more useful to him than that the people should be perpetually occupied with the squabbles between him and bathyllus the advice was accepted and the emperor was silenced the party-coloured hero with every part of his dress has been drawn out of the great wardrobe of antiquity he was a roman mime harlequin is described with his shaven head rasis capitibus his sooty face phalagine faciem abducti his flat unshod feet planipedes and his patch coat of many colours mimi centunculo footnote louis riccoboni in his curious little treatise du théâtre italien illustrated by seventeen prints of the italian pantomimic characters has duly collected the authorities i give them in the order quoted above for the satisfaction of more grave inquirers vasius institutiorum poeticorum libri duo triginta duo caput quator the mimi blackened their faces daumedes de orationis libri tribus apuleius in apologia and further the patch dress was used by the ancient peasants of italy as appears by a passage in varro de re rusticarum libri uno capitulum octo and juvenal employs the term centunculus as a diminutive of cento for a coat made up of patches this was afterwards applied metaphorically to those well-known poems called centos composed of shreds and patches of poetry collected from all quarters galdoni considered harlequin as a poor devil and dolt whose coat is made up of rags patched together his hat shows mendicity and the hare's tail is still the dress of the peasantry of bergamo quadrio in his learned storia dogni poesia has diffused his erudition on the ancient mimi and their successors dr clark has discovered the light lath sword of harlequin which had hitherto baffled my most painful researches amidst the dark mysteries of the ancient mythology we read with equal astonishment and novelty that the prototypes of the modern pantomime are in the pagan mysteries that harlequin is mercury with his short sword called herpy or his rod the caduceus to render himself invisible and to transport himself from one end of the earth to the other that the covering on his head was his potassus or winged cap that columbine is psyche or the soul the old man in our pantomimes is charon the clown is momus the buffoon of heaven whose large gaping mouth is an imitation of the ancient masks the subject of an ancient vase engraven in the volume represents harlequin columbine and the clown as we see them on the english stage the dreams of the learned are amusing when we are not put to sleep dr clerk's travels volume four page four hundred and fifty nine the italian antiquaries never entertained any doubt of this remote origin it may however be reasonably doubted the chief appendage of the vice or buffoon of the ancient moralities was a gilt wooden sword and this also belonged to the old clown or fool not only in england but abroad the wooden sword directly connects harlequin with the ancient vice and more modern fool says the author of the letter press to cruikshank's punch apparently with the justice derivation in the footnote even pulicinella whom we familiarly call punch may receive like other personages of not greater importance all his dignity from antiquity one of his roman ancestors having appeared to an antiquary's visionary eye in a bronze statue more than one erudite dissertation authenticates the family likeness the nose long prominent and hooked the staring goggle eyes the hump at his back and at his breast in a word all the character which so strongly marks the punch race as distinctly as whole dynasties have been featured by the austrian lip and the bourbon nose footnote this statue which is imagined to have thrown so much light on the genealogy of punch was discovered in seventeen twenty seven and is engraved in ficaroni's amusing work on machery 
scenice e la figure conice d'antici romani page forty eight it is that of a mime called maccus by the romans the name indicates a simpleton but the origin of the more modern name has occasioned a little difference whether it be derived from the nose or its squeak the learned quadrio would draw the name pulicinello from pulicenno which spartianus uses for the pullo galenacio i suppose this to be the turkey cock because punch's hooked nose resembles its beak but baretti in that strange book the talandron gives a derivation admirably descriptive of the peculiar squeaking nasal sound he says punchinello or punch as you well know speaks with a squeaking voice that seems to come out at his nose because the fellow who in a puppet show manages the puppet called punchinello or punch as the english folks abbreviate it speaks with a tin whistle in his mouth which makes him emit that comical kind of voice but the english word punchinello is in italian pulcinella which means a hen chicken chickens voices are squeaking and nasal and they are timid and powerless and for this reason my whimsical countrymen have given the name of pulcinella or hen chicken to that comic character to convey the idea of a man that speaks with a squeaking voice through his nose to express a timid and weak fellow who is always thrashed by the other actors and always boasts of victory after they are gone to landron page three hundred and twenty four in italian palacinello is a little flea active and biting and skipping and his mask puce colour the nose imitating in shape the flea's proboscis this grotesque etymology was added by mrs thrale i cannot decide between the hen chicken of the scholar and the skipping flea of the lady who however was herself a scholar in the footnote the genealogy of the whole family is confirmed by the general term which includes them all for our zany in italian zani comes direct from sanio a buffoon and a passage in cicero de oratore paints harlequin and his brother gesticulators after the life the perpetual trembling motion of their limbs their ludicrous and flexible gestures and all the mimicry of their faces quid enim potestam ridiculum quam sanio esse qui ore vultu imitandis motibus rose denique sopore ridetur ipso libri duo sectione quinquagente unis for what has more of the ludicrous than sanio who with his mouth his face imitating every motion with his voice and indeed with all his body provokes laughter footnote how the latin sanio became the italian zani was a whirl in the roundabout of etymology which put riccoboni very ill at his ease for he having discovered this classical origin of his favourite character was alarmed at menage giving it up with obsequious tameness to a cruscan correspondent the learned quadrio however gives his vote for the greek sanos from whence the latins borrowed their sanio riccoboni's derivation therefore now stands secure from all verbal disturbers of human quiet sana is in latin as ainsworth elaborately explains a mocking by grimaces mows a flout a frump a jibe a scoff a banter and sanio is a fool in a play the italians change the s into z for they say zmyrna and zambuco for smyrna and zambuco and thus they turned sanio into zano and then into zani and we caught the echo in our zany End of footnote these are the two ancient heroes of pantomime the other characters are the laughing children of mere modern humour each of these chimerical personages like so many county members come from different provinces in the gesticulating land of pantomime in little principalities the rival inhabitants present a contrast in manners and characters which opens a wider field for ridicule and satire than in a kingdom where an uniformity of government will produce an uniformity of manners an inventor appeared in ruzanti an author and actor who flourished about fifteen thirty till his time they had servilely copied the duped fathers the wild sons and the tricking valets of plautus and terence and perhaps not being writers of sufficient skill but of some invention were satisfied 
to sketch the plots of dramas but boldly trusted to extempore acting and dialogue ruzzante peopled the italian stage with a fresh enlivening crowd of pantomimic characters the insipid dotards of the ancient comedy were transformed into the venetian pantaloon and the bolognese doctor while the hare-brained fellow the arch-knave and the booby were furnished from milan bergamo and calabria he gave his newly created beings new language and a new dress from plautus he appears to have taken the hint of introducing all the italian dialects into one comedy by making each character use his own and even the modern greek which it seems afforded many an unexpected play on words for the italian this new kind of pleasure like the language of babel charmed the national ear every province would have its dialect introduced on the scene which often served the purpose both of recreation and a little innocent malice their masks and dresses were furnished by the grotesque masqueraders of the carnival which doubtless often contributed many scenes and humours to the quick and fanciful genius of ruzzante i possess a little book of scaramouches etc by callot their masks and their costume must have been copied from these carnival scenes we see their strongly featured masks their attitudes pliant as those of a posture master the drollery of their figures while the grotesque creatures seem to leap and dance and gesticulate and move about so fantastically under his sharp graver that they form as individualized a race as our fairies and witches mortals yet like nothing mortal Footnote there is an earlier and equally whimsical series bearing the following title masquerade requilli et mis en taille douce par robert boissard valentianois fifteen ninety seven consisting of twenty four plates of carnival maskers in the footnote the first italian actors wore masks objections have been raised against their use signorelli shows the inferiority of the moderns in deviating from the movable or rather double masks of antiquity by which the actor could vary the artificial face at pleasure the mask has had its advocates for some advantages it possesses over the naked face a mask aggravates the features and gives a more determined expression to the comic character an important effect among this fantastical group the harlequin in the italian theatre has passed through all the vicissitudes of fortune at first he was a true representative of the ancient mime but afterwards degenerated into a booby and a gourmand the perpetual butt for a sharp-witted fellow his companion called brighella the knife and the whetstone harlequin under the reforming hand of galdoni became a child of nature the delight of his country and he has commemorated the historical character of the great harlequin sacchi it may serve the reader to correct his notions of one from the absurd pretender with us who has usurped the title sacchi possessed a lively and brilliant imagination while other harlequins merely repeated themselves sacchi who always adhered to the essence of the play contrived to give an air of freshness to the piece by his new sallies and unexpected repartees his comic traits and his jests were neither taken from the language of the lower orders nor that of the comedians he levied contributions on comic authors on poets orators and philosophers and in his impromptus they often discovered the thoughts of seneca cicero or montaigne he possessed the art of appropriating the remains of these great men to himself and allying them to the simplicity of the blockhead so that the same proposition which was admired in a serious author became highly ridiculous in the mouth of this excellent actor in france harlequin was improved into a wit and even converted into a moralist he is the graceful hero of florian's charming compositions which please even in the closet this imaginary being invented by the italians and adopted by the french says the ingenious galdoni has the exclusive right of uniting naivete with finesse and no one ever surpassed florian in the delineation of this amphibious character he has even contrived to impart sentiment passion and morality to his pieces harlequin must be modelled as a national character the creature of manners and thus the history of such a harlequin might be that of the age and of the people whose genius he ought to represent the history of a people is often detected in their popular amusements one of these italian pantomimic characters shows this they had a capitan who probably originated in the miles gloriosus of plautus a brother at least of our ancient pistol and bobadil 
the ludicrous names of this military poltroon were spavento horrid fright spets of fair shiver spear and a tremendous recreant was captain spavento del val inferno when charles five entered italy a spanish captain was introduced a dreadful man he was too if we are to be frightened by names sangue e fuego and matamoro his business was to deal in spanish rodomontades to kick out the native italian capitan in compliment to the spaniards and then to take a quiet caning from harlequin in compliment to themselves when the spaniards lost their influence in italy the spanish captain was turned into scaramouche who still wore the spanish dress and was perpetually in a panic the italians could only avenge themselves on the spaniards in pantomime on the same principle the gown of pantaloon over his red waistcoat and breeches commemorates a circumstance in venetian history expressive of the popular feeling the dress is that of a venetian citizen and his speech the dialect but when the venetians lost negropont they changed their upper dress to black which before had been read as a national demonstration of their grief the characters of the italian pantomime became so numerous that every dramatic subject was easily furnished with the necessary personages of comedy that loquacious pedant the dottore was taken from the lawyers and the physicians babbling false latin in the dialect of learned bologna scapin was a livery servant who spoke the dialect of bergamo a province proverbially abounding with rank intriguing knaves who like the slaves in plautus and terence were always on the watch to further any wickedness while calabria furnished the booby giangurgello with his grotesque nose moliere it has been ascertained discovered in the italian theatre at paris his médecin malgré lui his étourdi his lavar and his scapin milan offered a pimp in the brighella florence an ape of fashion in gelsomino these and other pantomimic characters and some ludicrous ones as the tartaglia a spectacle dotard a stammerer and usually in a passion had been gradually introduced by the inventive powers of an actor of genius to call forth his own peculiar talents the pantomimes or as they have been described the continual masquerades of ruzzante with all these diversified personages talking and acting formed in truth a burlesque comedy some of the finest geniuses of italy became the votaries of harlequin and the italian pantomime may be said to form a school of its own the invention of ruzzanti was one capable of perpetual novelty many of these actors have been chronicled either for the invention of some comic character or for their true imitation of nature in performing some favourite one one already immortalized by having lost his real name in that of captain metamoros by whose inimitable humours he became the most popular man in italy invented the neapolitan pulicinello while another by deeper study added new graces to another burlesque rival footnote i am here but the translator of a grave historian the italian writes with all the feeling of one aware of the important narrative and with the most curious accuracy in this genealogy of character silvio fiorillo che a peter si facia il capitano matamoros invento il pulcinella napoletano e colo studio e grazia molto aguenza andrea calcesi dello cuicio por soprano me gemma italia letterata pagina cento novantesi there is a very curious engraving by bassi representing the italian comedians about sixteen thirty three as they performed the various characters on the parisian stage the cracked voice and peculiarities of this great invention are declared by fiorillo and signorelli to be imitations of the peculiarities of the peasants of Asera, an ancient city in the neighbourhood of naples for a curious dissertation on this popular character see the volume so admirably illustrated by cruikshank quoted on a previous page End of footnote. one constantini invented the character of mezzotin as the narcissus of pantomime he acted without a mask to charm by the beautiful play of his countenance and display the graces of his figure the floating drapery of his fanciful dress could be arranged by the changeable humour of the wearer crowds followed him in the streets and a king of poland ennobled him 
the wit and harlequin dominic sometimes dined at the table of louis fourteen tiberio fiorillo who invented the character of scaramouche has been the amusing companion of the boyhood of louis fourteen and from him moliere learnt much as appears by the verses under his portrait cet illustre comédien de son art à la carrière il fut le maître de moliere et la nature fut le sien the last lines of an epitaph on one of these pantomimic actors may be applied to many of them during their flourishing period toute sa vie il a fait rire il a fait pleurer à sa mort several of these admirable actors were literary men who have written on their art and shown that it was one the harlequin cecchini composed the most ancient treatise on the subject and was ennobled by the emperor matthias and nicholas barbieri for his excellent acting called the beltrame milanese simpleton in his treatise on comedy tell us that he was honoured by the conversation of louis thirteen and rewarded with fortune what was the nature of that perfection to which the italian pantomime reached and that prodigality of genius which excited such enthusiasm not only among the populace but the studious and the noble and the men of genius the italian pantomime had two peculiar features a species of buffoonery technically termed lazzi and one of a more extraordinary nature the extempore dialogue of its comedy these lazzi were certain pleasantries of gesticulation quite national yet so closely allied to our notions of buffoonery that a northern critic would not readily detect the separating shade yet riccoboni asserts that they formed a critical and not a trivial art that these arts of gesticulation had something in them peculiar to italian humour we infer from gerardi who could not explain the term but by describing it as un tour jeu italien it was so peculiar to them that he could only call it by their own name it is difficult to describe that of which the whole magic consists in being seen and what is more evanescent than the humour which consists in gestures lazzi says riccoboni is a term corrupted from the old tuscan lacci which signifies a knot or something which connects these pleasantries called lazzi are certain actions by which the performer breaks into the scene to paint to the eye his emotions of panic or jocularity but as such gestures are foreign to the business going on the nicety of the art consists in not interrupting the scene and connecting the lazzi with it thus to tie the whole together lazzi then seems a kind of mimicry and gesture corresponding with the passing scene and we may translate the term by one in our green-room dialect side-play riccoboni has ventured to describe some lazzi when harlequin and scapin represent two famished servants of a poor young mistress among the arts by which they express the state of starvation harlequin having murmured scapin exhorts him to groan a music which brings out their young mistress scapin explains harlequin's impatience and begins a proposal to her which might extricate them all from their misery while scapin is talking harlequin performs his lazzi imagining he holds a hatful of cherries he seems eating them and gaily flinging the stones at scapin or with a rueful countenance he is trying to catch a fly and with his hand in comical despair would chop off the wings before he swallows the chameleon game these with similar lazzi harmonize with the remonstrance of scapin and reanimate it and thus these lazzi although they seem to interrupt the progress of the action yet in cutting it they slide back into it and connect or tie the whole these lazzi are in great danger of degenerating into puerile mimicry or gross buffoonery unless fancifully conceived and vividly gesticulated but the italians seem to possess the arts of gesture before that of speech and this national characteristic is also roman such indeed was the powerful expression of their mimetic art that when the select troop under riccoboni on their first introduction into france only spoke in italian the audience who did not understand the words were made completely masters of the action by their pure and energetic imitations of nature the italian theatre has indeed recorded some miracles of this sort a celebrated scaramouche without uttering a syllable kept the audience for a considerable time in a state of suspense by a scene of successive terrors and exhibited a living picture of a panic-stricken man girardi in his theatre italien 
conveys some idea of the scene scaramouche a character usually represented in a fright is waiting for his master harlequin in his apartment having put everything in order according to his confused notions he takes the guitar seats himself in an armchair and plays pasquariel comes gently behind him and taps time on his shoulders this throws scaramouche into a panic it was then that incomparable model of our most eminent actors says gerardi displayed the miracles of his art that art which paints the passions in the face throws them into every gesture and through a whole scene of frights upon frights conveys the most powerful expression of ludicrous terror this man moved all hearts by the simplicity of nature more than skilful orators can with all the charms of persuasive rhetoric on this memorable scene a great prince observed that scaramuccia non parla e dice gran cosa he speaks not but he says many great things in gesticulation and humour our rich footnote john rich was the patentee of covent garden theatre and spent large sums over his favourite pantomimes he was also the fortunate producer of the beggar's opera which was facetiously said to have made rich gay and gay rich he took so little interest in what is termed the regular drama that he is reported to have exclaimed when peeping through the curtain at a full house to witness a tragedy what you are there you fools are you he died wealthy in seventeen sixty one and there is a costly tomb to his memory in hillingdon churchyard middlesex End of footnote. appears to have been a complete mime his genius was entirely confined to pantomime and he had the glory of introducing harlequin on the english stage which he played under the feigned name of lunn he could describe to the audience by his signs and gestures as intelligibly as others could express by words there is a large caricature print of the triumph which rich had obtained over the severe muses of tragedy and comedy which lasted too long not to excite jealousy and opposition from the corps dramatique garrick who once introduced a speaking harlequin has celebrated the silent but powerful language of rich when lunn appeared with matchless art and whim he gave the power of speech to every limb though masked and mute conveyed his quick intent and told in frolic gestures what he meant but now the motley coat and sword of wood require a tongue to make them understood the italian extemporal comedy is a literary curiosity which claims our attention End of section 28section twenty nine of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli extemporal comedies it is a curiosity in the history of national genius to discover a people with such a native fund of comic humour combined with such passionate gesticulation that they could deeply interest in acting a comedy carried on by dialogue intrigue and character al improvista or impromptu the actors undergoing no rehearsal and in fact composing while they were acting the plot called scenario consisting merely of the scenes enumerated with the characters indicated was first written out it was then suspended at the back of the stage and from the mere inspection the actors came forward to perform the dialogue entirely depending on their own genius footnote some of the ancient scenarii were printed in sixteen sixty one by flaminius scala one of their great actors these according to riccoboni consist of nothing more than the skeletons of comedies the caneva as the french technically term a plot and its scenes he says they are not so short as those we now use to fix at the back of the scenes nor so full as to furnish any aid to the dialogue they only explain what the actor did on the stage and the action which forms the subject nothing more End of footnote. 
These pieces must have been detestable, and the actors mere buffoons, exclaim the northern critics, whose imaginations have a coldness in them, like a frost in spring. But when the art of extemporal comedy flourished among these children of fancy, the universal pleasure these representations afforded to a whole vivacious people, and the recorded celebrity of their great actors, open a new field for the speculation of genius it may seem more extraordinary that some of its votaries have maintained that it possessed some peculiar advantages over written compositions when goldoni reformed the italian theatre by regular comedies he found an invincible opposition from the enthusiasts of their old comedy for two centuries it had been the amusement of italy and was a species of comic entertainment which it had created inventive minds were fond of sketching out these outlines of pieces and other men of genius delighted in their representation the inspiration of national genius alone could produce this phenomenon and these extemporal comedies were indeed indigenous to the soil italy a land of improvisatori kept up from the time of their old masters the romans the same fervid fancy the ancient Atalani fabulae or Atalane farces originated at Atella, a town in the neighborhood of ancient Naples, and these two were extemporal interludes, or as Livy terms them, exodia. We find in that historian a little interesting narrative of the theatrical history of the Romans, when the dramatic performances at Rome were becoming too sentimental and declamatory banishing the playfulness and the mirth of comedy the roman youth left these graver performances to the professed actors and revived perhaps in imitation of the licentious satira of the greeks the ancient custom of versifying pleasantries and throwing out jests and raillery among themselves for their own diversion footnote the passage in livy is Uentus histrionibus fabularum octu licto ipsa in terce more antiquo ridicula in texta versibus yactitari sipit book seven chapter two in the footnote these atalan farces were probably not so low in humour as they have been represented footnote as these atalani fabulae were never written they have not descended to us in any shape it has indeed been conjectured that horace in the fifth satire of his first book verse fifty one has preserved a scene of this nature between two practised buffoons in the pugnam sarmenti scurai who challenges his brother ciserus equally ludicrous and scurrilous but surely these were rather the low humour of the mimes than of the atalan farcers in the footnote or at least the roman youth on their revival exercised a chaster taste for they are noticed by cicero in a letter to his literary friend papirius Pitus. but to turn from the serious to the jocose part of your letter the strain of pleasantry you break into immediately after having quoted the tragedy of enomaeus puts me in mind of the modern method of introducing at the end of these graver dramatic pieces the buffoon humour of our low mimes instead of the more delicate burlesque of the old atalan farces this very curious passage distinctly marks out the two classes which so many centuries after cicero were revived in the pantomime of italy and in its extemporal comedy footnote this passage also shows that our own custom of annexing a farce or petite pièce or pantomime to a tragic drama existed among the romans the introduction of the practice in our country seems not to be ascertained and it is conjectured not to have existed before the restoration shakespeare and his contemporaries probably were spectators of only a single drama in the footnote the critics on our side of the alps reproached the italians for the extemporal comedies 
and marmontel rashly declared that the nation did not possess a single comedy which could endure perusal but he drew his notions from the low farces of the italian theatre at paris and he censured what he had never read footnote storia critica del teatri de signorelli volume three two fifty eight baretti mentions a collection of four thousand dramas made by apostolo zeno of which the greater part were comedies he allows that in tragedies his nation is inferior to the english and the french but no nation he adds can be compared with us for a pleasantry and humour in comedy some of the greatest names in italian literature were writers of comedy italian book one nineteen end of footnote the comedies of bibiena del lasca del secchi and others are models of classical comedy but not the popular favourites of italy signorelli distinguishes two species of italian comedy those which he calls comedie antiche ed eruditi ancient and learned comedies and those of commedia dell'arte or a soggetto comedies suggested the first were moulded on classical models recited in their academies to a select audience and performed by amateurs but the comedie a soggetto the extemporal comedies were invented by professional actors of genius more delightful to the fancy of the italians and more congenial to their talents in spite of the graver critics who even in their amusements cannot cast off the manacles of precedence the italians resolved to be pleased for themselves with their own natural vein and preferred a freedom of original humour and invention incompatible with regular productions but which inspired admirable actors and secured full audiences men of great genius had a passion for performing in these extemporal comedies salvator rosa was famous for his character of a calabrian clown whose original he had probably often studied amidst that mountainous scenery in which his pencil delighted of their manner of acting i find an interesting anecdote in passeri's life of this great painter he shall tell his own story one summer salvator rosa joined a company of young persons who were curiously addicted to the making of comedie al improviso in the midst of a vineyard they raised a rustic stage under the direction of one musi who enjoyed some literary reputation particularly for his sermons preached in lent their second comedy was numerously attended and i went among the rest i sat on the same bench by good fortune with the cavalier bernini romanelli and guido all well-known persons salvator rosa who had already made himself a favourite with the roman people under the character of formica opened with a prologue in company with other actors footnote altieri explains formica as a crabbed fellow who acts the butt in a farce End of footnote he proposed for relieving themselves of the extreme heats and ennui that they should make a comedy and all agreed formica then spoke these exact words non voglia gia che facima comedy come cierti che tagliano li pani aduoso a cisto u a cilo per che col tempo se fa vedere ciu veloce lo taglio di no rasuolo che la pena di no poeta e na manco voglio che facimo veneri nella cena porta setazione aquia vitari e crapari e ste cifenze che tengo spros posite da asseno one part of this humour lies in the dialect which is venetian but there was a concealed stroke of satire a snake in the grass the sense of the passage is i will not however that we should make a comedy like certain persons who cut clothes and put them on this man's back and on that man's back for at last the time comes which shows how much faster went the cut of the shears than the pen of the poet nor will we have entering on the scene couriers brandy-sellers and goat-herds 
and there stare shy and blockish which i think worthy the senseless invention of an ass passeri now proceeds at this time bernini had made a comedy in the carnival very pungent and biting and that summer he had one of castelli's performed in the suburbs where to represent the dawn of day appeared on the stage water carriers couriers and goatherds going about all which is contrary to rule which allows of no character who is not concerned in the dialogue to mix with the groups at these words of the formica i who well knew the, his meaning instantly glanced my eye at bernini to observe his movements but he with an artificial carelessness showed that this cut of the shears did not touch him and he made no apparent show of being hurt but castelli who was also near tossing his head and smiling in bitterness showed clearly that he was hit this italian story told with all the poignant relish of these vivacious natives to whom such a stinging incident was an important event also shows the personal freedoms taken on these occasions by a man of genius entirely in the spirit of the ancient roman atalana or the grecian satira riccoboni has discussed the curious subject of extemporal comedy with equal modesty and feeling and gerardi with more exultation and egotism this kind of spectacle says riccoboni is peculiar to italy one cannot deny that it has graces perfectly its own and which written comedy can never exhibit this impromptu mode of acting furnishes opportunities for a perpetual change in the performance so that the same scenario repeated still appears a new one thus one comedy may become twenty comedies an actor of this description always supposing an actor of genius is more vividly affected than one who has coldly got his part by rote but riccoboni could not deny that there were inconveniences in this singular art one difficulty not easily surmounted was the preventing of all the actors speaking together each one eager to reply before the other had finished it was a nice point to know when to yield up the scene entirely to a predominant character when agitated by violent passion nor did it require a less exercised tact to feel when to stop the vanity of an actor often spoiled a fine scene it evidently required that some of the actors at least should be blessed with genius and what is scarcely less difficult to find with a certain equality of talents for the performance of the happiest actor of the school greatly depends on the excitement he receives from his companion an actor beneath mediocrity would ruin a piece but figure memory voice and even sensibility are not sufficient for the actor al improvista he must be in the habit of cultivating the imagination pouring forth the flow of expression and prompt in those flashes which instantaneously vibrate in the plaudits of an audience and this accomplished extemporal actor feelingly laments that those destined to his profession who require the most careful education are likely to have received the most neglected one lucian in his curious treatise on tragic pantomime asserts that the great actor should also be a man of letters and such were garrick and kemble the lively gerardi throws out some curious information respecting this singular art any one may learn a part by rote and do something bad or indifferent on another theatre with us the affair is quite otherwise and when an italian actor dies it is with infinite difficulty we can supply his place an italian actor learns nothing by head he looks on the subject for a moment before he comes forward on the stage and entirely depends on his imagination for the rest the actor who is accustomed merely to recite what he has been taught is so completely occupied by his memory that he appears to stand as it were unconnected either with the audience or his companion he is so impatient to deliver himself of the burthen he is carrying that he trembles like a schoolboy or is as senseless as an echo and could never speak if others had not spoken before such a tutored actor among us would be like a paralytic arm to a body an unserviceable member only fatiguing the healthy action of the sound parts 
our performers who became illustrious by their art charmed the spectators by the beauty of their voice their spontaneous gestures the flexibility of their passions while a certain natural air never failed them in their motions and their dialogue here then is a species of the histrionic art unknown to us and running counter to that critical canon which our great poet but not powerful actor has delivered to the actors themselves to speak no more than is set down for them the present art consisted in happily performing the reverse much of the merit of these actors unquestionably must be attributed to the felicity of the national genius but there were probably some secret aids in this singular art of extemporal comedy which the pride of the artist has concealed some traits in the character and some wit in the dialogue might descend traditionally and the most experienced actor on that stage would make use of his memory more than he was willing to confess galdoni records an unlucky adventure of his harlequin lost and found which outline he had sketched for the italian company it was well received at paris but utterly failed at fontainebleau for some of the actors had thought proper to incorporate too many jokes of the cocu imaginaire which displeased the court and ruined the piece when a new piece was to be performed the chief actor summoned the troupe in the morning read the plot and explained the story to contrive scenes it was like playing the whole performance before the actors these hints of scenes were all the rehearsal when the actor entered on the scene he did not know what was to come nor had he any prompter to help him on much too depended on the talents of his companions yet sometimes the scene might be preconcerted invention humour bold conception of character and rapid strokes of genius they habitually exercised and the pantomimic arts of gesture the passionate or humorous expression of their feelings would assist an actor when his genius for a moment had deserted him such excellence was not long hereditary and in the decline of this singular art its defects became more apparent the race had degenerated the inexperienced actor became loquacious long monologues were contrived by a barren genius to hide his incapacity for spirited dialogue and a wearisome repetition of trivial jests coarse humour and vulgar buffoonery damned the commedia a soggetto and sunk it to a bartholomew fair play but the miracle which genius produced it may repeat whenever the same happy combination of circumstances and persons shall occur together i shall give one anecdote to record the possible excellence of the art louis riccoboni known in the annals of this theatre by the adopted name of lelio his favourite amoroso character was not only an accomplished actor but a literary man and with his wife flaminia afterwards the celebrated novelist displayed a rare union of talents and of minds it was suspected that they did not act al improvista from the facility and the elegance of their dialogue and a clamour was now raised in the literary circles who had long been jealous of the fascination which attracted the public to the italian theatre it was said that the rigabonis were imposing on the public credulity and that their pretended extemporal comedies were preconcerted scenes to terminate this civil war between the rival theatres la Motte offered to sketch a plot in five acts and the italians were challenged to perform it this defiance was instantly accepted on the morning of the representation lelio detailed the story to his troupe hung up the scenario in its usual place and the whole company was ready at the drawing of the curtain the plot given in by la motte was performed to admiration and all paris witnessed the triumph la motte afterwards composed this very comedy for the french theatre la mont difficile yet still the extemporal one at the italian theatre remained a more permanent favourite and the public were delighted by seeing the same piece perpetually offering novelties and changing its character at the fancy of the actors this fact conveys an idea of dramatic execution which does not enter into our experience 
riccoboni carried the commedia dell'arte to a new perfection by the introduction of an elegant fable and serious characters and he raised the dignity of the italian stage when he inscribed on its curtain castigat ridendo mores End of section twenty nine section thirty of curiosities of literature volume two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org curiosities of literature volume two by isaac disraeli massinger milton and the italian theatre the pantomimic characters and the extemporal comedy of italy may have had some influence even on our own dramatic poets this source has indeed escaped all notice yet i incline to think it explains a difficult point in massinger which has baffled even the keen spirit of mr gifford a passage in massinger bears a striking resemblance with one in moliere's malade imaginaire it is in the emperor of the east volume three three seventeen the quack or empiric's humorous notion is so closely that of moliere's that mr gifford agreeing with mr gilchrist finds it difficult to believe the coincidence accidental but the greater difficulty is to conceive that massinger ever fell into moliere's hands at that period in the infancy of our literature our native authors and our own language were as insulated as their country it is more than probable that massinger and moliere had drawn from the same source the italian comedy massinger's empiric as well as the acknowledged copy of moliere's medicin came from the dottori of the italian comedy the humour of these old italian pantomimes was often as traditionally preserved as proverbs massinger was a student of italian authors and some of the lucky hits of their theatre which then consisted of nothing else but these burlesque comedies might have circuitously reached the english bard and six and thirty years afterwards the same traditional jests might have been gleaned by the gallic one from the dottori who was still repeating what he knew was sure of pleasing our theatres of the elizabethan period seem to have had here the extemporal comedy after the manner of the italians we surely possess one of these scenarios in the remarkable plats which were accidentally discovered at dulwich college bearing every feature of an italian scenario stevens calls them a mysterious fragment of ancient stage direction and adds that the paper describes a species of dramatic entertainment of which no memorial is preserved in any annals of the english stage the commentators on shakespeare appear not to have known the nature of these scenarios the plat as it is called is fairly written in a large hand containing directions appointed to be stuck up near the prompter station and it has even an oblong hole in its centre to admit of being suspended on a wooden peg particular scenes are barely ordered and the names or rather nicknames of several of the players appear in the most familiar manner as they were known to their companions in the rude green room of that day such as pig white and black dick and sam little will barn jack gregory and the red-faced fellow footnote the commencement of the plat of the seven deadly sins believed to be a production of the famous dick tarleton will sufficiently enlighten the reader as to the character of the whole the original is preserved at dulwich and is written in two columns on a pasteboard about fifteen inches high and nine in breadth we have modernized the spelling a tent being placed on the stage for henry the sixth he in it asleep to him the lieutenant and a pursuivant r cali joe duke and one warder r pallant to them pride gluttony wrath and covetousness at one door at another door envy sloth and luxury the three put back the four and so exeunt henry awaking enter a keeper j sinclair to him a servant t belt to him lydgate and the keeper exit then enter again then envy passeth over the stage 
lydgate speaks End of footnote. some of these plats are on solemn subjects like the tragic pantomime and in some appear pantaloon and his man peascod with spectacles stevens observes that he met with no earlier example of the appearance of pantaloon as a specific character on our stage and that this direction concerning the spectacles cannot fail to remind the reader of a celebrated passage in as you like it the lean and slippered pantaloon with spectacles on nose perhaps he adds shakespeare alludes to this personage as habited in his own time the old age of pantaloon is marked by his leanness and his spectacles and his slippers he always runs after harlequin but cannot catch him as he runs in slippers and without spectacles is liable to pass him by without seeing him can we doubt that this pantaloon had come from the italian theatre after what we have already said does not this confirm the conjecture that there existed an intercourse between the italian theatre and our own farther tarleton the comedian and others celebrated for their extemporal wit was the writer or inventor of one of these plats stowe records of one of our actors that he had a quick delicate refined extemporal wit and of another that he had a wondrous plentiful pleasant extemporal wit these actors then who were in the habit of exercising their impromptus resembled those who performed in the unwritten comedies of the italians gabriel harvey the aristarchus of the day compliments tarleton for having brought forward a new species of dramatic exhibition if this compliment paid to tarleton merely alludes to his dexterity at extemporaneous wit in the character of the clown as my friend mr deuce thinks this would be sufficient to show that he was attempting to introduce on our stage the extemporal comedy of the italians which gabriel harvey distinguishes as a new species as for these plats which i shall now venture to call scenarios they surprise by their bareness conveying no notion of the piece itself though quite sufficient for the actors they consist of mere exits and entrances of the actors and often the real names of the actors are familiarly mixed with those of the dramatis personae stevens has justly observed however on these skeletons that although the drift of these dramatic pieces cannot be collected from the mere outlines before us yet we must not charge them with absurdity even the scenes of shakespeare would have worn as unpromising an aspect had their skeletons only been discovered the printed scenarios of the italian theatre were not more intelligible exhibiting only the hints for scenes thus i think we have sufficient evidence of an intercourse subsisting between the english and italian theatres not hitherto suspected and i find an allusion to these italian pantomimes by the great town wit tom nash in his pierce penniless which shows that he was well acquainted with their nature he indeed exults over them observing that our plays are honourable and full of gallant resolution not consisting like theirs of pantaloon a zany and a w blank blank e alluding to the women actors of the italian stage but of emperors kings and princes footnote women were first introduced on the italian stage about fifteen sixty it was therefore an extraordinary novelty in nash's time End of footnote. my conviction is still confirmed when i find that stephen gosen wrote the comedy of captain mario it has not been printed but captain mario is one of the italian characters footnote that this kind of drama was perfectly familiar to the playgoers of the era of elizabeth is clear from a passage in mere's pallidus tamica fifteen ninety eight who speaks of tarleton's extemporal power adding a compliment to our witty wilson who for learning and extemporal wit in this faculty is without compare or compere as to his great and eternal commendations he manifested in his challenge at the swan on bankside the swan was one of the theatres so popular in the era of elizabeth and james i situated on the bankside southwark End of footnote. 
even at a later period the influence of these performances reached the greatest name in the english parnassus one of the great actors and authors of these pieces who published eighteen of these irregular productions was andriani whose name must have the honour of being associated with milton's for it was his comedy or opera which threw the first spark of the paradise lost into the soul of the epic poet a circumstance which will hardly be questioned by those who have examined the different schemes and allegorical personages of the first projected drama of paradise lost nor was andreini as well as many others of this race of italian dramatists inferior poets the adamo of andreini was a personage sufficiently original and poetical to serve as the model of the adam of milton the youthful english poet at its representation carried it away in his mind wit indeed is a great traveller and thus also the empiric of massinger might have reached us from the boulognese dottore the late mr hole the ingenious writer on the arabian nights observed to me that moliere it must be presumed never read fletcher's plays yet his bourgeois gentilhomme and the others noble gentlemen bear in some instances a great resemblance both may have drawn from the same italian source of comedy which i have here indicated many years after this article was written has appeared the history of english dramatic poetry by mr collier that very laborious investigator has an article on extemporal plays and plots three three ninety three the nature of these plats or plots he observes our theatrical antiquaries have not explained the truth is that they never suspected their origin in the italian scenarios my conjectures are amply confirmed by mr collier's notices of the intercourse of our players with the italian actors whetstone's heptameron in fifteen eighty two mentions the comedians of ravenna who are not tied to any written device in kidd's spanish tragedy the extemporal art is described the italian tragedians were so sharp of wit that in one hour of meditation they would perform anything in action these extemporal players were witnessed much nearer than in italy at the theatre des italiens at paris for one of the characters replies i have seen the like in paris among the french tragedians ben jonson has mentioned the italian extemporal plays in his case is altered and an italian commandiante his company were in london in fifteen seventy eight who probably let our players into many a secret End of section 30。section 31 of curiosities of literature volume 2 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org curiosities of literature volume 2 by isaac disraeli songs of trades or songs for the people men of genius have devoted some of their hours and even governments have occasionally assisted to render the people happier by song and dance the grecians had songs appropriated to the various trades songs of this nature would shorten the manufacturer's tedious task work and solace the artisan at his solitary occupation a beam of gay fancy kindling his mind a playful change of measures delighting his ear even a moralizing verse to cherish his better feelings these ingeniously adapted to each profession and some to the display of patriotic characters and national events would contribute something to public happiness such themes are worthy of a patriotic bard of the southies for their hearts and the moors for their verse fletcher of saltoun said if a man were permitted to make all the ballads he need not care who should make all the laws of a nation the character of a people is preserved in their national songs god save the king and rule britannia were long our english national airs
the story of amphion building thebes with his lyre was not a fable says dr clark at thebes in the harmonious adjustment of those masses which remain belonging to the ancient walls we saw enough to convince us that this story was no fable for it was a very ancient custom to carry on immense labour by an accompaniment of music and singing the custom still exists both in egypt and greece it might therefore be said that the walls of thebes were built at the sound of the only musical instrument then in use because according to the custom of the country the lyre was necessary for the accomplishment of the work the same custom appears to exist in africa lander notices at yauri that the labourers in their plantations were attended by a drummer that they might be excited by the sound of his instrument to work well and briskly footnote in the poem on the entrenchment of new ross in ireland in twelve sixty five harl manuscript number nine thirteen is a similar account of the minstrelsy which accompanied the workers the original is in norman french the translation we use is that by the late miss landon l e l monday they began their labours gay with banners flutes and labours soon as the noon hour was come these good people hastened home with their banners proudly borne then the youth advanced in turn and the town they make it ring with their merry caroling singing loud and full of mirth away they go to shovel earth End of footnote. athenaeus has preserved the greek names of different songs as sung by various trades but unfortunately none of the songs themselves there was a song for the corn grinders another for the workers in wool another for the weavers the reapers had their carol the herdsmen had a song which an ox driver of sicily had composed the kneaders and the bathers and the galley rowers were not without their chant we have ourselves a song of the weavers which ritson has preserved in his ancient songs and it may be found in the popular chapbook of the life of jack of newbury and the songs of anglers of old isaac walton and charles cotton still retain their freshness among the greeks observed bishop heber the hymn which placed harmodius in the green and flowery island of the blessed was chanted by the potter to his wheel and enlivened the labours of the pyrean mariner dr johnson is the only writer i recollect who has noticed something of this nature which he observed in the highlands the strokes of the sickle were timed by the modulation of the harvest song in which all their voices were united they accompany every action which can be done in equal time with an appropriate strain which has they say not much meaning but its effects are regularity and cheerfulness there is an oar song used by the hebrideans but if these chants have not much meaning they will not produce the desired effect of touching the heart as well as giving vigour to the arm of the labourer the gondoliers of venice while away their long midnight hours on the water with the stanzos of tasso fragments of homer are sung by the greek sailors of the archipelago the severe labour of the trackers in china is accompanied with a song which encourages their exertions and renders these simultaneous mr ellis mentions that the sight of the lofty pagoda of tong chow served as a great topic of incitement in the song of the trackers toiling against the stream to their place of rest the canoe men on the gold coast in a very dangerous passage on the back of a high curling wave paddling with all their might singing or rather shouting their wild song follow it up says Malaud, who was a lively witness of this happy combination of song of labour and of peril which he acknowledged was a very terrific process our sailors at newcastle in heaving their anchors have their heave and ho rum below but the sicilian mariners must be more deeply affected by their beautiful hymn to the virgin a society instituted in holland for general good do not consider among their least useful projects that of having printed at a low price a collection of songs for sailors it is extremely pleasing as it is true to notice the honest exultation of an excellent ballad writer c dibden in his professional life i have learnt my songs have been considered as an object of national consequence 
that they have been the solace of sailors and long voyagers in storms in battle and that they have been quoted in mutinies to the restoration of order and discipline footnote the lords of the admiralty a few years ago issued a revised edition of these songs for the use of our navy they embody so completely the idea of a true british sailor that they have developed and upheld the character End of footnote. the portuguese soldiery in ceylon at the siege of colombo when pressed with misery and the pangs of hunger during their marches derived not only consolation but also encouragement by rehearsing the stanzas of the lusiad we ourselves have been a great ballad nation and once abounded with songs of the people not however of this particular species but rather of narrative poems they are described by putnam a critic in the reign of elizabeth as small and popular songs sung by those cantabanqui upon benches and barrels heads where they have no other audience than boys or country fellows that pass by them in the streets or else by blind harpers or such like tavern minstrels that give a fit of mirth for a groat such were these reliques of ancient english poetry which selden collected pepys preserved and percy published ritson our great poetical antiquarian these sort of things says that few are older than the reign of james i the more ancient songs of the people perished by having been printed in single sheets and by their humble purchasers having no other library to preserve them than the walls on which they pasted them those we have consist of a succeeding race of ballads chiefly revived or written by richard johnson the author of the well-known romance of the seven champions and deloney the writer of jack of newbury's life and the gentle craft who lived in the time of james and charles footnote in durfee's whimsical collection of songs wit and mirth sixteen eighty two are several trade songs one on the blacksmiths begins of all the trades that ever i see there's none to a blacksmith compared may be with so many several tools works he which nobody can deny the london companies also chanted forth their own praises thus the mercers company in seventeen o one sang in their lord mayor's show alluding to their arms a demi-virgin crown advance the virgin lead the van of all that are in london free the mercer is the foremost man that founded a society of all the trades that london grace we are the first in time and place End of footnote. one martin parker was a most notorious ballad scribbler in the reign of charles i and the protector these writers in their old age collected their songs into little penny books called garlands some of which have been republished by ritson and a recent editor has well described them as humble and amusing village strains founded upon the squabbles of awake tales of untrue love superstitious rumours or miraculous traditions of the hamlet they enter into the picture of our manners as much as folio chronicles these songs abounded in the good old times of elizabeth and james for hall in his satires notices them as sung to the wheel and sung unto the pale that is sung by maidens spinning or milking and indeed shakespeare had described them as old and plain chanted by the spinsters and the knitters in the sun and the free maids that weave their threads with bones twelfth night they were the favourites of the poet of nature who takes every opportunity to introduce them into the mouths of his clown his fool and his itinerant autolycus when the musical dr burney who had probably not the slightest conception of their nature and perhaps as little taste for their rude and wild simplicity ventured to call the songs of autolycus two nonsensical songs the musician called down on himself one of the bitterest notes from stevens that ever commentator penned against a profane scoffer footnote dr burney subsequently observed that this rogue autolycus is the true ancient minstrel in the old fabliau on which stevens remarks many will push the comparison a little further and concur with me in thinking that our modern minstrels of the opera like their predecessor autolycus are pickpockets as well as singers of nonsensical ballads stevens's shakespeare volume seven page one o seven his own edition seventeen ninety three End of footnote. whatever these songs were it is evident they formed a source of recreation to the solitary task worker 
but as the more masculine trades have their own songs whose titles only appear to have reached us such as the carman's whistle watkins ale chopping knives they were probably appropriated to the respective trades they indicate the tune of the carman's whistle was composed by bird and the favourite tune of queen elizabeth may be found in the collection called queen elizabeth's virginal book one who has lately heard it played says that it has more air than the other execrable compositions in her majesty's book something resembling a french quadrille the feeling our present researches would excite would naturally be most strongly felt in small communities where the interest of the governors is to contribute to the individual happiness of the laborious classes the helvetic society requested lavater to compose the schweizerleiden or swiss songs which are now sung by the youth of many of the cantons and various swiss poets have successfully composed on national subjects associated with their best feelings in such paternal governments as was that of florence under the medici we find that songs and dances for the people engaged the muse of lorenzo who condescended to delight them with pleasant songs composed in popular language the example of such a character was followed by the men of genius of the age these ancient songs often adapted to the different trades opened a vein of invention in the new characters and allusions the humorous equivoques and sometimes by the licentiousness of popular fancy they were collected in fifteen fifty nine under the title of canti carnaschialeschi and there is a modern edition in seventeen fifty in two volumes quarto it is said they sing to this day a popular one by lorenzo beginning ben benga maggio el gonfalon selvaggio which has all the florid brilliancy of an italian spring the most delightful songs of this nature would naturally be found among a people whose climate and whose labours alike inspire a general hilarity and the vineyards of france have produced a class of songs of excessive gaiety and freedom called chansons de vendange le grand de souci describes them in his histoire de la vie privée des français the men and women each with a basket on their arm assemble at the foot of the hill there stopping they arrange themselves in a circle the chief of this band tunes up a joyous song whose burthen is chorused then they ascend and dispersed in the vineyard they work without interrupting their tasks while new couplets often resound from some of the vine dressers sometimes intermixed with a sudden jest at a traveller in the evening their supper is scarcely over their joy recommences they dance in a circle and sing some of those songs of free gaiety which the moment excuses known by the name of vineyard songs the gaiety becomes general masters guests friends servants all dance together and in this manner a day of labour terminates which one might mistake for a day of diversion it is what i have witnessed in champagne in a land of vines far different from the country where the labours of the harvest form so painful a contrast the extinction of those songs which formerly kept alive the gaiety of the domestic circle whose burthens were always chorused is lamented by the french antiquary our fathers had accustomed to amuse themselves at the dessert of a feast by a joyous song of this nature each in his turn sung all chorused this ancient gaiety was sometimes gross and noisy but he prefers it to the tame decency of our times these smiling not laughing days of lord chesterfield on ne rit plus on sourit aujourd'hui et non plaisir son voisin de l'ennui these are the old french vaudeville formerly sung at meals by the company comte de gramont is mentioned by hamilton as being agréable et vif en propos célèbre des yeux de bonmont recueil vivant antique vaudeville these vaudeville were originally invented by a fuller of vaudeville or the valley by the river vire and were sung by his men as they spread their cloths on the banks of the river they were songs composed on some incident or adventure of the day at first these gay playful effusions were called the songs of vaudeville till they became known as vaudeville boileau has well described them la liberté franchise en sévère se déploie ces enfants des plaisirs vont naître dans la joie it is well known how the attempt ended of james i and his unfortunate son by the publication of their book of sports 
to preserve the national character from the gloom of fanatical puritanism among its unhappy effects there was however one not a little ludicrous the puritans offended by the gentlest forms of mirth and every day becoming more sullen were so shocked at the simple merriment of the people that they contrived to parody these songs into spiritual ones and shakespeare speaks of the puritan of his day singing psalms to hornpipes as puritans are the same in all times the methodists in our own repeated the foolery and set their hymns to popular tunes and jigs which one of them said were too good for the devil they have sung hymns to the air of the beds of sweet roses etc wesley once in the pulpit described himself in his old age in the well-known ode of anacreon by merely substituting his own name footnote the late roland hill constantly sang at the surrey chapel a hymn to the tune of rule britannia altered to rule emmanuel there was published in dublin in eighteen thirty three a series of hymns written to favourite tunes they were the innocent work of one who wished to do good by a mode sufficiently startling to those who see impropriety in the conjunction of the sacred and the profane thus one pious chanson is written to grandma Cree, or the harp that once threw terror's halls of moor another describing the death of a believer is set to the groves of blarney End of footnote there have been puritans among other people as well as our own the same occurrence took place both in italy and france in italy the carnival songs were turned into pious hymns the hymn jesu fami moriri is sung to the music of vagabella e gentili crucifissa a capocino to that of una donna d'amor fino one of the most indecent pieces in the canzoni a ballo and the hymn beginning ecco la messia e la madre maria was sung to the gay tune of lorenzo de medici ben venga magio el gonfalon selvaggio athenaeus notices what we call slang or flash songs he tells us that there were poets who composed songs in the dialect of the mob and who succeeded in this kind of poetry adapted to their various characters the french call such songs chansons a la vade the style of the poissard is ludicrously applied to the gravest matters of state and convey the popular feelings in the language of the populace this sort of satirical song is happily defined il est l'esprit de ceux qui n'en ont pas athenaeus has also preserved songs sung by petitioners who went about on holidays to collect alms a friend of mine with taste and learning has discovered in his researches the crow song and the swallow song and has transfused their spirit in a happy version i preserve a few striking ideas the collectors for the crow sung my good worthy masters a pittance bestow some oatmeal or barley or wheat for the crow a loaf or a penny or e'en what you will from the poor man a grain of his salt may suffice for your crow swallows all and is not over nice and the man who can now give his grain and no more may another day give from a plentiful store come my lad to the door plutus nods to our wish and our sweet little mistress comes out with a dish she gives us her figs and she gives us a smile heaven send her a husband and a boy to be danced on his grandfather's knee and a girl like herself all the joy of her mother who may one day present her with just such another thus we carry our crow song to door after door alternately chanting we ramble along and we treat all who give or give not with a song swallow singing or chelidonizing as the greek term is was another method of collecting elimacenary gifts which took place in the month of bedromian or august the swallow the swallow is here with his back so black and his belly so white he brings on the pride of the year with the gay months of love and the days of delight come bring out your good humming stuff of the nice titbits let the swallow partake in a slice of the right bedromian cake so give and give quickly or we'll pull down the door from its hinges or we'll steal young madam away but see we're a merry boy's party and the swallow the swallow is here these songs resemble those of our ancient mummers who to this day in honour of bishop blaze the saint of woolcombers go about chanting on the eves of their holidays Footnote the festival of st blaise is held on the third of february 
percy notes it as a custom in many parts of england to light up fires on the hills on st blaze's night hone in his everyday book volume one page two ten prints a detailed account of the woolcombers celebration at bradford yorkshire in eighteen twenty five in which bishop blaze figured with the bishop's chaplain surrounded by shepherds and shepherdesses but personated by one john smith with very becoming gravity End of footnote. a custom long existed in this country to elect a boy bishop in almost every parish footnote the custom was made the subject of an essay by gregory in illustration of the tomb of one of these functionaries at salisbury they were elected on st nicholas day from the boys of the choir and the chosen one officiated in pontificals and received large donations as the custom was exceedingly popular even royalty listened favourably to the child bishop's sermon in the footnote the montem at eton still prevails for the boy captain and there is a closer connection perhaps between the custom which produced the songs of the crow and the swallow and our northern mummeries than may be at first suspected the pagan saturnalia which the swallow song by its pleasant menaces resembles were afterwards disguised in the forms adopted by the early christians and such are the remains of the roman catholic religion in which the people were long indulged in their old taste for mockery and mummery i must add in connection with our main inquiry that our own ancient beggars had their songs in their old cant language some of which are as old as the elizabethan period and many are fancifully characteristic of their habits and their feelings End of section thirty one